RADIUS stands for Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. It's a popular and widely deployed IETF-based client server protocol and software that enables a remote access server, an RAS, to communicate with a central server in order to authenticate dial-in users historically and authorize their access to systems. We say dial-in users because RADIUS harkens back to the days of dial-in modems and ISDN lines. RADIUS transactions use a shared secret between the client and the RADIUS server for authentication. Keep in mind that the client is the intermediate device, for example, a router or a firewall or a wireless access point. The shared secrets are never sent over the network and only the password is encrypted. RADIUS officially uses UDP ports 1812 for authentication and 1813 for accounting. Earlier implementations used UDP ports 1645 and 1646. It's important when you deploy RADIUS to make sure that the network authenticating device and the RADIUS services are using the same ports. RADIUS is often preferred over other authentication and authorization protocols for its robust integrated accounting feature set. RADIUS is the protocol that's used with IEEE 802.1x port-based network access control. The next generation of RADIUS is called Diameter. In this diagram, we can see what could be an 802.1x environment, where the remote user is either doing administrative access to the perimeter router, or they're going through the perimeter router to get access to some other service, for example, in a DMZ. Realize the remote client here can operate in two different modes. If they're using character mode, they're actually sending characters to the perimeter router to administer or manage that router itself. RADIUS can still provide authentication and authorization for that activity. Or the remote client is operating what we call network or packet mode, where it's sending packets through the router to some other server, for example, a web server or an FTP server. And the RADIUS or diameter server is providing authentication services for that activity. Also notice that the RADIUS server may or may not have the actual user database on it. It could be a front-end, back-end scenario where you have a front-end RADIUS server or servers in a cluster and some optional back-end database cluster, or it could be Active Directory domain controllers. If this were a .1x environment using RADIUS, the remote user would be called a supplicant and the perimeter router would be called an NAD, a network access device. Again, the perimeter NAD could be a switch, a router, a firewall, or a wireless access point. Another popular protocol for authentication and authorization is Terminal Access Controller Access Control System Plus, TACAX Plus, developed by Cisco. It's based on a previous protocol called TACAX. However, it's not backward compatible. TACAX Plus is now a standard client server protocol for AAA services. For example, in Cisco Identity Services Engine, ICE, the default authorization protocol to do management of devices is TACAX Plus. It provides dynamic authorization on a per user or a per group basis. TACAX offers separate and independent modular authentication, authorization, and accounting abilities. RADIUS combines the authentication and the authorization into one communication. With TACAX Plus, each service can be tied to its own database to take advantage of other services available on that server. TACAX Plus is commonly used with Cisco ACS 5.x and ICE 2.x or higher for centralized administrative access control management for the enterprise. TACAX Plus uses a two-factor password authentication mechanism. The user has the ability to change the password. It uses TCP port 49 and as opposed to RADIUS, it encrypts the entire payload. TACAX Plus services are in the public domain and can be bundled in the operating system of network devices. For example, TACAX Plus can be commonly found on Linux servers. Routers, such as Cisco routers, can leverage per-command authorization for centralized management of privilege levels. Those are the 16 privilege levels, 0 through 15, 15 being the highest.
Back in the 1990s and the early days of the World Wide Web, they decided they wanted to use HTTP as a transport mechanism for authentication and authorization. And what came out of that was SAML at first 1.1 and eventually, by 2005, SAML 2.0. SAML stands for the Security Assertion Markup Language, and it basically describes what it is. It's a federated service that provides an assertion which is going to be a secure transaction, and it uses a markup language, XML. It's an open source, single sign-on standard. It's very popular today. It's used by many cloud SSO connections for thousands of large enterprises, government agencies, and service providers that communicate on the Internet. A key advantage of SAML is its open source interoperability. You see it used in the public sector and the private sector, and some large companies now requires SAML for Internet SSO with software-as-a-service applications and other external ISPs. With SAML, you have an identity provider. The SAML IDP declares the identity of the user along with additional metadata in the form of an assertion. Directory services like LDAP and Active Directory are common identity providers. Then we have the service providers, such as Amazon Web Services. The service provider takes the assertion and passes the identity data to an application or a service. Common service providers are cloud services and social media sites. Here's an example of using SAML 2.0 to get federated single sign-on access to resources at a service provider like Amazon Web Services. At the bottom, we have a user on their browser interface. That browser goes to their identity provider, IDP. The IDP does a query, in this example, to an LDAP identity store and returns a SAML assertion to the user in their browser interface. In step four, the user client posts SAML assertions to a sign in URL. In this example, it's an AWS single sign on endpoint. AWS uses the security token service in step five, STS. And then the AWS endpoint validates that and redirects it back to the original browser interface. Now, the client can take that assertion and go and use the AWS management console in step seven. Keep in mind that single sign-on does have some vulnerabilities. First of all, single sign-on is also a single point of failure. When a single credential is used without leveraging other factors, such as a smart card or a token or a biometric, you're giving somebody the keys to the kingdom if they're able to compromise those credentials. There's also collusion attacks. This is a secret cooperation between two or more system entities to launch an attack. For example, collusion between the principal and the service provider, or collusion between the principal and the identity provider. This could be an attack from a privileged insider. There's also denial of service attacks. These prevent authorized access to a system resource, or they can delay system operations. There's man-in-the-middle attacks, active wiretapping, where the attacker intercepts and selectively changes data in transit to spoof one or more entities. SSO can be vulnerable to replay attacks when a valid data transmission is maliciously or fraudulently repeated, possibly as part of a masquerade attack. And session hijacking. This is similar to a man-in-the-middle attack. The attacker seizes control of a previously established communication association. Around the same year that SAML 2.0 became an accepted standard, 2005, something was happening in secret and that was the development of the iPhone. And when the iPhone came out about 18 months later, it was a game changer. And instead of creating SAML 3.0 to accommodate apps and rapid development and newer things like JSON, developers went a different direction with authentication and authorization over the internet. And one of those directions was OAuth, open authorization. OAuth 2.0 is an open framework that allows the third-party application to get limited access to an HTTP service. Developers use OAuth to publish and interact with protected data in a safe and secure manner. 
Service provider developers can use OAuth to store protected data and give users secure delegated access. OAuth is designed to work with HTTP and basically allows access tokens to be issued to third-party clients by an authorization server with the approval of the resource owner. The third party then uses the access token to access the protected resources offered by the resource server. OIDC or OpenID Connect is a basic identity layer on top of the OAuth2 protocol. It verifies the end user identity using an authorization server or AS. OIDC can get basic profile information about the user with an interoperable REST like methodology, and it supports web based, mobile, JavaScript clients, and more. OpenID is extensible as functionality can be added. Even though OAuth 2.0 can do authentication, or what we call pseudo-authentication, to be properly implemented, it should be using OIDC as the authentication and identity layer. Here's an example of the OAuth OIDC process. We have three components. In the middle is our client on a web browser. To the right, we have our identity provider or the authorization server. And then to the left, we have the resource server or the service provider. The client browser at step A accesses a URL in the app. On the resource server, the app generates an auth request. In step B, using HTTP POST to the authorization server, it sends the auth request. The IDP or AS takes the request that's been passed to it and verifies it. At step C, the user is sent a login page at the authorization server and the user logs in. At that point, a token is generated. In step D, the resource server is told to restrict the app with the token. In step E, the user now logs in to the resource server. Another option for authentication and authorization is Shibboleth. Shibboleth connects users to both interorganizational and intraorganizational applications and services. It empowers sites to make well informed authorization choices for discrete access to protected online resources while maintaining user privacy. Shibboleth is free, open source, and is quite popular with universities and public service organizations. Kerberos was created at MIT. It's a single sign on authentication system using a secret key crypto system. It uses a ticket as its assertion or token. Kerberos performs mutual authentication, in other words, client side and server side. With Kerberos, all the communications can be encrypted, and it relies upon a trusted third party called a key distribution center or KDC. In this diagram, we can see that the Kerberos Key Distribution Center, or KDC, is made up of two components that are highly available, the authentication server, AS, and the ticket granting server, TGS. In an Active Directory environment, it's quite likely that a domain controller is running both of these services, the AS and the TGS. As you can see in the diagram here, in step one, the user logs onto the workstation and requests service on the host. The workstation sends a message to the authorization server, or AS, requesting a TGT, a ticket granting ticket. The AS verifies the user's access rights in the database, for example, Active Directory, and generates a TGT and a session key. The AS encrypts the results using a key derived from the user's password and sends a message back to the user workstation. The workstation prompts the user for a password and uses that password to decrypt the incoming message. When decryption succeeds, the user can now use the TGT to request a service ticket. In step three, the user wants to access a service, let's say SharePoint. So the workstation client application sends a request to the ticket granting service, or the TGS, containing the client name, the realm name, and a timestamp. Remember, Kerberos uses realms. The proofing happens when the user proves his identity by sending an authenticator encrypted with the session key that the user received in step two. 
In step 4, the TGS decrypts the ticket and authenticator, verifies the request, and generates a ticket for that requested service, for example, SharePoint. The ticket contains the client name and optionally the client's IP address. It also has a realm name and the ticket has a lifespan. The TGS returns the ticket to the user workstation. The returned message contains two copies of a server session key, one that's encrypted with the client password and one encrypted by the service password. In step five, the client application now sends a request to the SharePoint server containing the ticket it received in step four and an authenticator. SharePoint authenticates the request by decrypting the session key. The server verifies that the ticket and the authenticator match and then grants access to its service. In step six, if mutual authentication is required, then the server will reply with a server authentication message. From the standpoint of IAM, Identity and Access Management, provisioning involves the administration of user accounts. For example, managing the creation, the modification, the revocation of these accounts, as well as the assignment of access privileges, often by group membership. These should be in alignment with security policies and provide a unified look at the user accounts and the permissions and rights across all managed applications, systems, and services, as well as reporting. For example, the onboarding of devices and certificates is often handled using Enterprise Mobility Management, EMM, a combination of device management and application management. When executed properly, a provisioning solution should deliver standardized and automated service desk IT processes for onboarding, transfers, periodic access audits, and offboarding of enterprise employees and contractors, third-party business partners, and customers. There are some key enterprise challenges to provisioning and deprovisioning. There's ever-increasing costs of user account management and help desk and service desk implementations. This is often alleviated by using software as a service or cloud service providers. There's often a low priority, especially from a security standpoint, for proper account creation, approval processes, and adequate auditing. In addition, there's the high cost of constant compliant audits of user account administration practices, often set aside while infrastructure security, password policies, and endpoint protection is prioritized. There's also complicated provisioning processes that are unique to different business applications, systems, and platforms in a heterogeneous environment, especially due to employees being quarantined as teleworkers or outsourcing and increased numbers of contractors and temporary workers. There's also a lack of timely account suspension and deletion policies and processes for terminated groups and users. Let's look at the components of a proper provisioning system. First, we have the request system. This gives business users the ability to generate a request for a modification, maybe a revocation of the account, and to participate in any review process. The second component would be the authorized sources. This provides authorized origination points, or a system of record for user identity data attributes. This could be a directory service, for example, like Active Directory or Open LDAP. Then we have administrative interfaces. This provides process and technical controls over user account administration process through a centralized and delegated functionality, for example, a service desk. Next, we have workflow processes. At the service desk, you'll have approval, processes for standard and normal changes, and processes for emergency changes, for example, to emergency change board. Then we have the actual provisioning engine. This is often provided by the directory service or the network operating system, the mechanism for actually assigning permissions and rights to groups and users. Other components include integrators and connectors, in other words, providing data feeds 
from authoritative sources to an IAM stack of components. For example, the directory repository. This includes formatting, unidirectional and bidirectional synchronization of identity and account attributes with connected systems and federated systems based on policies and rules. These integrators and connectors and the protocols that support them are critical for federated access and single sign-on. The identity repository would be the identity provider, the IDP, the foundational component that offers persistent and highly available storage of user identities for example, domain controllers. It also stores associated accounts and privileges to be used by other IAM components. And of course, reporting tools. Automated reporting on identity controls for IAM and IDM integrated applications and systems. And the final component are the managed resources. IAM integration offers lifecycle management for user accounts, machine accounts, applications, platforms, databases, and systems. In the next lesson, we'll revisit the different roles and responsibilities that interact with these provisioning system components. It's important to understand at this point that the type of organization that you have, the types of roles and responsibilities will directly impact the way that you provision and deprovision identity and access management or IDM identity management. Now at this point, you may want to refer back to course six, where we talked about managing the roles of owner, controller, custodian, steward, processors, and users. Those asset and data ownership roles will tie into this IAM process. For example, if using a discretionary access control model, the roles will usually be based on global group membership. In addition, refer back to Course 9, where we talked about DAC, RBAC, and attribute-based access controls. It is those access control methodologies and models that will also drive our provisioning and deprovisioning and IAM methodologies. If using attribute-based access control, the authorization role profile may change based on various attributes and variables. Your engine that is used may have change of authorization, COA, which can change based on actions by the user or the system. IAM access management will control what, when, where, and how they access assets and data. Cloud service providers like Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform will use policies and roles, typically JSON documents, apply to logical groups, often done in a role-based access control model. Another variable is the type of organization that you have. If you're in a functional organization, then your IAM policy will very likely be structured around the functions of the enterprise and the responsibilities performed to deliver the value proposition or propositions. Functions are often mapped to departmental identifiers. For example, human resources, HR, information technology, IT, the sales, marketing, and finance department, the facilities, the call center, research and development, and other functional identifiers. This is a traditional top-down structure of organizations where resources are controlled by functional managers. The project or program management role is often implemented by a team leader of a functional area or department under the supervision of a functional manager. In this type of organization, the functional manager acts more like a project coordinator or project expediter and typically does not have the title of project manager. In a functional organization, the authority of the coordinators and expediters can be very limited. You may be in a projectized organization. This will have a direct effect on your identity management. This is structured around projects and initiatives for the highest project management and service management effectiveness. In other words, in a flatter organization, the project and program managers assume more authority and control or ownership of resources. The initiative managers have a full-time role and will answer to a sponsor on the C-suite or senior executive management or officers. Team members are typically co-located within the same office or virtually co-located 
to take full advantage of communication efficiency. There may be still some functional units within the organization, for example, HR and IT. However, those units provide a supportive function only, without authority over any project or program managers, supervisors, and team leaders. In a projectized organization, typically, the IAM is not done through role-based access control, but rather discretionary access control, or attribute or risk-based access control, underpinned by a mandatory access control methodology. In a matrix organization, you're going to perform as a combination of the attributes of functional and projectized organizations. Matrix organizations can be further classified as weak, balanced, or strong, depending upon the relative power of the functional managers and the project managers. If the project or program managers are given a role of coordinator or expediter, then the matrix organization is considered weak matrix. If the project or program managers are granted much more authority on resources and budgets, the organization is considered a strong matrix. The differences between a functional organization versus a weak matrix and a projectized organization versus a strong matrix are not necessarily very clear cut, which can make access control more challenging for the security team. Regardless, the roles and responsibilities and how they're defined and the type of organization that you have from a project and program management standpoint will have a direct effect on your identity and access management, IAM, or identity management, IDM. Well, regardless of what methodologies or models you're going to be using for your identity and access management, or your IDM, you want to have continual improvement. So you're going to be doing account access reviews and audits on an ongoing basis. Traditional techniques use permissioned spreadsheets or documented matrices to create ledgers for account access. This should be an aspect of your change and configuration management IT practice. In addition, automation tools and orchestration should be employed whenever possible. The more automated the process, the less the chance for human error. For example, the AWS IAM service provides an access analyzer tool to help administrators recognize possible security risks in the environment by analyzing the resource-based JSON policies, otherwise known as permission sets, using a proprietary machine learning engine. The process goes like this. First, you create your analyzer, which uses machine learning processes to go through all of the JSON. Then, you review your active findings and then perform a gap analysis and take action. The goal is to enforce least privilege principles and put in countermeasures against privilege creep or scope creep. Along with auditing and reporting is the overall management of account life cycles. Security officers are often responsible for auditing the account and credential life cycle. This includes administering the process of granting new user access to systems, modifying roles when a user changes jobs or responsibilities. In a mandatory access control model, this would be placing the subject at a new sensitivity level once they've gone through their background checks and formal advancement procedures. You want to review when a user's job requires new access. Review access on a regular basis and modify any discrepancies. Again, automation can really come in handy here. Remove the access of terminated users, whether voluntary or involuntary. Implement user account and password policies. And manage federated single sign-on and use password managers. This may also involve using a cloud access security broker, a CASP, when dealing with SaaS providers software as a service. In this short video, we're going to talk about privilege escalation or privilege elevation, which actually is one of three different things. Privilege escalation occurs when a subject, for example, a person or a system, gets unauthorized access to resources and data. In other words, the least privileged principle is not being enforced. However, privilege escalation can also occur 
when that least privileged principle is being defied and somebody is getting more permissions, more rights, more privileges than they actually need. So not necessarily unauthorized, but definitely a lack of enforcement of least privilege. As we've learned, the mandatory access control model is optimal to prevent escalation of privileges. Now also keep in mind a third aspect of escalation is a phase of the cyber attack kill chain. When the payload has been delivered or the exploit's been successful and the attacker is able to elevate or escalate privileges on a system, and then their goal will be to move laterally across multiple systems attempting to do the same thing, elevating or escalating privileges on multiple systems. So vulnerability assessment must be done on an ongoing basis in order to fix flaws in a system or an application or a security initiative to prevent this type of unauthorized or unwanted privilege escalation or elevation. We've evolved from the traditional AAA services, authentication, authorization, and accounting, to more modern IAM, Identity and Access Management, to now what we call Identity Management. In modern identity management, there's two phases. There's the IAM configuration phase and the IAM operation phase. In the IAM configuration phase, under the category of identity management, we have the registration of user identities, often into a directory service or a user pool, and the provisioning of credentials. In the identity management operation phase, users will present their identities, and then you'll have authentication by credentials. Under access management, in the configuration phase, we have access authorization. Under the operation phase, we have access control. Access authorization could use RADIUS, TACAX+, SAML 2.0, OAuth, OIDC, Kerberos, and others. In the operation phase, the access control is based on models, MAC models, DAC, RBAC, ABAC, and risk-based access controls. And if it's a MAC model, using models like BIBA and Bellapadula. Many modern enterprises implement a identity services engine. For example, Cisco ISE. The services delivered revolve around who, what, how, when, and where the subjects access the objects. We can also introduce threat management and threat modeling, posture, and vulnerability databases like CVSS. That's all inputted into the ISE, which then generates access policies or authorization profiles. These profiles can be used for role-based access control, guest access, mobile device management using bring your own device, and other secure access methodologies. We can even work with federated partners to provide identity services for endpoints and for network devices, either in a wired environment, a wireless environment, or using a VPN. Notice the devices can be workstations, laptops, pads, IP phones, and mobile phones. In this diagram, we see a wide variety of identity management use cases. We can enable guest network access at ease with a guest and secure Wi-Fi. We can provide secure access with intent-based network access across wired, wireless, and VPN solutions. We can get visibility into assets to see what's on the network and where they're located. Then we can enforce access based on asset visibility. We can use identity management for our bring your own device or choose your own device deployment by managing onboarding and management of wired and wireless BYOD. We can get role-based network device administration over TACAX Plus and RADIUS. We can exchange content between technology partners for better fidelity. This integration can be through protocols like SAML 2.0 and OAuth OIDC. We can use management for segmentation, for example, software-defined segmentation without VLANs or IP-based policies. Identity management can give us threat containment by sharing real-time threat intelligence to automate threat response. And then finally, deeper visibility and control on desktop and mobile device apps for regulation and compliance. Traditionally, 
we would use Network Admission Control and IEEE 802.1x for wired and wireless deployments. With Admission Control, we also include change of authorization so that devices can attempt to connect to the network with EAPOL frames, then they can be redirected to restricted VLANs or guest VLANs or remediation servers to install antivirus products or anti-malware or perform updates or upgrades. We can also rely on back-end directory services like Active Directory Federation and Identity Services Engines from vendors like Palo Alto Networks or Cisco or Fortinet. To enhance our identity services and identity management, we want to add other factors besides usernames and passwords. We want to use MFA, multi-factor authentication mechanisms. This can be hardware tokens. It could be software time-based OTP tokens, for example, Google Authenticator. They could be PKI-based smart cards with embedded chips or military CAC cards or other smart card deployments. We could use digital certificates or tokens that have X509V3 certificates installed on them or directly onto the device. We can use mobile push, SMS, and email. And of course, a wide variety of biometrics like fingerprint, ocular scanning, facial recognition, voice recognition, and palm geometry. In this lesson, we're going to finish up with some additional identity and access management concepts. As we know, the third A of AAA is accounting. Accounting can be done for a couple of reasons. One reason is for billing and chargeback. It's often performed to determine when the subject started, when they finished, and for how long did they do the activity. The data is then used for chargeback or showback against departmental budgets and business unit allocations. Besides billing and chargeback, accounting is also done for auditing and visibility. The primary use case is to get visibility in order to collect meaningful metrics for optimization, utilization, and continual improvement. It's critical to hold privileged access users accountable to policies and acceptable practices, and that's where accounting comes in. This information can be sent to SIEM systems, NetFlow collectors, and radius and diameter, which excel at accounting services. There's also session management. Session management typically refers to the technique of securely handling one or several requests to a web-based application or service from a subject. The session begins when a user authenticates their identity using a password or another authentication credential, such as an assertion, token, or ticket. A software application or network operating system is responsible for managing the session lifetime. With transport layer security, the record and handshake protocols manage the process of protecting symmetric session keys with the asymmetric crypto system. Additional security mechanisms, such as elliptic curves, ephemeral keys, secure cookies, the OCSP protocol, forward secrecy, and HTTP Strict Transport Security, HSTS, can enhance the session security. As alluded to earlier, during the life cycle of identity management, we have registration and proofing. Registration involves a registration authority that serves as an identity provider or an IDP. This could be a back-end NoSQL database or a directory service like OpenLDAP or Active Directory. It could be a radius or diameter server, or security solutions that specialize in multi-factor authentication and biometric solutions. Only the necessary data about the subject is then given to the requester during the registration process. With proofing, you're collecting attributes or digital documents, for example, DocuSign, to support a claim of identification for a specific subject to validate the veracity of the claim. Identity proofing is usually executed during a registration or enrollment process. However, it could be an ongoing process. For example, using knowledge-based authorization, using data from public records, and offering the subject four or five questions about publicly known information that they have to answer correctly. 
On the exam, CompTIA wants you to know about the Microsoft Forefront Identity Manager, or FIM. FIM is a self-service identity management software suite for controlling identities, credentials, and role-based access control policies over heterogeneous environments. FIM can also embed self-help tools into Microsoft Outlook, for example, so that end users can manage routine tasks, such as resetting their own passwords without the assistance of a service desk or a help desk. FIM also permits users to generate their own security and email distribution list and determine who to put on those lists. The newest solution or next generation of FIM is Microsoft Identity Manager, MIM, which adds a hybrid experience, privileged access management capabilities, and support for new platforms. In this course, Deploying Identity and Access Management, IAM, you learned about authentication and authorization protocols, provisioning and deprovisioning, identity management, IDM, and accounting, registration, and proofing. Coming up in the next course, we'll explore client, server, and database systems, ICS, cloud, IoT, and embedded systems, and containerization, serverless computing, and microservices. As we begin this course on architecture and design, CompTIA wants you to be aware of the distinctives from a security standpoint of client side versus server side. The security manager or security operator must have visibility into all the client server channels and interactions as part of risk management. It comes as no surprise that TCP IP itself was designed as a client server protocol. From a development standpoint, you can use server side or you can use client side execution and validation, and both are acceptable. However, client side is more efficient, but server side is more secure. And we can see the emergence of web browsers and their added functionality as a historical move towards that efficiency. However, we're starting to have more responsibility, especially with TLS on the server side, to add layers of security. For example, using HSTS to force browsers to use transport layer security. In addition, advanced SIEM systems and SOAR implementations, as well as cloud-based visibility, are valuable in giving the Security Operations Center maximum real-time visibility into all of the enterprise client-server interactions, as well as client-server hybrid cloud computing interactions. Let's talk about client-side attacks and controls. Client-side attacks specifically target the software on the desktop itself, such as the web browser, the media player, the gadget, POP3 and IMAP4 email clients, messaging systems, productivity suites, tools like Adobe Acrobat, and more. Cross-site scripting type 0 is a common client-side attack against web clients that use gadgets and other streaming applets. Countermeasures include patch management, security suites, next generation endpoint detection and response, and cloud-based security and cloud access security brokers. Server-side attacks are launched directly from an attacker, the client, to a listening service. For example, the Configure worm of 2008 and beyond spread using several vectors, including a server-side attack on TCP port 445, exploiting a weakness in the RPC service. In fact, we still see variants of the Configure worm today, especially in Europe. Server-side attack countermeasures include patch management, infrastructure security and firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, and web application firewalls, secure virtualization and compartmentalization, and infrastructure as a service, IAAS. In other words, offloading physical and layer two security to the cloud provider. This lesson was just a brief introduction. We'll look deeper into these technical controls to protect the client server moving forward throughout this training. In this lesson, we're going to talk about key concepts of database security 
The first one of these is scoping. Scoping is basically understand the why that you're using the database and the data before the how. Determine the why or the use, the use case, the purpose of the data before the how of its structure, how it's structured, and its schema. A scope is basically the outline of a description about why we're working on a problem and why certain data will solve the problem or achieve the goal. For example, gathering data about different vulnerabilities in your organization to add to your risk ledger or your risk log. You want to know the context. You want to know the needs, the vision, and the outcome. Scoping can also involve removing baseline security controls that do not apply, such as removing privacy controls where private data is non-existent. Next, we have the concept of tailoring in database security. Tailoring involves modifying the baseline to become more applicable. For example, modifying the data application timeout requirement from 20 minutes of inactivity to 10 minutes of inactivity. When you compare tailoring to scoping, scoping is more appropriate for controlling global recommendations through the removal of aspects not applicable to any specific environment. Tailoring, on the other hand, involves modifying details regarding general data that is more precisely appropriate to an application or environment. So think of tailoring as making changes, whereas scoping often involves removal. Next, we have tokenization. Database tokenization involves sending sensitive data through an API call or a batch job to a provider that replaces the data with non-sensitive placeholders, and we call these placeholders tokens. Unlike encrypted data, the tokenized data is irreversible, yet unintelligible. We can often use tokenization in a healthcare environment or HIPAA environment to remove personal health information from information sent to a research hospital or a university. In this table, we can see the difference between tokenization and encryption and realize that we can use both to secure our data. With encryption, we're obviously mathematically transforming plain text into ciphertext. Encryption scales to large data volumes with just the use of a small encryption key, for example, a 256-bit symmetric key. Encryption is used for structured fields as well as unstructured data, even an entire file. Encryption is best used for sensitive data with third parties who also have the shared encryption key. Also, format-preserving encryption schemes come with a trade-off of lower strength, and the original data can leave the organization, but if it does, for example to a cloud provider, it leaves an encrypted form. With tokenization, you're randomly generating a token value for plain text and storing the mapping in a database. Tokenization is difficult to scale securely and maintain performance as the database gets larger. Tokenization is used for structured data fields, such as payment card or social security numbers or personal health information. It's difficult to exchange tokenized data since it requires direct access to the token vault mapping values. However, the format can be maintained without any diminished strength of the security. With tokenization, the original data never leaves the organization, so you can satisfy your compliance requirements. Next, we have the concept of abstraction. This is basically the principle of mediated access. Abstraction is a method to make logical and physical data models more flexible by redefining and combining some of the data elements, entities, and relationships within the model into more generic terms. Abstraction also involves removing details in order to make something applicable to a wide class of scenarios while preserving the important properties and essential aspects from concepts or subjects. Abstraction can practically involve using more views and indirect access to the underlying raw data. Next we have hashing. In a database management system, hashing transforms a string of characters, for example passwords, into a typically shorter fixed length value or key that represents the original string. Hashing is often used to index and retrieve items in a database because it's faster to find the data item 
using the shorter hashed key than using the original value. Salting also relates to password hashing. Salting is when a value is appended to a password to create a different hash or a stronger hash. The added value is called a salt and helps protect against brute force and dictionary attacks, as well as rainbow tables. A pepper is a type of salt, but it's a secret that must not be stored with the output. In other words, it's ephemeral. Remember all of these database security principles for your exam. At the time of this recording, there was actually a ransomware attack against a major pipeline in the United States. This is an attack on SCADA, the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. SCADA represents the software used to collect and send data to other facility systems. Often, these sites will use PLCs, Programmable Logic Controllers. These are vulnerable hardware components that are not air-gapped. In addition, ICS, industrial control systems that are not air-gapped, also introduce various threats. Some examples of SCADA would be facility and manufacturing control and management systems, water management, electric, and the nuclear power grid, solar and wind farms, and the aforementioned pipeline system traffic signals and mass transit systems, environmental control systems and manufacturing systems. These are the major security concerns for SCADA, cyber terrorism and cyber warfare, espionage and sabotage, again through ransomware attacks, lack of security in design, operation and deployment of the system, a lack of authentication between devices at the sites or the facilities, a lack of strong user authentication or multi-factor authentication or biometrics, a lack of security in proprietary protocols, services, and applications, and an overall lack of visibility and security whenever internet connectivity is involved. You can also include with this devices like laptops and removable drives that are brought into the facility by contractors and temporary workers. In this lesson, we're going to talk about cloud computing and third-party security, but you can't talk about cloud computing without talking about hypervisor virtualization. First, we have type 1 hypervisors. These are the ones that are used by your cloud providers, like Amazon Web Services and Google Cloud Platform. On the underlying hardware or blade, the hypervisor software is installed directly onto the hardware, for example, KVM or Citrix Zen. We call this bare metal or native hypervisor. Then, on the hypervisor, we install our multi-tenancy environment, multiple operating systems, and applications running within those operating systems. But the Type 2 hypervisor, you install a host operating system, for example, Windows or Linux, onto your hardware then the Type 2 hypervisor, such as VMware Workstation Pro or Oracle VirtualBox. Then, within the hypervisor, you install your guest and applications. Notice that on the host operating system, you have other applications running in parallel with the hypervisor application. This is a good solution for testbed environment, penetration testing, and testing interoperability of new operating systems and new applications. Virtualization does have its issues. For example, you have to deal with VM sprawl. VM sprawl happens when the number of VMs overtakes the admin's ability to manage them, as well as the available resources. VM sprawl can lead to ghost IT or shadow IT. It can lead to violations of copyright and digital rights management policies, as well as the running of unlicensed software or unauthorized software. To avoid VM sprawl, Enforce a strict process for deploying VMs. It should be in your acceptable use policy as well. Have a library of standard VM images, the only images that your employees can use. Archive or recycle underutilized VMs. And, if possible, use a virtual machine lifecycle management tool or a cloud service provider managed service. 
Another more dangerous issue is VM escape. This is a serious threat where a process running in the guest VM interacts directly with the host operating system. This is more likely to happen in a Type 2 hypervisor than a Type 1 hypervisor. To protect from VM escape, make sure that you patch your VMs and your VM software on a regular basis. Only install what you need on the host and the virtual machines. Install verified and trusted applications only, for example, digitally signed applications. And have strong access controls and passwords. When dealing with third-party cloud providers, make sure you understand from a security standpoint the three types of service types. This will dictate your shared responsibility model. In other words, what are you responsible for from a security standpoint and what is your provider responsible for? With IaaS, infrastructure as a service, the provider is only going to be responsible for the underlying data center, its networking, storage, servers, and virtualization. Everything else is managed and secured by the customer. With platform as a service, the provider will offer the operating system, the middleware, and the runtime. There are varying levels of service with platform as a service, but for the most part, from a shared responsibility model, the provider will take over more of the responsibility of the operating system, the middleware, the updates, the upgrades, the service packs. The customer manages the data and the applications they're developing. With software as a service, pretty much everything is managed by the provider. The user may have some control over user profiles, maybe some aspects of data, and they may use a cloud access security broker to help with single sign-on and other security issues. According to NIST, IaaS offers the capability to the consumer to provision processing, storage, networks, and other fundamental computing resources where the consumer is able to deploy and run arbitrary software, which can include operating systems and applications. With infrastructure as a service, the consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, but has control over operating systems, storage, deployed applications, and possibly limited control of select networking components, for example, firewalls at layer 3. All cloud providers have a global infrastructure. When you're using IaaS, you're taking advantage of their regions all over the world. Within those regions, they have zones or availability zones, which are usually tens of miles apart. Within those availability zones, you often have two or more data centers. Providers also have edge locations in metropolitan areas all over the world for content distribution networking. Here's an example of IaaS from the standpoint of Amazon Web Services. Notice at the bottom that AWS is responsible for their regions, their availability zones, and the security of edge locations. They also secure their foundation services in the availability zones, compute services, storage services, databases, and networking. They provide their own IAM, identity and access management, often with strict multi-factor authentication and biometrics, and they also provide secure endpoints for you to get access to resources over the AWS cloud. Everything else above that in IAAS is the responsibility of the consumer or the customer. Platform as a service, according to NIST, the capability provided to the consumer with PAAS is to deploy onto the cloud infrastructure consumer created or acquired, in other words, build or buy, applications created using programming languages and tools supported by the provider, for example, software development kits. The consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, including network, servers, operating systems, or storage, but has control over the deployed applications and possibly application hosting environment configurations. Common PAAS offerings include development and SDK platforms for Java, PHP, Python, and more. Container services, for example, Docker and Kubernetes orchestration. Managed and fully managed relational and document databases. Managed security and threat modeling services. Single sign-on, machine learning, AI, 
IoT, blockchain, media services, and more. According to NIST, software as a service is defined this way. The capability provided to the consumer is to use the provider's applications running on a cloud infrastructure. The applications are accessible from various client devices through a thin client interface such as a web browser. The consumer does not manage or control the underlying cloud infrastructure, including network, servers, operating systems, storage, or even individual application capabilities, with the possible exception of limited user-specific application configuration settings. Common SaaS offerings include Customer Relationship Management, CRM, Human Resources and Workplace Tools, Finance, Sales, and Marketing Services, Email, Collaboration, and Cloud-Based Storage, Help, Service Desk, and Virtual Call Centers. On the exam, also be aware of cloud models. A private model is deployed in a sandbox within an organization, either at the cloud provider or on-premises. A public cloud is deployed by a provider for customer consumption, typically over the Internet. A community cloud is deployed by a consortium in a certain sector, for example, the financial sector, the insurance sector, or the healthcare sector. And a hybrid is a combination of private and or public and or community. We also can use MSSPs, Managed Security Service Providers. A managed security service provider offers outsourced security monitoring and management for security systems and devices. Common SSP services include managed layer 3 through 7 firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention, IDS and IPS, endpoint response and detection, virtual private networking support, and vulnerability scanning and antiviral services. Popular MSSPs would be Fortinet FortiGate, Cisco, and Palo Alto Networks. MSSPs use high availability security operation centers, either from their own facilities or from other data center or cloud providers. They offer 24 7 services with the goal of reducing the on premises operational security staff the enterprise needs to hire, train, and retain to preserve a mature security posture. And finally, we have CASBs. A cloud access security broker is basically a software service implemented between the cloud customer and the software as a service provider. It could be on premises or, more often, an in service provider cloud. It acts as a gatekeeper to help enforce enterprise security policies while cloud resources are being accessed. It extends the organization's policies beyond the local infrastructure, moving the demarcation point to the CASPI. It provides visibility, compliance, data security, and threat protection services. A CASPI can assist with implementation and enforcement of identity and access management, as well as single sign-on. It can support federated access with web service sign-on and implement SAML 2.0, OAuth, OIDC, and help support integration with directory services like Active Directory. In this lesson, we're going to explore the distinctives of securing distributed systems. However, let's first look at their attributes. A distributed system enables resource sharing, often on an international or global scale. It provides concurrency, for example, multi tenancy and multiple processes operating on the same service or data or application simultaneously, again, often distributed over a large geographic area. Distributed systems offer openness and transparency. This is why technology like blockchain technology has become so popular. Distributed systems are also massively scalable, especially when leveraging the regions of a cloud service provider. And distributed systems offer high availability, redundancy, and a high level of fault tolerance. By distributing data, applications, and services, over many nodes in many zones. As far as securing distributed systems, 
A distributed system needs more security measures than centralized systems, as there are many users, there's differentiated data, multiple sites, and distributed control. Security engineers must consider many permutations of failures and errors that can happen at any time due to concurrency. It could be independent or in combination with other error conditions. In distributed communication systems, there are several types of exploits. Passive eavesdroppers that monitor messages and collect private information, known as information leakage or data loss. Active attackers that not only eavesdrop, but further corrupt messages by inserting new data or modifying existing data. Distributed denial of service attacks, DDoS, and botnets. And unauthorized access based on poor access controls. With distributed systems, communications can be secured with IPsec or IP version 4 or IP version 6 or transport layer security, HTTPS. Data at rest can be authenticated, authorized, and validated, and encrypted with strong algorithms and modes, such as AES GCM 256. And Layer 2 can be secured, for example, in storage area networks, with 802.11ae MacSec, where you get confidentiality, integrity, and origin authentication on the frames sent between the switches in the distributed system. The Internet of Things, commonly known as IoT, is an explosion where the Internet of Things, all different types of things, and the Internet of Everything does present a challenge for the discovery of embedded computing vulnerability. IoT systems are often powered by specialized chips, or SOC, system on a chip, as well as some older unpatched version of the Linux or Microsoft Windows operating system. Examples of IoT devices include sensors and smart devices, often embedded into home alarm systems or home environmental systems, facility automation, for example, at manufacturing firms and warehouses, part of your supply chain, commercial appliances and medical devices, vehicles and aircraft, both manned and unmanned, and smart meters and sensors, power sensors, water sensors, electric sensors, gas sensors, and others. Here we see the top 10 vulnerabilities of IoT according to OWASP. First are weak guessable or hard-coded passwords. Then insecure network services. Most of these newer devices have IPv6 addresses and are accessible over wireless networks. Insecure ecosystem interfaces, a lack of secure update mechanisms, the usage of insecure or outdated components, insufficient privacy protection for personal data or credit card information stored on the device, insecure methodologies for data transfer and storage, in other words, not protecting data in transit or data at rest, an overall lack of device management from a secure standpoint, and insecure default settings, and and overall lack of physical hardening. Another challenge is that IoT devices may no longer be supported by vendors or manufacturers, and their vulnerabilities go unpatched or unsupported on an ongoing basis. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the emerging phenomenon of development using containers. A container is an isolated abstracted application with all of the components included in a modular form. This includes the codes, the binaries, the libraries, the dependencies, and more. These are portable modules that can be carried across platforms and cloud providers, allowing for ease and consistency of DevOps. Containers can be server-based, for example, running on Windows Server or Linux Red Hat, or they can be serverless in the cloud, for example, AWS Fargate. Container isolation is done on the kernel level without the need for a guest operating system at all. These self-contained environments allow for newer rapid deployments using Agile, CICD, and Spiral, and closer parity 
between development environments and unlimited scalability. There are similarities between virtual machines and containers. On the left hand side, we see our infrastructure and then the hypervisor software installed into the infrastructure. This would be a type 1 or bare metal or native hypervisor. Then we have multiple virtual machines running in the hypervisor simultaneously. The virtual machine includes multiple services, the binaries, the libraries, and whatever operating system is running, for example, Mac OS, Windows, or Linux. On the right hand side, we have our infrastructure, then we have a host operating system, or if no host operating system, that could be the cloud infrastructure. The most common method for developing containerized applications is Docker, although there are several others. The Docker is running either in the host server, for example, Windows Server or Linux Server, or it's running in the cloud. The containers are modular and they have their services and their binaries and their libraries, everything necessary to run the application. Often these are immutable. In other words, instead of having different versions of the container, they'll just replace the container altogether when there's a new version. We often hear about Docker versus Kubernetes. This comes down to automation and development versus orchestration. Docker is a containerized platform for developing containers. The Docker engine is the runtime that allows developers to build and run containers. Docker is currently the most popular container platform, and over 30% of enterprises currently use Docker in the AWS environment, for example. Kubernetes, however, is an orchestrator for the containerized platforms, or the containers. It's a comprehensive system for automating deployment, scheduling, and scaling of containerized applications. Kubernetes is the industry leader and supports many container tools going well beyond Docker. In addition, cloud service providers like Google Cloud Platform and Amazon Web Services offer their own managed container orchestration servers besides Kubernetes. So for example, how do you package and distribute the application? How do you automate the task? Well, in the first few weeks, we'll use Docker to do that. However, for the lifetime of the container, over the next eight years, we'll use Kubernetes or a cloud service provider to scale, run, and monitor the applications. A rapidly emerging offering, a managed service from cloud providers, is serverless architectures. Serverless cloud architecture lets the customer move more responsibility to the provider while enhancing agility and innovation of applications. Serverless is also known as functions as a service, for example, at Microsoft Azure, when running serverless code in a wide variety of use cases. It also enables the customer to run container applications and services without having to consider the underlying servers or infrastructure. Serverless architectures eliminate infrastructure duties such as provisioning, patching, maintenance, capacity management, and optimization. The serverless architecture solution can be used for nearly every type of application or back-end service, for example, structured databases or NoSQL databases, and everything necessary to run and scale an application with high availability controlled for you by the cloud service provider. When building serverless applications, developers can focus on the core product or service as opposed to managing and operating servers or runtimes, either in the cloud or on premises. This reduced overhead empowers developers to get back time and energy that can be used on further delivery, testing, and experimentation of reliable and scalable products and services in the cloud. Serverless code like AWS Lambda and Azure Functions lets you run small pieces of code called functions that you only pay for when they're running. You don't need to deploy a server or application infrastructure. You just simply write the code and it's stored in the cloud. You can run the code based on HTTP request. It could be a predefined schedule. It could be a call trigger from an application programming interface or a security event. Or of course, you can run the serverless code manually. Serverless containers 
like AWS Fargate, is a serverless compute engine for containers that work with both Elastic Container Service and a Kubernetes service. This eliminates the need to provision and manage servers, and it lets you stipulate and pay for resources per application and enhances security through application isolation by design. Microservices are tightly related to containers. These are specific service-oriented application components. Microservice is an architectural approach to software development where the results are made up of small independent services that communicate over well-defined APIs. These services are typically maintained by small, self-contained teams of developers. Microservice architectures make applications faster to develop and easier to scale. They enable innovation and fast-track delivery of new application features and mobile apps. Traditional applications are monolithic. Microservices are tightly scoped, but they're loosely coupled. In fact, they're decoupled. They're thoroughly modular and encapsulated. They're independently deployable. They're freely scalable. And they communicate using notification and queuing services between the components. If one of the components fails, the entire application doesn't fail, as would happen with a monolithic operating system or monolithic application. Earlier in this course, we talked about IoT. Let's talk more about embedded system security and constraints. Often, the complete embedded source code is not available, especially with older embedded systems. Many of the device drivers and other components are simply binary sites with no source code at all. And even if a patch is available for your embedded system, it's rarely applied in a consistent manner, like you would with endpoint patching or server patching. In fact, there are hundreds of millions of devices all over the world sitting on the internet, unpatched and unsecured for the last 10 years or so. A common type of embedded system, or system on a chip, is Raspberry Pi. This is a sequence of small, single board computers that was developed by the UK Raspberry Pi Foundation. This was originally designed to teach computer science in schools and to children in developing countries. However, the system exploded in popularity, and now you see it used widely, especially for robotics, by enthusiastic hobbyists or even in commercial applications. With Raspberry Pi, there's no peripherals or case included, although some accessories are included in several bundles. To secure Raspberry Pi is basically to secure other embedded devices and IoT devices. Keep your system updated. Don't use auto login or empty passwords. Make sure you change the default password. Disable the Pi user. Stop unnecessary services. Make sudo require a password in Linux. With secure shell, prevent root login. Change the default port from 22 to some ephemeral port. Use secure shell key pairs instead of passwords. If you can, use secure shell 2, which uses Diffie Hellman. And install fail to ban. The fail to ban program detects brute force attacks and blocks them. These secure methods can also be applied to the list of IoT defenses in the OWASP top 10. You should know all of these for the exam. Raspberry Pi is a type of SOC, system on a chip. This is combining electrical circuits of various components and software onto a single chip. It's common in IoT devices, mobile products, wearable IT, and RFID systems. Obviously, there's security concerns with system on a chip the lack of security controls, the lack of and the speed of new updates, privacy of any data stored on that chip, malware directed towards IoT devices, and the threat of malicious users getting root access. Real-time operating systems, otherwise known as RTOS, is an operating system that serves real-time applications. For example, like a time-based or streaming database. It processes data immediately or in tenths of seconds. There are security vulnerabilities to RTOS. 
There's code injection attacks, privacy issues, exploiting of shared memory between processes or applications, misconfigured priorities by end users and developers, denial of service attacks, and threats to inter-process communications. For example, simple notification services between the microservices or components. Additional measures for securing embedded devices includes testing these in the cloud in a sandbox environment or threat modeling before you deploy. Make sure you have a solid change and configuration management database in place with key value pairs for all your configuration items. Have solid patch management. Use digitally signed code whenever possible. If you can, use trusted operating systems and firmware, for example, TPM, and make sure you have skilled security practitioners. Other specialty systems to be aware of on the exam are the threats of multifunction printers, or MFPs. These are the biz hubs that are a combination of email, fax, photocopier, printer, and scanner. If these are on the local area network or connected to the internet or the World Wide Web, they're a point of vulnerability. There's also adaptive voltage scaling, AVS. This is a closed loop dynamic power minimization method that adjusts the voltage sent to a computer chip to match the chip's needs during operation. If this is hacked, it can do permanent damage to your systems. And of course, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAV, otherwise known as drones. These are aircraft that carry no human pilot or passengers, and these drones are typically controlled remotely by a human pilot. These can be used for reconnaissance, information gathering, as part of an advanced persistent threat, or they can be hijacked by an attacker and used against your organization, in the same way that a camera can be hijacked. Let's talk about some security at the hardware level, for example, boot integrity using the newer or newish UEFI. Unified Extensible Firmware Interface replaces the legacy BIOS that we used for decades. It's low-level software for booting the device, and it tests the hardware components, the POST. It gets the OS up and running, and it offers the ability to protect the device at a lower level with passwords. We also have hardware root of trust available to us. This is anchoring the trustworthiness of a system to hardware, not software. Hardware solutions are obviously more secure than software solutions. They're less susceptible to attacks since security solutions are on chip and often need to violate physical security to get access or to do side channel attacks. Hardware root of trust is the foundation of a trusted execution environment, TEE, or trusted computing, TC. We have the TPM, the trusted platform module embedded into a system. We can also use SED, self-encrypting drives, and HSM, hardware security modules, or dedicated crypto processors. All of these can help us accomplish hardware root of trust. There's trusted platform module, or TPM. This is a computer chip or a microcontroller installed on the device, or it could be built into the PC, the server, the tablet, or the phone by the manufacturer. A TPM is a tamper-resistant security chip, and it stores information needed to authenticate the platform. It also provides integrity and confidentiality. It can protect passwords, X509 v3 certificates, and encryption keys. It gives us integrity to ensure the system has not been altered at a low level, authentication to ensure the system is in fact the correct system, and privacy, ensuring the system is protected from prying eyes. Another aspect of hardware trust is the SCD, the self-encrypting drive, which implements full disk encryption, or FDE. This is hardware-based data encryption. All the contents on the drive are encrypted, including the keys always, encrypts data as written, and decrypts data as read. It's invisible to the user or transparent, and it can't be turned off. SCDs are less susceptible to threats when compared to software-based encryption, for example, BitLocker. 
You have to be aware, however, of the possibility of stolen keys, repurposed drives, the threat of the device, and end of life or end of support from the vendor or manufacturer. But SEDs provide pre boot authentication, better endpoint security and device authentication, as well as encryption, key management that contribute to network access control, and your policy compliance for endpoints. Finally, we have OPAL. The TCG OPAL Security Subsystem Class, SSC, is a group of specifications for SEDs created by the Trusted Computing Group, the TCG. The OPAL SSC defines a hierarchy of security management standards to secure data from theft and tampering by unauthorized persons who can access a storage device or host system where the storage device resides. Our final topics in this course relate to High Performance Computing, HPC, and Edge Computing Systems. HPC facilities are connected to 10 or 100 gigabit network, just like any other compute systems, and often run the same Linux-based operating systems. And they've always been victimized by many of the same vulnerabilities, be they compromised access credentials, system misconfigurations, or software bugs. However, because of the nature of the high performance, these systems can run very unusual hardware and software stacks, and they may have quite different and specific purposes, for example, high-end math functions or computations, and specific modes of operations that most general-purpose computing systems don't have. What sets HPC systems apart is often not the hardware and software, but rather the types of sensitive data being processed and analyzed. And because of the speed of these systems, distributed attacks and polymorphic malware outbreaks will spread faster. These are also prime targets of your disgruntled privileged insider or a privileged insider leveraging this for data theft or other illegal activities. Edge computing systems relate to CDN, Content Delivery Network, or Content Distribution Networking. Edge Computing is a distributed computing standard that brings compute services and data storage close to the site where it's needed to speed up response times and preserve bandwidth. CDN solutions often place cached versions of content, often in elastic Redis in-memory storage clusters at metropolitan area edge locations all over the world. Security is a shared responsibility model between the customers, the service providers, and the content delivery networking providers. These would be companies like Akamai, Cloudflare, and AWS CloudFront. With edge computing, there's often a hybrid cloud solution between the cloud provider and the corporate edge. We're leveraging service delivery. We're offloading computing. We're managing IoT devices, and we can use this for storage and caching. Providers like AWS can use direct connections to service providers, and Azure can use Express Route with direct connections. In these environments, the customer has a virtual router cage at the service provider, and the cloud provider has a virtual router cage at the provider. All of this facilitating hybrid computing and content delivery networking. In other words, getting those videos and that audio and the streaming content as close to the customer as possible in metropolitan areas. For example, if you're securing AWS CloudFront as your CDN, you'll deploy Web Application Firewalls, WAF, on the distribution node in the cloud. You'll use cloud-based distributed denial of service protection and threat services, such as AWS Shield Advanced and guard duty. All control API calls must be digitally signed and use TLS-enabled endpoints. Private content features control who can download content from the CloudFront distribution. And origin access identities will control access to the original copies of objects, usually stored in object storage like S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Azure Blob.
In this course, Architecture Design and Solutions Vulnerabilities, you learned about client server, databases, and distributed system security, IoT, containers, serverless, and microservices, embedded system security and constraints, TPM, HPC, and edge computing security. In the next course, you'll explore physical security defense in depth, physical security controls, and data center, servers, and media security. We're going to begin this course with what I would call an introductory video talking about operational physical security. Now, the title basically relates to the fact that according to ISC Squared, there are three categories of controls, managerial, operational, and technical. And they put physical security in the operational category. The goal of physical security is to ensure the safety and the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, CIA, of all resources in the organization from environmental threats, natural disasters, man-made attacks, supply system threats, and socio-political threats. It would be helpful to have some prototypical examples in each one of these categories. So, for example, an environmental threat may be a gas leak. A natural disaster could be a hurricane or a typhoon. A man-made attack could be an active shooter or some explosives. A supply system threat, obviously, physical security threats throughout your supply chain, and socio-political threats like global pandemics or hacktivism. It's also important to realize that threats to physical security can be primary loss and secondary loss. Obviously, loss of life would be a primary loss. Interruption to your operations is an immediate primary loss. The resources that you use for incident management and handling and disaster recovery. Productivity loss as employees are taken away from their normal activities. The response time, for example, for your incident response swarm team or early responders and the action plan of your disaster recovery plan and loss of revenue. There can also be compromised confidentiality and integrity of your assets. Replacement cost is a critical secondary loss. Remember, it's much more costly to replace an employee than just simply switching out a new person with the same salary. Secondary loss of damaged public image and reputation. The loss of customers or competitive advantage and fines and judgment. Realize that secondary loss can often be more costly in the long run because it's a cascading loss that can actually continue for weeks or even years. When implementing physical security from an operational standpoint, you want to take a defense in depth approach. Often we begin at the property or facility edge and work our way back to the most valuable assets. Think of it as a castle where your keep would be, which could be a safe, a locked room in the CEO's office. It could be the data center or the server farm. Or you could begin at the keep where the most valuable mission critical assets are and work your way out to the physical edge. The physical edge could just be the front door of your office. There could be a parking lot. There could be several floors of a building. Or it could be an enterprise campus. This course will take an outward in approach to physical security. And different sites will have varying demarcation points of physical and logical entry. In the next lesson, we'll begin to look at some of those controls we can implement at the site edge or facility edge, starting with different barriers. One of the important factors about physical security on the exam is that it's really one of the easiest areas because most of us have different types of experience at different levels all of our lives with physical security. For example, the different type of perimeter barriers you would have at the edge of your facility or your property line. For example, high landscaping, hedgerows, thick brush, maybe even certain plants that have sharp foliage like cactus and roses. 
of course, fences of different types, metal fences, wood fences, six foot, eight foot, 10 foot. Maybe they have barbed wire facing in or out. Maybe they're electrical fences. Coming into your facility, it may be one way where you have a tire shredder if someone tries to go out that particular pathway. You see these in airports, for example. When you're leaving with your rental car, there's only one way out. You may see bollards. We can have bollards in front of our buildings, but we can also have them at the perimeter as well, often to direct pedestrians on a certain path. You may have moats or ponds or areas of water to keep out trespassers. And of course, gates. Physical gates that drop down, metal gates that come up, and the gates can be combined with tire shredders and bollards and other barriers. In the United States, gates are separated into classes. For example, a class one gate is basically just residential gate operation. Class two is a commercial gate, like you'd see in a parking lot or a garage. Type three is industrial or limited access. For example, gates and doors on warehouses that pull down, metal gates that pull down in front of a shop, for example, or a retail business, factory gates or loading docks. Class four is restricted access operation often that requires supervisory control with a security guard or a guard tower or a guard booth at prisons or airports and other high security facilities. Most organizations will have protective fence barriers around the perimeter to deter or prevent individuals from unauthorized entry and exit. Fences may only be used in certain zones or areas, for example, to protect junction boxes, generators, dumpsters, and maybe shredding service pickup points. High security areas will use barbed wire and or electric fences combined with warning signs every six to eight feet. The barbed wire can be in-facing, out-facing, or both. And fences are combined with entry and exit gates of varying strength. They could be barricade gates, for example, wooden arms that come down, or a metal gate that's electronic. They can also be combined with tire shredders. Bollards are basically vertical posts. They're strategically placed pylons meant to prohibit vehicles from entering certain areas, even a building. They're placed in front of buildings, in parking lots, or along sidewalks in order to guide pedestrian traffic. They're typically concrete or strong metal, and newer high-tech bollards can be mechanical. They can be raised and lowered. They can include cameras and other sensors. Although bollards are typically vertical, in some situations you may see horizontal bollards as well. There's also signage. Signs are a deterrent control. Signs and window stickers are designed to deter individuals from doing something unauthorized, or the sign is there for their own protection, for example, on electric fences, or if guard dogs and armed guards are involved, so they may be combined with harmful fences. A logical system banner, let's say on a firewall or a router, is also a form of signage. However, that's more of an administrative slash technical control as opposed to a physical control. The sign may say, authorized personnel only, do not enter, no trespassing, beware of dog, Caution electric fence, or armed guard on duty. In this lesson, we're going to get a survey of physical security controls. Most of these are common sense, so this is a pretty long lesson. And I'm going to go at a pretty quick pace because most of this is information that we're all well aware of. But we want to have this under our belt for the exam. Let's start out with closed circuit television and security cameras which provide a way to monitor and record the property perimeter and other facility areas looking for intruders and potential attackers or hoaxers. Cameras are considered a detective control primarily, although their very presence could be a deterrent. Commonly, there's recording devices sent to monitoring stations where they're being monitored by security guards or security technicians. Also, the backup recorded media from CCTV and security cameras 
should be securely stored, whether it's on optical disks or other types of tape-based mechanisms. And cameras should trigger alerts if they're disabled. Cameras should also be combined with adequate lighting, especially when running at nighttime. And of course, all the dead spots of the cameras and the lighting should be covered. Lighting is for visibility. We have internal lighting and we have external lighting systems and they should have different operating modes and different types of lights. For example, low lights for posts and for patrolling, glaring lights for intruders. They can be tripped or triggered, or they can be bright lights in certain areas at all times. The common types of protective lighting systems include continuous lighting, which is the most common type, trip lighting, lighting activated by some trigger or sensor, standby lighting, which is activated when suspicious activity is suspected or as part of a standby when a power outage occurs, and emergency lighting, lighting used for limited times if there's power failure. Mercury vapor lights is the least temperature sensitive. This is the preferred outdoor security lighting. This is the type you see at stadiums, for example. It's got long life, strong illumination, but it turns on very slowly. Sodium vapor lighting is a soft yellow light. It's more effective than mercury, and it's great in fog. Quartz lighting is a bright white light, so it gives high visibility. It turns on immediately, and it's ideal for perimeters and problem areas, often operating at 1500 to 2000 watts. LED lights are cost-effective, inexpensive and available. Industrial camouflage is a concept where cameras and surveillance devices are camouflaged in landscaping elements, in statues and tall trees. They can even be in bollards as well. For example, towers carrying cell phone and other equipment might be covered by fake trees. Certain high security rooms can be underground and set at a distance from the main building as a form of camouflage. Security guards are a very important security control. Guards are typically 24 by 7, but they could be just on site during the business hours or just on site during the off hours. There is security control of multiple types. Security guards are detective, looking for suspicious persons, often involved in onboarding guests and contractors maybe giving out temporary badges and doing quick background checks. Their existence can be preventative. They can prevent crimes and incidents, for example, active shooters, and their very presence can be a deterrent as well. Security guards should be able to provide rapid security response if an intrusion or an incident occurs, and they should be able to work with local law enforcement as well. Some considerations for security guards includes, do you hire them or are they contracted? Are they freelance? Are they certified or licensed? Will they be armed or unarmed? What is the impact of having security guards on your insurance policy? It could lower your premiums to have a security guard. However, it could raise your premiums if they're armed because of liability issues. Are you involved with the screening and the background checks of the security guards? Or do you offload that to a third party? And who provides the ongoing training and security awareness of the security guards? Some companies today are relying more on robotic sentries. These can be used in home or commercial environments as security guards with cameras, sensors, and more. For example, the Samsung SGRA1 is a type of sentry gun that was developed jointly with Korea University to support South Korean troops in the Korean demilitarized zone. Look for robotic sentries to play a greater role in the coming years. There's a wide variety of different sensors that can detect motion. For example, photoelectric will be triggered if there's a break in a light beam. There's passive infrared looking for a break in the infrared light. Vibration responds to changes in vibration levels. Acoustic changes in sound waves. 
Microwave, a change in radio waves. Electromechanical, this is a break in electrical circuit. You often see these on alarm systems on doors and windows. Electrostatic, a change in electrostatic field. And of course, sensors for moisture and temperature detection. We use these for server rooms and data center environmental controls. Now, if you have a sensor, it's going to trigger some type of alert or alarm. This could be a static or flashing light on a display panel. These could be a bell ringing or a horn blaring, for example, greater than 130 decibels. It could be an SMS or text message sent to a security officer. It could be a telephone call or some other software alert to a security desk or to law enforcement. Or the alarm could be a silent alarm. For example, ones that are seen in banks and museums. Locks are the most common physical security mechanism. They're considered a preventative control, although they technically only delay entry, not prevent it in the long run. However, for the exam, locks are a preventative control. They keep honest people out, but cannot deter resolute intruders since most locks can be easily bypassed and most keys can be readily duplicated. Locks can be physical, they can be electronic, they can be biometric. A key lock is the lock that requires a key to open. A warded lock has wards that are obstructions to the keyhole that prevent all but the properly cut key from entering. A wafer tumbler has a wafer under spring tension in the core or the plug of the lock and protrude outside the diameter of the plug into a shell formed by the lock body. A deadbolt is a bolt inserted into the frame of the door for additional security, often combined with other locks. An interchangeable core lock is a lock with a core that can be removed and replaced using a special change key. Combination lock involve a sequence of numbers in proper order. These can be mechanical or they can be digital. Electronic combination has a digital readout and obtains its power from the energy created when the dials are turned. This is better security than combination locks, but they're more expensive. Keyless locks. These have buttons that are pushed in sequence to open the door, sometimes called a cipher lock. You see these often in the doors leading back to break rooms or other areas in retail outlets. And a smart lock. An inexpensive plastic card that is pre-authenticated to open a door. We see smart locks used in most hotels. As far as breaking physical locks goes, there's picking, where you use a tension wrench to rotate the key plug of the lock to find the lock tumblers. And at the same time, the pick is used to move the binding tumblers one at a time to the shear line. When all the tumblers are aligned properly with the shear line, the lock opens. There's also raking. This uses a pick that has a wider tip inserted all the way to the back of the plug. The pick is then pulled out quickly so that all the pins are bounced up, and as the rake exits, the tension wrench turns the plug. Upper pins will fall on the ledge, created by the turning pins, so the remaining pins can be picked. And then we have brute force. Brute force techniques will always be successful, given enough time and effort. This involves using hammers, tire irons, firearms, explosives, and more. Brute force contributes to locks being a delay control in practicality. There's also personnel controls. Many organizations will have all guests register at a reception area security desk. They'll collect and input identification information into a visitor log. There may be a camera station with a picture being made for a temporary badge. They'll distribute temporary access cards or badges. Guests and contractors may go through rapid background checks and identity validation procedures. And guests may need to always be escorted by another employee or a security officer to provide two-person integrity and control. And, of course, there's no piggybacking or tailgating policies in play. In this brief lesson, we're going to talk about the importance of having power controls. And it really comes down to having redundancies. Whether you be a small organization or a large organization, 
If you can have more than one source of power, it'd be beneficial from a disaster recovery standpoint. But power system security does involve practices to keep the systems operating when certain components and subcomponents fail. Most power systems are operated so that any single initial failure event will not leave other components too heavily overloaded. Enterprises should deploy redundant providers, if affordable, surge protectors, uninterruptible power supplies or UPS devices, and various backup generators using diesel fuel or perhaps a lithium battery with solar panels. In addition, all of your power junctions should be secured, preferably with a cage or a gate, and have adequate lighting and cameras for visibility. Let's compare blackouts to brownouts. A blackout is the complete stopping of electrical power in an area for longer periods of time. A blackout can last from hours to days and can extend into weeks in case of serious emergency or natural disaster like thunderstorms, flooding, or earthquakes. Blackouts can also occur due to a technical problem at grid stations, the electricity production site, or some issues with transmission lines being cut, for example. Although blackouts are bad, in actuality, brownouts can be more damaging. This is the intentional or unintentional sag, slump, or drops in electrical voltage. These are not insignificant, as they can be very damaging to electrical devices and can cause them to function poorly or eventually go bad. Brownouts can occur due to a thunderstorm, rain, or any other natural disaster. The opposite of a brownout is a surge, and those can be troublesome as well, which is why you should have well-tested and newer surge protectors. Those should help you in most circumstances, however, realize in thunderstorms or other electrical storms, if there's something that occurs very nearby, even a surge protector is not going to help you. That's why it's important to have hot spares and failover devices as part of your disaster recovery plan. Another important physical control, part of your operational controls, is controlling your environment. Poor heating, poor ventilation, and issues with air conditioning or HVAC can lead to extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme humidity, and or lack of humidity or extreme dryness. All of these things can cause problems for equipment. Environmental controls need proper monitoring and ongoing maintenance. For example, pressurization, temperature, and humidity. In addition, physical security of all of these environmental components and controllers is a concern as well. The location of these controls may be limited by your facility and possibly may be more difficult to protect than other obvious areas like your network operation center or your security operation center. Often, the environmental controls are built into the facility or they're under the auspices of facility management and may not have the type of stringent controls that you need. And don't forget, environmental controls also includes the possibility of chemical or biological or gas leaks or attacks, depending upon what substances are at your organization. In larger data centers historically, they'll set up hot and cold aisles. Recommended temperatures for your racks of devices and these can be servers, infrastructure devices, hypervisors, or whatever, is 72 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Humidity, 40 to 60 percent is recommended. We maintain hot and cold aisles in the server rooms and the data centers and the operation centers to move hot air from the devices into a hot aisle and then redirect that to an air conditioning unit or possibly into a separate air conditioning room. If possible, you should have separate air conditioning controls for your data center or your server room that are completely separate than, let's say, the local area network or other aspects of your building. Realize that unless you work for a small business or in a small site, your endpoints are not directly connected to the switches. There's going to be some type of punch down or some distribution area between that endpoint and the switch in the server room 
or the data center. You have to gain visibility into all of the Ethernet and fiber cable runs, as well as the security of the way that you distribute those areas. It may be a distribution frame in a closet or an MDF room. You need to know how your wires are run. Are they run under the floor, above ceiling panels, are they in the walls, or a combination of those three? If you have server rooms or MDF rooms, make sure that they have locking mechanisms on them, preferably two locks, and in high security environments, multi factor authentication. You can also combine cameras along with other types of sensors and access alarms on these wiring closets and MDF rooms. Preferably, you should have no window access or if the main door does have a window, maybe use security windows that have wire mesh involved. Sometimes these MDF rooms or distribution closets have management stations or laptops in them. Make sure those are hardened and highly protected with access controls. You want to have environmental controls for these frame rooms and closets as well for temperature, humidity, and detection for fire and gas. In a large campus, you'll have the access area. The access would be the endpoints that connect to layer two and multi layer switches. You may have an intermediate distribution frame, for example, two of these per floor. Then those will connect to the distribution frame, maybe one per building. The building distribution frames will connect back to the core. This would be the data center or the server farm, the main router backbone connected by dark fiber. In this lesson, let's expand upon the concepts from the previous lessons when we talked about server rooms, distribution frames, and other areas. You want to know all of your ingress and egress points. And this goes beyond just doors and windows, any conduits. Make sure you implement protective barriers where necessary. You want to have redundant and monitored support systems for your server rooms and your data centers. Get visibility into all power conduits and water lines and gas lines, as well as visibility into the high security compartmentalized areas. For example, where your main security officers reside in the security operations center. Work with facilities management to integrate blueprints and topological diagrams into your IT services. You have to control physical access, both at the perimeter and at the room ingress points, possibly by using professional security staff with video surveillance, intrusion detection systems, and other electronic methods and sensors. Authorized staff should pass two-factor authentication, a minimum of two times to access data center floors. In addition, biometric multi-factor authentication is highly recommended. Facial recognition, ocular scanning, fingerprint scanning, and other techniques. All visitors and contractors must show identification and be signed in and continually escorted by authorized staff, especially in high security areas. When an employee no longer has a business need for a data center privilege, access must be immediately revoked, even if they continue to be an employee. Don't forget about automatic fire detection and suppression equipment. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. The electrical power system should be fully redundant if possible and maintainable without impact to operations 24-7. UPS units can provide backup power for critical and essential loads in the facility in the event of an electrical failure. And data centers often use generators to provide backup power for the entire facility. Air gap is the physical separation of the control network and other networks. If you can, separate the highly secure networks from the unsecured networks with physical and or logical compartmentalization. Log and audit all devices and objects entering and exiting the facility. In some high security environments, no laptops or cell phones are allowed. They must be stored with a security desk or put into a locked cabinet before entering the secure area. And of course, put in technical controls to stop malicious and privileged users from getting unauthorized access. 
test these with private clouds, sandboxes, and detonation chambers. For many organizations, the most valuable area, for example, if we're doing defense in depth from the out in or from the in out, or our keep would be some type of secure enclosure. The corporate safe may be the highest value asset in the organization based on its contents. It could have valuable items such as currency, deeds, securities, policies, precious metals, a cyber currency cold storage devices like a Nano X or a Kobo Vault. It could also be fail safe passwords, break the glass credentials, licenses, and other agreements. Employees themselves may need a special area to store and protect valuables, such as lockers or locked cabinets. A reinforced filing cabinet is a type of secured container designed to withstand most common burglary attempts. The U.S. government provides container classifications for these reinforced containers based on the time taken to break into them, either covertly or surreptitiously with no forced entry. The Underwriters Laboratory, UL, provides safe classifications that specify the degree to which safes can withstand attack. For example, a safe that takes 30 minutes to break into using various tools and torches is classified as a tool-resistant safe, class TL30. Factors considered in classifying the safe include locking mechanisms, material used to construct the safe, the weight and whether it's securely anchored or embedded in concrete, the tensile strength of the steel, and whether the safe has a re-locking device. There's also media storage facilities. These locations often store data backups and redundant spares. May include hard copies of documents and microfiches and more. Facilities and media storage should be part of the continuity of operations plan and business continuity planning. The same access policies that apply to a data center and other sensitive areas of the organization should apply to your media storage facility. Another alternative is to use a cloud provider like Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, or Azure, who offer long-term data archiving and usage of their hardware security modules. We call this Cloud HSM, leveraging their strong AES GCM 256 encryption. Media storage should be covered with a disposition and destruction policy. In other words, eventually the media must be disposed of properly. When a storage device has reached the end of its useful life, or the policy, procedures should include a decommissioning process that prevents data from being exposed or leaked. NIST Special Publication 800-88 offers guidelines for media sanitation. You could use this as part of your decommissioning process and procedure. There's also evidence storage. As part of incident response and forensics, you may have an evidence room or evidence storage. And these facilities are only really as secure as the honesty of your staff. You might want to introduce separation of duties and dual operator or two-person rules in an evidence storage environment. And that's because often the value of the evidence could have a high street value. It's the same stringent security as you'd see in a data center, but chain of custody must be maintained for incident response, forensics, and law enforcement, and eventual introduction in court as evidence. As I mentioned, the contents may have a higher street value than typical media storage. The walls of the evidence room should be made of materials like cinder blocks or concrete instead of drywall, and all walls should extend from ceiling to floor with no ability to access over the walls or through a false ceiling. Doors must be solid, preferably steel, with no glass, and preferably there should be no doors leading directly to the exterior of the building from whatever the evidence room is. In addition, modern digital evidence management software could be used. A man trap is a system that routes personnel through two interlock controlled doors 
into a private area. The design specifies that the inner door will not unlock if the outer door is open or unlocked, and vice versa. In most cases, a person must produce some form of authentication or identification to enter the second door. Man traps are often used in areas that are highly secure or you're dealing with very valuable assets. Man traps can also prevent piggybacking and tailgating as only one person is allowed in the enclosure at one time. The main goal of the man trap is for the person to be identified and authenticated properly, providing credentials such as a passport, a driver's license. They can also sit in the man trap area while a background check is being done. It could include biometric readers. There could be closed circuit television, webcams, or other intercom systems are often used. You may have a security guard behind bulletproof glass interacting with the person in the man trap. The person will eventually be allowed in through the strong door, which typically has electronic locks or biometric locks. Faraday cages are rooms or enclosures or bags that block electromagnetic fields emanating from electric magnetic interference, EMI, Carrington events, solar flares, and EMP, electromagnetic pulses. The shield may be fashioned from a continuous covering of conductive material, or in the case of a Faraday cage, a mesh of similar materials. These can often be found in data centers or other enterprise safe rooms. Military-grade Faraday bags can also be used for removable drives, cold storage cyber currency wallets, and other critical components. An air gap is a secure system that has no access to the internet or a public network. As a matter of fact, an air gap may be disconnected from any network and only allows out-of-band access. An air gap can be accomplished physically or it can be done logically, for example, a private VLAN. Keep in mind, though, that air gap components are still vulnerable to a rogue insider. In fact, the Stuxnet virus was introduced into an air gapped area by a contractor with a laptop. Air gaps are often used in military and governmental agency networks and systems. They're used in financial systems, such as stock and cyber currency exchanges. They're very effective in industrial control systems like SCADA and in utilities like water processing facilities. Air gaps are used in life critical systems such as nuclear power plants, computers used in aviation, and specialized computerized medical equipment. Let's wrap up this course looking at fire controls. There are three aspects to fire controls, prevention being the key. With prevention, we want to use fire-rated construction materials. We want to have good training and safety preparedness. In other words, be prepared for all different types of fires. Next, we have detection, using smoke and fire detectors and other sensors with the goal of quick control and minimizing damage. And then suppression, containing and extinguishing the fire. As far as fire suppression goes, we want to create barriers. We can use firewalls in buildings and in ships and other areas to prevent the spread of fire. Make sure that portable fire extinguishers are available and that they're tested. Locate them in strategic places throughout the building. If possible, to save human life, use automatic water sprinkler systems. These are common but they can cause water damage and worsen electrical fires. Use halon substitutes or carbon dioxide discharge systems. These are commonly used around computers and networking equipment. There are four main types of extinguishers. Type A are used for common combustibles. This uses water, water mist, or soda acid. Type B is for combustible liquids petroleum products and coolants. Here we can use halocarbons, inert gas, carbon dioxide, dry powders or soda acids. Type C is for electrical equipment and wires. 
Here we can use inert gas, dry powders, powdered aerosols, foam, or carbon dioxide. And type D is for combustible metals, and here we can only use dry powder. In this course on site and facility security, you learned about physical defense in depth, from the outside in and to the inside out. Survey of common physical controls. Facility and site security. And fire prevention, detection, and suppression. In the next course, you'll get a survey of secure protocols, wireless and cellular network security, and endpoint security. In the first lesson of this course, we want to do a survey of some very common secure protocols to be aware of for the CISSP exam. And of course, there's Secure Shell. We don't want to use Telnet ever. And instead of that, we want to use Secure Shell, and specifically Secure Shell version 2. It's preferable to Secure Shell version 1 whenever possible. Secure Shell 2 uses symmetric encryption for the bulk data encryption and then asymmetric algorithms in their key management processes. For example, it uses Diffie-Hellman for key exchange. Here's an example of configuring Secure Shell 2 on a very popular router, the Cisco router. Notice that we're going to have a host name and a domain name. That information is going to be the fully qualified name that will actually seed the certificates. So it'll be cissp-r1.example.com. So we're going to generate keys, uh, RSA keys. There'll be general keys. And we want to use a modulus of at least 20,048. We could do 1,024, but for any new implementation, uh, our key size, our key space should always be at least 20,048. That's the takeaway from this configuration slide. So we can see here the name of the keys will be cissp-r1.example.com. At the bottom, we see a syslog message, level 5, and it says SSH 1.99 has been enabled. And what that means is, is that this is backward compatible. So if you do have a client that wants to manage this Cisco router, it's using Secure Shell 1, it will still be able to operate. So it can use either version 1 or version 2. And then, of course, we're going to apply this to all 16 VTY lines. Login local means that we're going to present them with a login screen. And the only transport mechanism we'll allow is inbound Secure Shell. SMIME is very popular and necessary. SMTP is not natively secure, so it needs an extra security layer, and that's where Secure Multipurpose Internet Mail Exchanger comes in. SMIME version 3 has become the standard for email message security. Digital signatures are the most common SMIME service, providing authentication, data integrity, and non repudiation. Here's an example of sending an email using SMIME. First, the message body is captured, then unique sender information is retrieved, and then unique recipient information is retrieved. After that, the signing operation is performed. That's the digital signature. It gets appended to the original email message. Encryption operation is performed, and then encryption message replaces the original message, and the message is sent. FTPS essentially is the file transfer protocol over TLS. The S stands for SSL, but today we're almost always using TLS, Transport Layer Security. It's also called FTP over TLS and FTP Secure. This is typically used for server-to-server -server transfers, and it uses the AES protocol, RSA and DSA, and X509 version 3 certificates. There's explicit FTPS, which means selected parts or components for communication are encrypted, or implicit FTPS, where all communications are encrypted. On your exam, remember, when you see a protocol and it has an S after it, or a dash S, that means over SSL TLS. If you see an S in front of the protocol, as we do here, that's going to be using Secure Shell 1 or Secure Shell 2. So SFTP is an IETF-designed version of FTP 
to provide secure data access and transfer over a secure shell channel. It's also called the SSH file transfer protocol. Both the commands and the data are encrypted, and it's platform independent, but it's slower than the secure copy protocol, SCP, that's been used for years in Unix and Linux. Next, we have DNSSEC, or DNS Security Extensions. This protects users from DNS attacks and forces systems to detect DNS attacks. It adds a layer of trust on top of DNS by providing authentication, while the root DNS name servers help us verify the domains. To facilitate signature validation, DNSSEC adds a few new DNS record types. There's RRSIG, which contains a cryptographic signature, DNS key, which contains a public signing key, there's the DS record, which contains the hash of a DNS key record. The NSEC and NSEC3, those records are for explicit denial of existence of a DNS record. And CDNS key and CDS. This is for a child zone requesting updates to a DS record or records in the parent zone. Next, we have Secure RTP. This is for voice over IP security. Secure Real-Time Transport Protocol extends the RTP protocol by providing enhanced security techniques. It provides encryption, integrity, and authentication verification of data and messages transported by RTP. It was released in 2004 by a partnership of Cisco Systems and Ericsson. It uses AES as its default encryption cipher in Segmented Integer Counter Mode and F8 Mode to allow the AES block cipher to be used as a stream cipher for the RTP voice data stream. LDAP was based on X500, but it's a lighter cross-platform and standards-based solution. LDAP servers are easy to install, maintain, and optimize. They're very popular, but they're without solid security of the queries, updates, and valuable information stored in the LDAP directory. Therefore, we have LDAP-S using TCP port 636, basically LDAP over SSL TLF. SASL, Simple Authentication and Security Layer, BIND, also offers authentication services using mechanisms like Kerberos or a client certificate sent with TLS. SNMP version 3 can be configured in three secure modes. No auth, no prive, which means no cryptographic hash or encryption. However, it uses passwords instead of the older community strings for better security. Auth no prive uses a cryptographic HMAC, SHA-1 or SHA-2, to secure authentication credentials and provide integrity. However, there's no data encryption or no privacy. Auth prive is basically using an HMAC for integrity and secure authentication credentials and encryption AES of data. Auth prive is similar to IPsec ESP, where auth no prive is similar to IPsec authentication header. Quick is a newish transport protocol that was originally designed by Jim Roskind at Google. It reduces latency compared to using TCP on the internet. Since TCP is implemented in operating system kernels and middle box firmware, making significant changes to TCP is pretty much impossible today. Quick is built on top of UDP, so it doesn't have those limitations. Quick is like TCP plus TLS plus HTTP2 implemented over UDP, and it provides for dramatically reduced connection establishment time, improved congestion control, multiplexing without head of line blocking, and connection migration. Finally, we have HTTP Strict Transport Security, or HSTS. If a website accepts an HTTP connection and redirects it to the HTTPS, users may initially access the non-encrypted version of the site before being redirected. This creates a vulnerability to man-in-the-middle attacks, as the redirect can be exploited to direct users to a malicious site instead of the secure version of the original site. HTTP Strict Transport Security, HSTS, allows a TLS website to instruct browsers that it should only be accessed using HTTPS instead of using HTTP.
the web server employs the HTTP strict dash transport dash security header. Software defined networking or SDN virtualizes network functionality by separating the control and data planes and implementing the network intelligence in software, typically hypervisor or proprietary server solutions. Microsegmentation is a method of creating zones in data centers and server farms and cloud environments to insulate workloads from one another and secure them independently. For example, microsegmentation is a way for cloud providers to offer multi-tenancy to many customers using the same underlying hardware. In this diagram, we see a topology of software-defined networking or SDN. At the bottom, we have our pool of application servers or blades. Those again can be running in hypervisors across storage area networks. At the data plane, we have our logical or virtual switches. Notice we have a CDPI over on the right. That's basically an agent and device drivers. CDPI standing for control to data plane interface. And that's what it is. It's a management interface between the administrator or the management VLAN and the SDN data path. The SDN data path has a separate data plane and a separate control plane with the SDN controller. That's a major advantage over historical physical switches and physical routers which don't have total separation of the data plane, control plane, and management plane. And again, on top of the SDN controller, we have our applications, which are typically the client side or web enabled clients and other virtualized applications. SDN was pioneered by Cisco Systems. We also have what's called SD-WAN, Software Defined Wide Area Networking. This is an approach using SDN that raises network traffic management away from the hardware and the premises to next generation software running in the cloud, providing superior agility, control, and visibility. SDN WAN incorporates a centralized control function with user-defined application and routing policies to deliver highly secure, robust, application-aware network traffic management. A good example of SD-WAN would be using Amazon Web Services Transit Gateway. Here's a Microsoft SD-WAN solution. We have a central headquarters with its CPE, customer premises equipment, and then four SD-WAN branches, or regional branch offices. Notice that all four, or just one, can use software as a service or Office 365 solutions as well. All of these sites are managed virtually with the SD-WAN Enterprise Controller or Orchestrator. And in this example, all of the branches in the headquarters are functioning with Microsoft Azure in the cloud with its virtual WAN and virtual networks. VXLAN is a solution that's offered from a variety of vendors that helps decouple the physical hardware from the network map to support virtualization. This uncoupling allows the data center network to be deployed programmatically. It allows both layer two and layer three transport between virtual machines and bare metal servers. VXLAN has a much larger scale than traditional VLANs. In a VXLAN architecture, you have your core, which are represented by physical or virtual multi-layer switches or routers. These cores connect to four different spines, and the spine objects connect to different leafs. In this example, up to 96 leaf objects. The leaf objects are connected to the end systems, Ethernet connected systems, IP connected systems, and others over various bandwidths. 10 gig, 40 gig, aggregated trunks for failover or high availability, and VXLANs can give you 10 gigabit speeds up to 100 gigabit speeds. For example, in cloud service provider data centers, moving from 10 gig to 100 gig speeds. All of this being virtualized and managed programmatically. This will be one of the longer lessons throughout the entire training and your best approach 
to this particular lesson as we look at this infrastructure security overview is to do a gap analysis. As I go through this, if I mention a technology or a solution or a control that you aren't familiar with, then D-Y-O-R, do your own research and fill in that gap. We're going to start at layer two of the OSI model and look at switch and layer two security. Switch port security as a base configuration on all layer two devices is just fundamental to security. Now, if you're working with a cloud service provider, you don't have to worry about layer two because you're doing infrastructure as a service and they'll handle the switches, the physical and virtual switches in the hypervisor. But we're assuming that you have these in your enterprise. So you wanna hard code the ports. Access ports should be access ports. Trunk ports should be trunk ports. And remember, trunk ports don't just go to other switches. A trunk port can go to a server or some other device, maybe that's running a hypervisor. You wanna mitigate MAC flooding attacks by only allowing a certain number of MAC addresses to associate with those access ports. You want to enable port fast. You want Spanish tree protocol to go through its process as quickly as possible, and also auto recover whenever you have to error disable a port for some reason. You want to put in loop prevention mechanisms, use the most recent and proper version of STP, and techniques to guard against flooding of those bridge protocol data units, those BPDUs that are used by your spanning tree protocol. You want to deploy VLANs properly and private VLANs to enforce that layer two trust model and compartmentalization by isolating individual ports into private VLANs to prevent frames from being sent to devices in the same broadcast domain or the same VLAN. You want to turn on DHCP snooping. You want to learn about all of the behavior as your devices get IP addresses and associate them with MAC addresses, their VLAN membership. That should all be in a binding table on your layer two or multi-layer device. DAI is going to be leveraging DHCP snooping to do dynamic ARP inspection to prevent ARP attacks. And then IP source guard could be used to dynamically assign a port-based ACL to a particular port if there's some violation of that DHCP binding table for your IP datagrams and packets. If you're using a dynamic trunking protocol like VTP, make sure that you have the proper techniques to protect that replication protocol. And of course, implement IEEE 802.1x port-based network access control to get layer two access control for various scenarios and to get protection of the frames sent from the supplicant to the switch or between the switches, you can use .11 AE MACSEC. MACSEC is going to use AES GCM 128 or 256 with a GMAC. In other words, you don't need a separate HMAC because AES GCM can be deployed as an AEAD, authenticated encryption, authenticated decryption. Wireless LAN controllers are very important for our wireless security of our dot .11. WLCs have a session level access control for different management protocols and for management frame protection features. Remember, MFP is optional in WPA2, but it's part of the WPA3 architecture. All interactive management traffic to the controller will be done through a HTTPS or secure shell encrypted channel. You have control plane policing and CPU access control list to control the control plane of the LAN controller and which devices can talk to the main controller processor. The controller can also implement network IDS and IPS solutions, and you can use SIEM systems and log event correlation as you send information from the controller and the access points to your SIEM system. And again, we want to make sure that we're locating rogue radios and rogue access points, which might be trying to do ARP attacks or DHCP starvation to introduce themselves as a DHCP server. Secure routers will perform a wide variety of security services. They can do network address translation. They can have infrastructure access control lists or static packet filtering on their ports. They can do unicast and multicast reverse path forwarding 
as an anti-spoofing mechanism for unicast and multicast traffic. They have integrated and modular layer two through seven next generation firewalls. So it can be part of the operating system or you can have a modular component that's a content security firewall or an IDS or IPS sensor. So secure routers can either have that as part of their operating system that is optional or in the chassis of the router, it can be a modular component or if it's a virtual router, it could be an additional service or engine that you're running in that virtual router. Secure routers can be VPN gateways for TLS and IPsec. They can perform URL filtering and URL caching services. That can tie into your acceptable use policies of your end users. And routers can have integration with various cloud security services. So web security, email security, data loss prevention, and anti-malware services. Or they can coordinate with MSSPs, managed security service providers. For example, Fortinet's FortiGate. A firewall is a metaphor. It represents software and or hardware, physical and or virtual controls that can limit the damage spreading from one subnet or VLAN or zone or domain to another. So the goal of the firewall is to prevent the fire from spreading from one zone to another, not to keep the fire from starting. It's typically deployed as a barrier or a zone interface point between an internal trusted network and an external untrusted network. However, you want to have firewalls deployed between all of our different domains and zones. And it could be a single device with an interface in two different zones, or it could be two different devices, one in each zone with a high-speed Ethernet connection between the two firewalls. They are integrated systems of threat defense, functioning at layers 2 through 7 of the OSI model, and they can be categorized as network firewalls or specific application firewalls. Next generation firewalls have a wide variety of features. They have layer 5 through 7 policies. So going beyond just allowing traffic, let's say on port 80 or port 443 or FTP 20 and 21, and making decisions on the metadata or the headers of IP, TCP, UDP, ICMP and possibly ESP, but you can go 8,000K or more into the packet and make decisions on the behavior. So we call this deep packet inspection or advanced visibility and control. You can be an authentication proxy. You can authenticate interactively where the firewall actually provides some type of web page or some type of login screen, or it can be transparent. They can provide identity services. Firewalls can integrate and provide attribute-based access controls and identity management by working with radius and diameter services or possibly something like a Cisco identity services engine. They can have integrated IDS and IPS, either part of the firewall operating system or as a modular component. They can even use cloud-based IPS. They can provide content security, including data loss prevention engines and advanced malware protection, often with a cloud-based integrated solution, either with the vendor of the firewall or some other third party. They can perform URL filtering to enforce the AUPs. They can do botnet filtering. This is DNS-based anti-distributed denial of service protection, botnets being the most common DDoS attacks. And correlating and participating with the vendor's cloud or other third-party clouds, including cloud service providers. We could call this integration security as a service. A WAF or a web application firewall is a type of layer five through seven firewall. It's an appliance, either physical or virtual, or a server plugin or even a filter engine that applies a set of rules to an HTTP or HTTPS conversation. So a WAF is specific to web traffic. Typically, these rules cover common web attacks, such as cross-site scripting, XSS, and SQL injection, SQLi. They're typically deployed as a dynamically configured web ACL and anti-DDoS engine, along with other threat management services. 
the Amazon Web Services WAP, for example, can be deployed on an Elastic Application Load Balancer, a CDN, Content Distribution Networking Distribution, or an API Gateway. You've already mentioned the fact that routers and firewalls can have integrated IDS and IPS, either part of the operating system or as a module. Let's look at the difference here. On the left-hand side, we have intrusion detection. This is going to be reactive. So you've got some type of device like a switch or some other multi-layer device that is sending copies of frames to the IDS. So it's basically promiscuously analyzing traffic. It could even be something like a packet sniffer or a network tap that kind of looks like a hub or a switch. With IDS, it's going to be reactive. So the payload will most likely make its way to the corporate network device or server or workstation, and then you have to react to it. Now, that doesn't mean that IDS cannot do aggressive things. It can do a TCP reset. It can send a shun up to a upstream firewall or a block, a dynamic ACL to an upstream router. It can take aggressive actions. It just can't do it in line in real time. To do that, you have to have the IPS, Intrusion Prevention System, which is going to be behind the firewall, either physically or logically, and in-line processing of packets. So if it matches its signature database, or it's some anomaly, or it matches a heuristic engine or something else in the cloud, for example, the IPS can drop the packet, it can deny the attacker before it gets to the corporate network. Most modern systems or sensors are going to be IPS. It's just that you deploy them in a monitor mode or a passive mode or an active mode. Often you'll deploy the IPS initially in a passive mode or like an IDS sensor so you can analyze the traffic and you can reduce the false positives and reduce the false negatives and tune it before you put it into production and have it in line. It can be in line or it can be in a monitor or IDS mode. We could call that in band or out of band. It could be signature based, which all of them are traditionally based on a set of signatures, kind of like your spam filter or your antivirus. More often than not, the signatures are going to be downloaded dynamically from the vendor's website or from a cloud provider. They can also be anomaly based, looking for anomalous behavior, for example, a scanning worm. They can use heuristic engines and behavioral based or machine learning algorithms, often from some type of data center appliance or the cloud. And again, it can be a cloud-based next generation IPS, for example, from Palo Alto Networks. IPS can send alerts and alarms. It can send a verbose alert, which is a basic dump of the packet. It can do a TCP reset to the sender and receiver. All three of these can be done by an IDS or an IPS, by the way. But only an inline IPS sensor can drop packets or drop addresses. IDS and IPS can both send a block or a shun to an upstream or downstream firewall or router. They can send SNMP traps, version 2C or version 3. They can send logs to a syslog server and to seam systems or flows to NetFlow collectors. You have to tune your IPS sensor. Remember those true positives? True means accurate. Positive means an action was taken. A true negative means it was accurate, but an action was not taken. A false positive is an error state where an action was taken. And a false negative is an error state where an action was not taken. We want true positives and true negatives. We want to reduce false positives and false negatives. Realize, however, there's an inverse relationship between false positives and false negatives. The more that you expand parameters, for example, the number of events and the amount of time to reduce false positives, you can actually increase the occurrence of false negatives. Also, part of your network infrastructure would be honey pots and honey nets. These are isolated systems or sites or services with data that appear to be valuable to an attacker. We can entice potential malicious users to connect, either internal or external. 
We can use honey pots and honey nets to track and log all traffic to and from. We can run IDS services, another next generation cloud based analysis. We can perform active defense procedures. Here we can see we have a honey net VLAN out in front of our firewall, but behind our perimeter edge device or our CPE, customer premises equipment, for example, a router or a multi layer switch. These are typically deployed in virtual environments or hypervisors. Active defense involves really three areas. Deception, which is the initial use of a honeypot, basically to slow down the attacker or get them bogged down in some fake telemetry network. Attribution, actually discovering the domain or IP address of the attacker. And then counterattack or attack back. Deception is the first and most common phase of active defense used by many organizations. Fake telemetry involves augmenting existing enterprise tools to offer critical threat intelligence for early breach detection and high fidelity alerting. Making tools available on honeypots and honey nets for attackers to use in order to attribute or potentially attack back. A DNS sinkhole or black hole DNS is often used to slow down the attacker as part of active defense deception to spoof DNS servers to prevent the resolving of host names of specified URLs. This can be accomplished by configuring the DNS forwarder to return a false IP address to a specific URL. It can be used against attackers to slow them down in a HoneyNet deployment and then possibly perform more advanced active defense. DNS sinkhole can also be used to prevent access to malicious URLs at an enterprise on behalf of internal users. Here we can see a diagram of a DNS sinkhole. The attacker sends malicious email over the internet. The enterprise computer gets the email with the malicious site link. It makes a query to DNS servers. However, traffic gets routed to the IDS sinkhole server instead. In this lesson, we're going to explore wireless security, starting with the de facto standard for pretty much the last 15 years, Wi-Fi Protected Access 2, or WPA2, which was a replacement for the temporary WPA in 2004. Wireless devices require testing and certification from the Wi-Fi Alliance to be WPA2 compliant starting in 2006. WPA2 supports personal pre-shared key mode and enterprise mode that uses 802.1x. WPA2 also introduced stronger encryption using counter mode, cipher block chaining, message authentication code protocol. WPA2 has two modes, WPA2 personal or pre-shared key, with this mode, a shared secret key is a static key used to add challenge and response during the access point and client association. It's manually configured on devices and the access point. It provides local access controls, and AES is used for encryption. This replaced WPA's TKIP protocol. The other mode is WPA2 Enterprise. This provides central authentication server through RADIUS. AES is used for encryption, and we use RADIUS for authentication and key distribution. Popular modes are EAP TLS and EAP TTLS. EAP FAST, which is a Cisco proprietary replacement for LEAP, and protected EAP, popular in Microsoft environments. CCMP encryption is used with WPA2. It's part of the IEEE 802.11i standard. It was designed as the replacement for WEP and any interim solution, such as TKIP, and it uses AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. It provides strong message encryption and uses a 48-bit initialization vector and 128 or preferably 256-bit keys. And it provides authenticity and integrity checking with the CBC message authentication code. In this table, we can see some variants of 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11, 802.11
using 802.1x EAP. MD5 is deprecated, but most likely you'll be using Transport Layer Security TLS, which has mutual authentication using X509 V3 certificates, protected EAP, or EAP Fast. WPA3 is the newest standard, and all WPA3 networks use the latest security methods. They disallow outdated legacy protocols and require the use of protected management frames, PMF. PMF enhances privacy protections already in place for data frames with mechanisms to improve the resiliency of mission-critical networks. It also provides authenticated encryption, or an AEAD, using GCMP256. The key derivation and confirmation is done with a 384-bit HMAC with the secure hash algorithm, HMAC SHA-384. Key establishment and authentication is done with elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve DSA using 384-bit modulus. And it has robust management frame protection with the 256-bit broadcast multicast integrity protocol Galois message authentication code, or BIP GMAC 256. WPA3 Personal allows for natural password selection. It lets users choose their easy passwords that they can remember. They'll be strengthened using SAE. Personal's easier to use. It provides enhanced protections with no change to the way users connect to their networks. And it provides forward secrecy, protecting data traffic even if a password is compromised after the data was transmitted. WPA3 Personal uses Simultaneous Authentication of Equals, or SAE. This was originally implemented in 802.11s. You can still use password-based authentication, but it adds a password-authenticated key agreement process. WPA3 replaces pre-shared key with SAE, a more secure initial key exchange. Soon after WPA3 was released, a vulnerability was discovered by the same researcher who discovered the crack attack on WPA2. It's an exploit of the Dragonfly handshake protocol used by WPA3, and it's called Dragon Blood. If successful, an attacker within the range of a victim's network could recover the Wi Fi password and infiltrate the target network. It's actually a collective of five attacks one denial of service, two downgrade attacks, and two side channel information leak attacks. A newer technology that's part of the objectives of CISSP is LIFI or 802.11BB. It's a mobile wireless technology that uses light instead of the RS spectrum to transmit data. It's supported by a global consortium of companies driving a next generation of wireless to integrate into the 5G core. Li-Fi is simpler than wireless, and it uses direct modulation methods akin to those used in low-cost infrared devices, like remote control components. LED light bulbs have high intensities and therefore can achieve very large data rates. On the right-hand side, we see the Li-Fi enabled LED light and it is an uplink and downlink to the mobile device, which has the transmitter and receiver, in this case, a mobile phone. Zigbee is IEEE 802.15.4-2011. This is a PAN, or personal area network technology. Zigbee components can connect and communicate using the same IoT language. Millions of Zigbee products are already deployed in smart homes, and commercial buildings. The Neber topology is referred to as a self-forming and self-healing mesh. Zigbee ranges are up to 300 meters or more with line of sight and up to 75 to 100 meters indoors. And Zigbee supports AES-128 at the network layer and at the application layer. In this lesson, we want to talk about cellular networking and satellites. Cellular is used in hotels, airports, and other commercial scenarios and can gather credentials or 
registration profiles before users can access a public Wi-Fi from their cellular device. This can be a security vulnerability. 5G is the next generation of global networking for cellular and Wi-Fi. All 5G devices in a cell are linked to the internet and telephone network by radio waves through a local antenna in the cell. The goal of 5G is to deliver bandwidths up to 10 gigabit per second by using higher frequency radio waves than current cellular networks. Cell phone and other devices should be part of Enterprise Mobility Management, EMM, a combination of mobility device management and mobility access and content management. And the EMM must work with vendors, various carriers, and end users for policy adherence. Mobility solutions, GPS, and unnumbered IoT devices, even electrical grids and other power suppliers, commonly rely on satellites for operational continuity. Uplinks and downlinks are often sent through open telecom network security protocols that can be effortlessly accessed by attackers. Satellite ground stations are principally vulnerable to threat actors. All military grade satellite communications are subject to all Commercial Solutions for Classified CSFC requirements, including dual tunnel encryption and other packages. Network security infrastructure authenticates communications at every phase of data transmission that gets sent to the earthbound devices before it goes to the satellite. It's extremely important that your access control mechanisms are at a high maturity level to provide integrity and authenticity in your network infrastructure when using satellite. Trusted computing technology can be helpful. It can ensure trustworthiness of devices, device identity, and security validity using cryptographic keys at the processor and the firmware level. In addition, geofencing and geotagging can be facilitated by satellite technology. In this lesson, we'll explore Content Distribution Network, CDN, also known as Content Delivery Networks. This relates back to the edge computing concept that we talked about in an earlier lesson in an earlier course. A CDN is a highly distributed platform of servers that reduces delays in loading web page content and getting delivery of streaming content like video and audio. It reduces the physical distance between the server and the users around the world. Without a CDN, origin servers would have to respond to every end user request, resulting in substantial traffic to the origin and the subsequent load. By responding to end user requests using modern edge computing and elastic caching, for example, in memory storage of Redis, the CDN offloads traffic from content servers to metropolitan edge locations. Akamai and Cloudflare are two large CDN providers. Amazon Web Services also has their CDN service called CloudFront. It securely delivers data, videos, applications, and APIs to customers at Metro Edge computing locations with low latency, high transfer speeds, and within a developer-friendly environment. CloudFront is often integrated with AWS Redis ElastiCache at global provider partner locations and various service endpoints. CloudFront functions seamlessly with their Route 53 DNS service, their S3 object storage or blob storage, their elastic load balancing, specifically application elastic load balancing, their virtualized machine images, EC2 instances, their web application firewall, and the AWS Shield service for advanced DDoS protection. As far as security goes, high-level data center physical security is always in place. In addition, CloudFront uses TLS version 1.1 and version 1.2 protocols for all HTTPS connections between CloudFront and the custom origin web server. Cypher suites use the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral protocol on all connections. And the private content feature 
actually controls who, if anyone, can download content from CloudFront, not just based on the IP address or prefix, but also based on the geographic location and other factors. The Origin Access Identity feature can control access to the original copies of objects. So, for example, if somebody who's an administrator wants to go through the CloudFront distribution to get access to the backend S3 objects, they can be allowed to do this remotely using Origin Access Identities. In this lesson, we're going to focus on endpoint security and endpoint protection, and it really has to begin with the acceptable use policies, the most important aspect of the written security policy. Endpoint security must begin with security awareness of the employee and possibly the contractor or temporary worker. An AUP is a document specifying constraints and practices that a user must agree to for access to a corporate network or the internet. In other words, the usage of any corporate asset. It's often divided into different sections based on various categories of access. There should always be an enforcement mechanism in place to support the policy. Now that we've established the importance of the AUP to endpoint security, let's look at endpoint physical security. Obviously, we want to have ways to lock computers and laptop docking stations. We want to use screen savers with strong passwords, disable unused ports and peripherals on workstations and laptops, enforce the removable device AUP. Can employees bring USB fobs and firewire drives in and out of the facility? And use multi factor authentication if possible and with biometrics if feasible. Also, Implement a clean desk policy. At the end of the day, have everything removed from the desk. Provide locking cabinets and closets for your employees. Or secure briefcases and other carrying bags. Remove and disconnect devices at the end of the day. And protect all printers, fax machines, and MFDs, multifunction devices as well. And don't forget that no piggybacking and no tailgating policy. End users will have a varying degree of participation in the hardware, firmware, and software update and upgrade process. It depends on your organization. If fully automated, the user may only be able to postpone or snooze the process for a certain amount of time. This would be operating system updates and upgrades, using Windows Update Service, Silverlight, or CASE. Personal security suites are especially important for teleworkers and remote employees. These are all-in-one, full-scale security packages that offer a single integrated solution. A major advantage is there's only one vendor to get the upgrades and the updates from, hopefully digitally signed. Depending upon the security vendor, the suite may also include a two-way firewall, parental control systems, a local spam filter, a VPN to protect your data in transit, online backup to the cloud, and dedicated ransomware protection. A best practice, however, is to install two products from two different vendors on the endpoint. For example, the provisioned laptop. On my device, I have Sophos and Malwarebytes. When it comes to endpoint security, without a doubt, email is the prime vector. The attacker sends an email with a malware attachment, possibly a phishing email, where the poorly trained and unaware user opens the attachment, the target system is exploited, and a remote access trojan or rat is installed on the target system. That rat is used to gain access to that system and additional systems on the local area network. Often a remote access channel or covert channel is sent back to the attacker and data is stolen from the compromised machine. Other malware like keyloggers and webcam malware can also be used to exfiltrate data to the attacker in a stealthy manner. When securing email and webmail, use rotating passwords that can be remembered with a mnemonic. For example, four random words separated by a dash or a dot. For example, Texmex World Glove Listen. 
Implement strong malware scanners and spam filters. Never reply to the spam or click any unsubscribe links, as this will only confirm to the spammer that your email address is real. In addition, the unsubscribe link could send the end user to a website with drive-by malware. With security awareness and training, help your end users to get expertise in recognizing phishing emails. Realize that corporate and business email compromise BEC is on the rise. These will be targeting the whales in your organization, possibly trying to get them to do wire transfers or cyber currency transfers. So conduct awareness programs and, if possible, use two-tier or multi-factor authentication when logging on to any system that's processing email and webmail. Before opening an attachment, make certain that you know who it's from and that you're expecting it. Consider confirming with an SMS text or a phone call. Only send personal information over email when absolutely necessary, and preferably through a VPN. And avoid using email over free Wi-Fi, for example, in airport hotspots, hotels, and other retail outlets like restaurants and bars. Personal cloud storage has also been a traditional vulnerability. They can have backdoor malware. They can do PDF exploits. Personal cloud storage can have macros. They can do JavaScript exploits. There can be malware for Linux and Windows. And personal cloud storage can contribute to data leakage and data loss in your organization. Early on, we used host-based IDS solutions. One of the challenges was that the vendor of the HIDS was always behind the manufacturer, the vendor of the operating system. For example, Cisco, always having their HIDS solution being behind Microsoft. So endpoint detection and response came around and gave us a lighter software agent installed on the host that was easier to update and provided the basis for event monitoring and reporting. EDR tools primarily focus on detecting and investigating suspicious activities. We call these indicators of compromise, IOCs, on the hosts and the endpoints. EDR tools monitor endpoint and network events and send information to Steam systems or a centralized database or management station for further analysis, investigation, and reporting. Key EDR features would be filtering reducing the alert fatigue and lowering the possibility for real threats to slip through unnoticed. Advanced threat blocking, preventing threats the moment they are detected and throughout the life cycle of the kill chain of the attack, possibly using a cloud-based solution. Incident response capabilities, threat hunting, and incident response can help prevent full-blown database breaches. Multiple threat protection, cloud-based visibility, into many finding categories, for example, cryptojacking and botnets. Next generation endpoint protection involves partnering with a managed security service provider or a cloud access security provider. Introducing advanced antivirus with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Managed threat hunting and honey tokens. Cloud-based threat intelligence and User Behavioral Analytics, UBA, and IT Hygiene Engines. Most next-generation IPS and antivirus systems use heuristic engines and machine learning algorithms to achieve better results than traditional signature-based and anomaly-based solutions. Heuristic engines used by an anti-malware IPS program might include proactive rules, and behavioral analytics to look for a program that tries to copy itself and do other programs like a classic virus or a program that tries to remain resident in memory after it's finished executing. Traditionally, organizations would use Cisco's NAC, Network Admission Control. Later, Microsoft came up with their own solution called NAP. Cisco NAC and similar technologies are officially on the exam but they've been replaced by newer solutions, such as TrustSec and Zero Trust Security. NAC was part of the Cisco Self-Defending Network Initiative and is the foundation for security 
on layer two and layer three. Basically, do not trust anything inside or outside the perimeter without stringent authentication, identification, and verification. Endpoint protection in NAC helps secure access from users and their devices, the API calls that are made, IoT and microservices, containers, and more. Traditional NAC would involve change of authorization. So if an individual introduced their laptop into the environment, for example, using 802.1x, they could be sent to a remediation server to either install or update their antivirus or anti-malware. They could use advanced identity services engines and integrate with directory services like Active Directory. Today, we use cloud-based EDR more often than not with a managed security service provider like Fortinet or Cisco or Palo Alto Networks, where the users are authenticated and authorized and identified with on-site services that connect to the cloud to get protection for zero-day threats and new variants of DDoS attacks and botnets and remote access trojans. Obvious one of the key aspects of protecting data in transit with endpoints is using VPN technology. In the next lesson, we'll look at IPsec and transport layer security. In this lesson, we'll do a brief overview of the different mechanisms and architectures used to protect data in transit with virtual private networking, starting with IPsec, IP security for version 4 and version 6 of IP offers security services to traffic crossing untrusted networks like the internet or between two or more trusted devices or networks in an enterprise. IPsec VPNs can also be used to protect management traffic as it crosses an organization's intranet and between front-end and back-end services. For example, a front-end SharePoint service and a back-end SQL database. IPsec is also popular when connecting to cloud service providers using managed site-to-site -site and peer-to-site -site VPN solutions. IPsec is native to the IPv6 stack through the authentication header and encapsulating security payload extension headers. Those are the two main protocols, by the way, of IPsec, AH and ESP. Here we see a headquarters with a VPN gateway this VPN gateway supports IPsec, and it can connect to a cloud service provider, which has a virtual private gateway, a device at a remote office or a branch office, a device at a small office home office, or some agent running on a mobile worker's device. It could even be using a clientless IPsec remote access solution, which is a supported browser. IPsec and SSL TLS VPNs are both cryptographically based VPNs. In terms of deployment, there are two basic types of VPNs, site-to-site -site and remote access VPNs. And a remote access VPN can be full tunnel, which is basically full IP access, or clientless, using a supported browser in what we've called historically web VPN. IPsec operates in tunnel mode between two devices, or transport mode between two endpoints or in a client-server relationship. The two main protocols are authentication header, AH which provides integrity in origin authentication, and ESP which also gives us confidentiality or privacy. Also, IPsec provides five essential security functions. Confidentiality, typically using AES-128 or 256, Data integrity, usually with SHA-2 or the SHA-3 family. Origin authentication, using pre-shared keys or RSA or ECDSA signatures. Anti-replay protection. And key management, using Ike version 1 or Ike version 2 and or Diffie-Hellman key exchange and elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman ephemeral. Let's use site-to-site -site VPN between two different peers in a tunnel mode. If that's the case, there needs to be one matching security suite or profile between them. This is negotiated early on in Ike version 1 phase 1 or early on in the Ike version 2 process. 
They have to agree on the protocol. Is it ESP and or AH? What are they going to use for confidentiality? Most likely AES. What about data integrity? Most likely SHA-2. What about origin authentication? Are they going to use pre-shared keys or digital certificates? And how will the key management be performed? And if they're using Diffie-Hellman, what group will they use? There has to be at least one matching suite on both sides. SSL TLS is the most ubiquitous certificate-based peer authentication in use on the Internet. When we see HTTPS, we want to think SSL TLS, specifically TLS, Transport Layer Security, which is standardized by the IETF. In most scenarios, you'll be using TLS 1.1 or 1.2, even though 1.3 is the most recent published version. We also use TLS with the SMTP protocol between message transfer agents, LDAP can use LDAP-S, and POP3 can use POP3-S. The only mandatory cipher suite of TLS includes RSA for authentication, AES for confidentiality, and SHA for integrity and digital signatures. Here's the process of a TLS VPN tunnel. Realize, by the way, that TLS uses two important protocols, the record protocol and the handshake protocol. By default, TLS uses TCP, so the user makes a connection to TCP port 443. The server response contains the server's public key in the form of a certificate. In step three, the user's software verifies the signature on the certificate and validates the authenticity of the public key. In step four, the user's software creates a shared secret key or a session key. In step five, the shared session key is encrypted with the public key of the server and is sent to the server. In step six, bulk encryption occurs using the shared secret session key with a symmetric encryption algorithm. Notice that TLS uses hybrid cryptography, a combination of symmetric session keys and public and private key pairs. Some best practices for TLS is to prevent downgrade attacks from web clients. In other words, a TLS server should not downgrade to SSL. Use HTTP Strict Transport Security, HSTS. This will force the browser to use TLS. Use the most recent security suites. In other words, no RC4 or DES or triple DES. Do not let vendor installed code intercept your TLS traffic. Verify the encryption process. Perform OCSP stapling from browsers to enforce certificate expirations. Implement certificate pinning to trusted CAs only. Let's talk about cloud service providers' elastic load balancers. These load balancers can do more than just load balance across different instances or containers or IP addresses or APIs. They can do network or application load balancing. The load balancer actually represents the virtual network to the public. So when somebody types in www.whatever.com, they're very likely hitting an elastic load balancer at a cloud service provider. If not, it's a CDN or a content distribution network. Load balancers can perform health checks on the instances that they're connecting to. As a matter of fact, the instances are often in auto-scaling groups so the front-end web servers can scale up and scale back or provision and deprovision as needed. They can produce flow logs that can be used for threat management and optimization and active defense. They'll run the TLS listener. They'll take the encrypted traffic and then decrypt it so that they can have a web ACL look at that traffic for SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and other vulnerabilities. And this can be combined with layer three and four firewalls. In this course, Communication and Network Security, you learned about secure protocols, detective and preventive controls, micro-segmentation and content distribution networking, CDN, wireless and cellular networking, and secure communication channels. In the next course, you'll learn about change, configuration, and patch management, vulnerability assessment and management, 
at Incident Handling and Response Management. We're going to begin this course looking at some security principles that are part of the security operations domain objectives, starting with the comparison between need to know and least privilege, which are similar but not exactly the same. With need to know, which by the way originated in a military and intelligence operations type of organization, pertains to data access and data information flow. Need to know can be implemented using different access control models, although Mandatory Access Control, or MAC, is the most secure. Lattice models are quite effective, for example, the bell la Padula model for confidentiality, or BIBA, or Clark Wilson, for integrity. Least privilege can, of course, relate to data, but it's broader. Basically, with least privilege, subjects are only given access to the objects they need and nothing else unless they go through or they pass a strict approval process. Least privilege can be implemented using different access control models, although MAC is the most secure. We can also use network operating system controls, for example, Kerberos or ABAC, attribute-based access control, for different scenarios. This is often applied to network security, where you have restrictive policy to control access to where users get access to systems or a zero trust environment where everything is denied by default and they're only given explicit access. With need to know and least privilege, in both of these scenarios it's very important that unauthorized elevation or escalation of privileges is not accomplished. Next we have the concept of separation of duties. This is a process where more than one entity is required to complete a particular task. So as we see here, one of our most common is to have one entity or group perform backups where another entity or a group does the restoration process, but the backup operators cannot do restore and the restore operators cannot do backups. This can be automated as well. Separation of duties often also involves dual operator principles as well, where two subjects are needed to modify a particular object. This is an important principle because it obviously eliminates the single point of failure or single point of control so that one entity can't do illegal activities or have total control over an application or system without other subjects being involved. Automation and orchestration can also help enforce the separation of duties principle. Closely aligned to separation of duties is rotation of duties, where you'll rotate different individuals with a different role or responsibility over a course of months or every year, for example, forced or mandatory vacations, where the employee is gone for two weeks or more, and then another employee comes in for that period of time and assumes their role and responsibility. You can also perform auditing or other types of compliance testing while that employee is away. Mediated access is another principle that involves avoiding direct client-to-server access whenever feasible. It involves using various proxies for authentication, either an interactive proxy where the network access device provides some type of captive portal or web page or login screen, or it could be transparent. It could be translation services for network address translation and port address translation. Mediated access could be using bastion hosts or jump boxes or other semi or managed services at cloud service providers for mediated access. Web proxies for content and URL filtering using managed security service providers, MSSPs, and cloud access security brokers, CASPI, to help with single sign-on and other activities. Mediated access can also relate to databases where you only access views and never the raw data that's in storage. And then finally on the exam, they want you to be able to compare service level agreements and organizational level agreements. An SLA defines the precise responsibilities of the service provider and it sets customer expectations as well. It'll clarify the support system, for example, technical support, service desk response to problems, or outages for an agreed level of service for example, 5 or 10 gigabit per second Ethernet. It should be used with new third-party vendors or cloud providers. 
in a software as a service, infrastructure as a service, or platform as a service environment. It often defines 24 hour support. Think of a service level agreement as a contract with an external party. The organizational level agreement documents the pertinent information for regulating the relationship between internal service recipients and an internal IT area. For example, in an enterprise, the service desk as the service provider and the business units or organizational units or departments as the customers. The difference is that the service provider is promising the customer or the SLA versus what the functional IT groups promise with the organizational level agreement. An OLA will often correspond to the structure of a service level agreement, but there'll be a few specific differences because it's based on an internal relationship of the enterprise. A common question that comes up, especially when I'm doing training for, let's say, ITIL, ITIL 3 or ITIL 4, is really what's the fundamental difference between configuration management and change management? And the simple answer is configuration management comes first. You have to have a baseline configuration before you can manage changes. The goal of configuration management is to ensure that accurate and meaningful information is readily available regarding the configuration of applications, systems, and services, along with the configuration items, or the CIs, that support them. Configuration management also includes understanding all of the relationships and the dependencies between the configuration items. Historically, we could use protocols and systems like Simple Network Management Protocol, version 2C, for example, to help accomplish this. Objects include hardware, software, networks, various sites, including vendors and suppliers and people. Configuration management, or CM, is a governance and systems lifecycle process for ensuring consistency among all assets, tangible and intangible, and we call these assets configuration items, elements and components found in an operational environment. CM classifies and tracks individual CIs. It documents functional capabilities and interdependencies. It verifies the effect of a change to one configuration item on other systems or users or applications. Configuration management can be accomplished using directory services tools, importing various diagrams and topologies, for example, from sites like LucidChart the establishment and maintenance of inventory baselines and asset management, and it involves consistent and accurate naming and tagging schemas, tagging of physical objects, and the usage of logical tags, for example, key value pairs at a cloud service provider like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform. At the heart of configuration management, is the Configuration Management Database, the CMDB. Your Configuration Management System is a set of data, tools, utilities, and processes that are used to support configuration management. But the system itself needs to have an underlying storage mechanism for the configuration information. As mentioned, all the information should be consistently tagged and labeled with some common unified schema, preferably using key value pairs. This data will populate the database system, known as the CMDB. Historically, we've used relational databases, for example, like Microsoft SQL or MySQL. However, we're seeing a movement towards using key value pairs. Therefore, NoSQL or document databases are emerging as a more common solution. We can also leverage a cloud service provider, for example, we could use Amazon Web Services DynamoDB, a NoSQL database used by hundreds of thousands of customers all over the world. In the next lesson, we'll talk about change management. Change management comes after configuration management, and it's also called the change control practice. The goal of change management is to maximize the amount of successful service and product changes or modifications. You want to make certain that risks have been adequately assessed, authorized, and managed 
along with a change schedule. Change management is often supported by project managers, and it operates with the configuration database, or the CMDB, to track all possible dependencies and to better understand the repercussions of changes. It involves a change log or a change database. Another key principle of change management is the ability to roll back or fall back to a previous state. There's three major types of changes. First, we have standard changes. These are low-risk changes. Standard changes are pre-authorized and well-documented processes. They can be automated, and they often are. A standard change will be supported by a service request that doesn't need additional authorization. For example, an end user changing their password in Active Directory every 45 to 60 days. A normal change is a change that follows a specific process for scheduling, assessment, and authorization. They are lower risk, but they do go through an approval process. For example, a standard change to a laptop may be implemented using KACE or CASE, where the firmware or operating system update is performed automatically. Perhaps the end user can snooze and put off that update for an hour or so, but it's automated and doesn't demand additional authorization. However, if that same employee is going to be provisioned a new laptop, for example, every 48 months, where they'll remove their personal data, send the laptop back to the headquarters, and be sent a new replacement laptop, that would be a normal change. Still a lower risk, but it goes through an approval process. And as mentioned, it could be onboarding a new iPhone or a new laptop or installing an application. An emergency change is a change that must be implemented immediately. For example, if that employee's laptop was damaged in an electrical thunderstorm, this is often the result of problem management or after action reporting of incident management or even disaster recovery planning. Emergency changes may involve escalation or even an emergency advisory board if the amount of resources or disruption is significant. Here we see a change management life cycle. We're going to go through each one of these one at a time. But I want you to notice the iterative process that happens between phase one and phase two. In phase two, the decision to approve the submitted change may go through several cycles or several iterations before that approval actually happens. In fact, you could also draw another arrow from the testing phase back to submitting an approval, because during the testing phase, you may discover things that you didn't realize about that build or buy application early on in the life cycle. Preferably, the iteration doesn't occur in the fifth phase or implementing. We need excellent documentation at phase three and testing at phase four to prevent having to have iterative processes going from phase five back to phase one and phase two. So in phase one, submitting or submission, the proposed change is analyzed and validated. If necessary, the submitter may be required to provide more information before it's approved, or you may have to escalate the change to a higher authority, for example, to get sign-off from executive management. In the approving phase, or approval, the proposed change request should first be delivered to the individual or group responsible for change management in the organization. And this may be a workflow process where some individuals are part of the approval process, possibly two or more people, but others are being notified. So approval often uses a RACI or a RACI chart, R-A-C-I, to include who's responsible, who's going to approve the change, who's consulted, and I, who's informed. In the third phase, documentation, or documenting, after the approval, the change needs to be inputted into a change log or configuration management database, CMDB. Now, it's important to realize that documentation should occur at all phases, but this phase is specifically inputting into a change log or a CMDB, and it must be updated regularly as each change progresses through the various phases.
Step four is very important. Before implementing the change, there may need to be a formal testing and verification process. There may be regulations or certifications to be considered. And this allows for modifications to be made if any issues arise. For example, in the previous diagram, it's not uncommon to go back from the testing phase to the submission or submitting phase. And there could also be a determination if any other processes are affected by the change during the testing. For example, interdependencies and relationships. Also in the testing phase, you need to build in a rollback or a fallback methodology. Implementation or implementing. After the change is tested and approved, it can be deployed based on a schedule that's been predetermined. The schedule needs to document the projected phases of the change and define the milestones for the change process. As mentioned earlier, project management personnel may be involved in change management. Then the final phase is reporting. After the change has been implemented, a full report should be submitted to management. If there are any negative consequences to implementing the change, this should trigger an iterative move to an earlier phase of the life cycle or trigger problem management looking for the root cause of the negative consequence. In the next lesson, we'll look at patch management. In this lesson, we're going to look at patch management. And according to the Center for Internet Security, CIS, this is one of the top vulnerabilities for most enterprises. It's a critical control. Many organizations do not consider or continually improve their patch management plan. Vulnerability assessments, exposure reviews, and gap analysis are not being performed or done properly using established best practices and baselines. A Configuration Management Database, CMDB, of all configuration items, CIs, should be maintained in order to support patch management. Only certain personnel should have the authority to test, apply, and determine the urgency of patching activities. And agreements with any applicable vendors should also be made to address any potential issues before deploying patches. There's many components to a proper patch management implementation. Obviously, establishing a baseline, using patches to harden your systems, continual collection and evaluation of data, testing, including having rollback and fallback plans. All of these things done before you actually roll out the patch. And then, of course, continual improvement and ongoing maintenance. Here's an example patch management lifecycle. First, we're going to develop an inventory and patch management plan, an up-to-date inventory of all of your production systems, all of the different operating system builds and versions, your IP addressing, your physical locations of devices, uh, who are the custodians, who are the stewards, and what is their function. And those commercial tools, ranging from just general scanners to automated discovery products that we can use. In phase two, we'll perform assessment of the existing controls and configurations. This goes back to establishing the baseline. Make a list of all the security controls that are in place. Router security, secure routers, firewalls, secure layer two and layer three switches, IPS sensors, antivirus, anti-malware, endpoint protection, along with all of their configurations. Step three, conduct a gap analysis against the inventory and control lists. Compare the reported vulnerabilities against your inventory or your control list. You can rely upon SIEM systems, NetFlow collectors, and other cloud-based collection services to perform this gap analysis. What we then have is the residual risk in our patch management implementation. So assess and classify the risk based on your quantitative and qualitative methods and how you're handling or treating the risk. And of course, step five, apply the patch. You know what you need to install. However, you must deploy them without disruption or a hit to production. So the patch could have been tested in a sandbox environment or a private cloud or a threat modeling detonation chamber before it's rolled out into production. And it can be done manually or automated, but obviously there needs to be a fallback 
or a rollback mechanism in place. Now, we talked about different tools that we can use, seam systems, other visibility tools to help us with our patch management. We're going to dig deeper into some of those tools in the upcoming lesson when we look at syslog, seam systems, and SOAR systems. Once again, this course is called Systems Operations. To have successful change management, configuration management, patch management, and other IT service management initiatives, we have to have visibility, monitoring, and logging. And traditionally, we've used syslog. Syslog's a standard. It's a well-established system logging protocol defined in RFC 5424, but there are a lot of different vendor-specific variants of syslog. It typically sends system informational messages or event messages to a designated syslog server or, more often than not today, a SIEM, System Information, System Event Management System, SIEM. It's predominantly used to gather various device logs from different systems in a centralized fashion for monitoring, visibility, and analysis. And syslog traditionally uses UDP port 514 for its traps, or it can be reliable and use TCP 1468. There are eight different severity log codes, starting from zero with the most severe, up to seven, which is the least severe and the most noisy, and that is debug. It probably wouldn't hurt to make sure you memorize these. Some very popular levels to set up your logs would be level four and level five. For example, level five is going to give you authentication information. Now realize if you are sending traps to a syslog server, for example, or to a console, and you decide to log at a certain level, it's going to take everything at that level down. So if you are at the level five notice or notification level or level four warning level, it'll be all the way from four down to zero. Often you see level seven messages filtered out uh, or certain level seven messages because it's just very noisy and just too much overhead. All types of devices will send syslog messages. You can get them from workstations. You can get them from applications. For example, you know, email application servers and others. You can get syslog messages from firewalls, routers, appliances, IDS and IPS sensors. And they can go to a syslog server, which, by the way, should be highly available. It may be a physical server. It may be running in a hypervisor and be virtual machines. But you want to have a cluster of servers so there's no single point of failure. And like I said, you may be sending syslog messages to other more modern centralized services like Seam, for example. And that's where security information and security event management comes in. The term SIEM is a combination of information and event management, the same two categories that we have in syslog, by the way. It centralizes the storage and monitoring and analysis of logs and other security-related documentation to perform near-time analysis. You can send filtered data to data mining or data lakes for BigQuery and data warehousing servers in your data center or maybe to a cloud service provider. Seam systems allow security and other professionals to take countermeasures, to perform rapid defensive actions, and to enhance incident handling. Here we can see a wide variety of services that Seam systems may perform. The Seam system can be a centralized set of tools. It can be running in hypervisors. It can be running in the cloud. Uh, for example, Microsoft Azure has a cloud-based Seam service. And they don't necessarily do all of these activities, but for the most part, they can do all of these activities. For example, collecting and aggregating and analyzing logs performing correlation and deduplication and normalization of the data. They can provide forensic information. They can support your compliance, your regulations. You can log systems and services and applications as well. You can even audit access to objects. For example, files on a 
block storage file system or an object storage file system. You can automate real-time alerting, and those alerts can be sent to other systems. For example, they can run functions in the cloud, let's say through AWS Lambda. They can monitor user activity, and they can support user behavioral analytics. When you send that information up to a cloud where machine learning and AI tools can be used, Seam can help you synchronize your time as they function with NTP servers. They can help generate reports either themselves or they can use the data from the Seam system and use languages like Python or the R programming language and create your own robust visibility reports. They can do file integrity monitoring, system and device log monitoring, and they can also store or retain logs, or they can work with databases or other object storage. We also have security automation versus orchestration. Automation for security basically involves generating a single task to run automatically without any human intervention. Automation could involve sending alerts to a SIEM system, dynamically triggering a serverless function at a cloud provider like Azure Functions, or adding a record to a database when a batch job is run. Enterprises often automate both cloud-based and on-premises tasks. Automating deployments can also be accomplished using infrastructure as code, for example, Terraform or AWS CloudFormation. Orchestration involves managing several or many automated tasks or processes. As opposed to focusing on a single task or a single process, orchestration combines and manages all the individual tasks over a life cycle or a workflow. Orchestration occurs with various technologies, applications, containers. For example, Kubernetes provides container orchestration, data sets, middleware, systems, and more. SOAR stands for Security Orchestration automation and response, and it's an assortment of software services and tools. SOAR allows organizations to simplify and aggregate security operations in three main areas, threat and vulnerability management, incident response, and security operations automation. Security automation involves performing security-related tasks without the need for human intervention. SOAR can be defensive detection, response, and remediation, or offensive vulnerability assessment and penetration testing. SOAR can be used in active defense. And you should automate if the process is routine, monotonous, and or time intensive. Another reason why syslog, seam, SOAR systems, and others are important is that we're going to use the output from those systems as part of our vulnerability assessment and vulnerability management. And that's what we're going to look at in the next lesson. Vulnerability assessment and management. Remember, you have to define what vulnerability is before you can start doing any assessment, any analysis, any management. Vulnerability should be quantified as a percentage of probability and not just some vague laundry list of scary things that can happen. The likelihood that a threat agent's actions will result in a loss involves frequency and magnitude, or probability and impact. Vulnerability can be a derived value from threat capability of actors combined with the resistance or difficulty of your existing security controls, and it should be scenario-based and over a certain time period. All assets and asset classes must first be valued, prioritized, categorized, classified, and labeled accurately before you can assess your vulnerability. You may need to recognize who has the role of asset manager. You may also have a digital asset manager. You want to use all available tools and proven methodologies, including inventory systems and various logs, SIEM systems, SOAR systems, syslog, as well as network operating system server, system applications and security logs, and output from firewalls and IPS sensors, SNMP traps or informs, NetFlow collection, 
next generation IPS alerts and logs, and cloud based visibility tools operating at the cloud provider or on premises as well, and leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence data analysis on premises and in the cloud. To conduct proper vulnerability assessment and management, you have to rely upon expert judgment. The internal SMEs, subject matter experts, your risk register or risk ledger, and your lessons learned database, any historical documentation and case studies, compliance experts, external expert judgment, for example, third party consultants, or your insurance providers, and legal expertise. There's a wide variety of sources for vulnerability intelligence. Emerging sources would be AIS, Automated Indicator Sharing. This is a U.S. Department of Homeland Security DHS system for data sharing about cyber observables with the goal of maximizing the near real-time distribution of all relevant and actionable cyber threat indicators among the private sector and federal agencies for network defense. Taxi. Trusted Automated Exchange of Indicator Information. This is a free and open source transport mechanism that standardizes the automated exchange of cyber threat information. Both push and pull messages are supported, supporting both subscription feeds and on-demand queries. Taxi leverages existing protocols when possible with native support for HTTP and Transport Layer Security, or HTTPS. There's also sticks. Structured Threat Information Expression. This is a structured language developed by MITRE for a collaborative way to represent cyber threat intelligence and observable data. There's also predictive analysis tools and threat maps. These are generated by AI-driven and machine learning analysis tools, often working with cloud service providers or managed security service providers, MSSPs. You can also get vulnerability intel using open source intelligence, or OSINT. This is any data or information concerning an individual or organization that can be collected legally from free public sources. OSINT is usually information found on the internet, but it can be sourced from books or reports in a public library, articles in a newspaper or magazine, statements in a press release, and FOIA, Freedom of Information Act reporting. It can be gathered using tools like Baltigo, sharing centers, and code repositories like GitHub, among others. Here's a nice list of other research sources for vulnerability. Vendors' websites, for example, Symantec and Kaspersky. Conferences, requests for comments. Social media like Twitter. TTP, Adversary Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures. Emerging social media tools, vulnerability feeds and RSS feeds, for example, from SANS.org. Academic journals, local industry groups like Cisco and Palo Alto Networks. Threat feeds, OSINT tools, and word of mouth based on expert judgment. The CVE, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, is a list of entities from MITRE.org that represent publicly known cybersecurity vulnerabilities. It consists of an ID number, a description, and public references. It's also used by the National Vulnerability Database, or NVD. There's also the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, CVSS. This is an open standard for weighing the severity of computer system vulnerabilities. It uses a uniform and consistent scoring method from 0 to 10, 10 being the highest severity. You can also perform active or passive vulnerability scanning. This is the process of using tools to identify known and unknown weaknesses in systems, application, services, and even policies. Vulnerability scanning is an easier and often more focused process for looking for unpatched systems, misconfigurations, and of course, open ports. It's typically automated and done on a routine basis, for example, every week or on a quarterly basis, taking at most a few hours. HTTP and HTTPS is the most common traffic by far that is scanned for vulnerabilities, and web application vulnerability scanners like Burp Suite and OWASP ZAP are very popular. 
You're looking for cross-site scripting and its variants, cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, LDAP and command injection, path traversal attacks, and insecure server configuration, to name a few. Protocol analyzers can be used to capture and analyze network traffic between two or more systems. Traffic can then be filtered and decoded to visualize the processes that are occurring. These can be used to find network bottlenecks for troubleshooting, but they can also be used to analyze malware behavior. Advanced analyzers also generate statistics for trend analysis and network optimization. And crackers can use them to gather information or even clear text usernames and passwords, among other things. All of these tools can be used for good or for bad purposes. There's also exploitation frameworks. These are exploitation kits used by penetration testers and crackers to find vulnerabilities in various attack vectors. They often specialize in certain components like router exploit kits, browser kits, and kits for embedded devices or specializing in PowerShell weaknesses. EKs are often open source initiatives with broad cooperation from white, gray, and black hat hackers. EKs can be used to prioritize vulnerabilities and threats in your enterprise when used by white hat crackers. Common kits would be Rig EK and Rig V EK, Grand Soft, and Green Flash Sundown, to name a few. You may also do scanning for compliance. Carrying out a compliance audit is different from performing a vulnerability scan, although there will be some overlap. A compliance audit decides if a system is configured in agreement with a recognized baseline or governance security policy. Sometimes compliance involves auditing more sensitive data and systems, and there are many diverse forms of financial and government compliance requirements. Typically, the compliance requirements are minimal baselines that can be taken differently depending upon the goals of the organization. Compliance requirements must be in line with business goals to ensure that risks are correctly recognized and alleviated. In other words, we can't just rely upon compliance. Security audits may be for compliance or to measure maturity against a model like CMM, Capability Maturity Model. They can be internal or external. They can be done in-house or a third party. They'll involve vulnerability assessment, optionally penetration testing. There'll be log reviews. There'll be synthetic transactions. These are active audits of financial systems or commercial websites or banking sites, brokerage services, or cyber currency exchanges. There'll be code review and testing for application security, testing misuse of code, coverage analysis, testing interfaces, even doing account management, including management review and approval. You're looking for key performance and key risk indicators, backup verification data, proper training and awareness programs, and disaster recovery and business continuity plans. Penetration testing will often involve vulnerability assessment. However, they're two different things. A pen test is a more elaborate test, a more elaborate assessment, where you're simulating real-world attacks to identify methods for evading the security features of an application, system, or network. Pen testing often involves launching real attacks on real systems and data using various attack tools and techniques. It can also be useful for determining how well the system tolerates real-world style attack patterns, the likely level of sophistication that an attacker needs to successfully compromise a system or a service. It can determine additional countermeasures necessary that you would need to mitigate threats against various systems and the defender's abilities, or the blue team, to detect attacks and respond. Often, pen testing has a life cycle. First, the initial rules of engagement or agreement. You'll set the scope of the test. You may negotiate the cost with a third party. Is there a bug bounty involved? Step two is reconnaissance and initial engagement. Then, escalation of privileges first laterally and then horizontally, then lateral movement and pivoting off of various infrastructure devices, and finally, persistence. Making sure that the malware can survive a reboot 
it can go undetected, or if detected, it can morph by encrypting itself or compressing itself. Threat hunting is often done by pen testers. These are called hunt teams. Threat hunting involves groups of cyber investigators aggressively seeking out threats on a network or system. They're often compliance or regulatory auditors, or maybe from insurance companies. They attempt to quickly recognize anomalies and discover historic patterns in data and IOCs to counter cyber criminals and mitigate threats. A threat hunt could also be a red team versus a blue team exercise. You may also do threat modeling. This involves creating an abstraction of a system, for example, in a private cloud or a sandbox or detonation chamber, to identify risk and probable threats. When cyber threat modeling is applied to systems being developed, it can later lower vulnerabilities and risk. With the widespread adoption of threat intelligence technologies, most enterprises are trying to adopt a threat-focused approach to risk management. Threat modeling provides visibility, increased security awareness, and prioritization and understanding of your existing security posture. And of course, the results will be reports. Your vulnerability and assessment reports should have as much information as necessary but not be a data overload. You may need to express in simpler terms or have different reports for different target audiences. Dashboards can be very effective, for example, using the R programming language. You want to understand the successful components of visual communications. In other words, avoid three-dimensional representations. Use a palette of sequential colors. Avoid basic pie charts. Instead, use scatter plots, bars, and bubble charts. Avoid histograms for density plots and box plots. In this lesson, we're going to look at incident response and incident response teams. These are the steps taken when a negative event disrupts normal operations. We call this an incident or a negative occurrence. The primary goal of incident response is to reduce the immediate impact of the threat actor or the threat agent. Every organization that has a maturity level that's considered high should have documented incident types and category definitions, and these should be based on risk assessments, risk registers or ledgers, and mature business impact analysis, part of business continuity planning. In other words, your organization should know what to expect to a high degree. You also want to know the roles and responsibilities of the first responders. These are the people that get the initial alerts, the phone call, the email, the text message. And again, their goal is to rapidly assess the impact or magnitude of the incident and to reduce the immediate negative consequences. They may have further responsibilities in the incident response life cycle, but as a first responder, those are their main tasks. And of course, reporting their activities and the escalation processes. Do they elevate this to a higher authority, to law enforcement, to a blue team, to a security team or a third party? They should possess or collect contact lists of all stakeholders, maybe have information for public relations, legal, HR, and other parties. And the best practice is to have pre-performed exercises for incident response, drills, and, if possible, parallel simulations. On the exam, you want to be aware of the incident response life cycle. The first phase is preparation. This involves all information gathering, knowing the mission of the IRT, your charter, your project initiation tasks. You want to get buy-in and funding from executive management, the C-suite, the C-team, to know the scope of the response plan. You want to establish IRTs, incident response teams. Determine the roles and responsibilities of internal employees or dedicated incident response teams. You'll establish the first responders in the preparation phase and documented processes for communication to all relevant stakeholders. In preparation, you may conduct exercises and drills depending upon your budget. At the very least, you should do tabletop and walkthrough exercises. The next phase is detection. This is also referred to as identification. The bottom line here is you're separating an event from an incident or a breach immediately. Remember, not all events are negative consequences or incidents. 
So, you'll use predefined metrics and your experience to determine is this an incident or is it just an event? You want to make sure that you've got categorization and prioritization in place so that you can establish the severity of this particular incident. And hopefully, that's already in a risk register or a risk ledger. If not, that'll be part of your reporting. Data gathered will be when did it occur? How are you alerted? Who made the discovery? What is the scope of the impact or magnitude? And does it qualify for escalation or disaster recovery processes? Optionally, can you quickly identify the root cause? Now remember, that's not the main goal of incident response. However, if you can identify the root cause quickly without expending much resources, that's excellent. However, if you cannot quickly and easily identify the root cause, you must go on to the next phase and come back to this later during a problem management initiative. After detection or identification comes response. The main goal is containment of the outbreak or the malware exploit or the data leakage. You want to implement short-term processes, for example, disconnecting devices from the network. Leverage your firewalls, your next-generation IPS sensors, machine learning algorithms, and optionally, if you have the skill set, forensic tools with the goal of maintaining separation, containment, and segregation. Remember, we want to reduce immediate impact. And you might want to evaluate backups and snapshots for future recovery. The next phase is closely related. This is mitigation. It's also called eradication. It's often integrated with the previous phase, containment or response, as opposed to being a separate action. But mitigation or countermeasures involve determining the root cause of the incident and applying immediate remedies if available. It also involves removing all indicators of compromise, any action, artifacts, remnants, or fingerprints associated with the attack kill chain. Next, we have recovery. This is the process of restoring negatively affected data, applications, systems, and devices to a pre-established baseline of performance, or if possible, to the original state. However, that's not the primary goal of recovery. It's to get back to a state of acceptable operations based on business continuity planning and business impact analysis. Remember, this often involves only remediation to a certain operational point and not necessarily total recovery to a previous untouched state. During the recovery process, it's vital to establish that you're not in danger of another incident or an ongoing breach or a continuation of a distributed denial of service or botnet attack. Recovery may often involve business impact analysis metrics and indicators such as RTO, RPO, and MTTR. Remediation is technically more elaborate than recovery. It involves a remedy that puts the application or system into a state before the incident occurred. Remediation may take hours or weeks, depending upon the fact that the incident may rise to the state of a disaster or a catastrophe and business continuity is actually occurring. Keep in mind, however, that recovery and remediation are often combined into the same phase or stage of incident response. Next, we have reporting. Reports should be generated from physical, digital, and or audio notes taken throughout the entire process or life cycle. Final reports should be concise and comprehensive. They must be generated with different audiences in mind. For example, your security team may get a different report than your C-suite or the board of directors. You want to use newer, robust graphical representation, perhaps using Python and R programming tools. Make sure you include recommendations to prevent future incidents and take problem management and finding the root cause into consideration in your report. The final phase is based on your reporting. It's lessons learned. This is the knowledge gained from the process of conducting the program. Sessions are usually held at the response closeout. The goal of lessons learned is to share and use knowledge derived from the experience. You want to endorse the recurrence of positive outcomes 
prevent the recurrence of negative outcomes, and try to avoid blame storming. Although, after an incident, based on the severity, someone may be ultimately held accountable. If expected, due care and due diligence were not performed. On the exam, as an incident responder, you may need to be aware of a cyber kill chain. This is a potential process that the attacker will go through. This is from a well-known manufacturer of military equipment. In the seven steps, first you have reconnaissance or recon, information gathering, then weaponization, that's the attack vector and payload. Third is the delivery of that payload. Fourth is the exploitation of the system, the application or service. Once you exploit the weakness, you install the malware. Then you introduce command and control, which is communicating back to a command and control server through a reverse session or as part of a DDoS or botnet attack. And then exfiltration of that system and other systems in the same VLAN and, if possible, other VLANs. In this lesson, we're going to explore forensic investigations. But the first question we want to answer is, why perform forensics? Well, laws may have been violated. Your organizational policies have been violated. Systems have been attacked. Data and identity have been breached. Intellectual property has been exfiltrated. Privileged insiders are suspected of various crimes. And forensics may be a next phase of incident response. Closely related to forensics is e-discovery. And the focus of this certification is on cyber forensics and electronic discovery, not crime scene investigation forensics. For example, dusting for fingerprints, even though that may be part of your job. We're talking about innovative technologies that have emerged to lower the risks and costs associated with dealing with big data and valuable intellectual property, especially as it relates to litigation and internal corporate or governmental investigations. The e-discovery process has four phases. First, identifying and collecting electronic documentation, sorting through data by relevance, creating production sets, and data management, and all four of these phases under the umbrella of a case. There is a forensics life cycle, or a case life cycle. First is identification of the crime, then collection of evidence, followed by examination of the evidence data, then analysis of the real evidence. It's important to realize that at this point, the data becomes information. Information is what we analyze. And then finally, we report on the findings of the analysis. Let's take a look at these steps one at a time. Identification involves detecting the incident, of course, but that's under the umbrella of incident response and incident response management. What we're assuming here is this is a negative occurrence or an incident that needs forensics. So we have to identify and classify. Forensics may not occur until later in the incident response life cycle, for example, during the remediation process or even the reporting process as you prepare for a legal case or a law enforcement case. The notification can come from a personal complaint by phone or text, a monitoring system alarm or alert, the result of an audit, or an IDS or IPS or EDR sensor alarm, or notification from some trusted or anonymous source. If you're a third-party forensic team, you'll be notified by the organization when they contact you to use your services. Next is collection. This is where order of volatility comes in and setting your priority. You need to be aware of the most volatile data, which is what you're going to collect first. Anything on the CPU that is in volatile storage, like a cache or the CPU register content. Next, you'll move to the routing table the ARP cache, the process table, and kernel statistics of the operating system. Third is RAM memory. The fourth most volatile would be the temporary file system or swap space on a hard drive. Then data on the hard disk, hard disk drive or solid state drive. Six, remotely logged data. Seventh, data on archival media. 
for example, optical disks or tape drives. You'll also be using forensic toolkits. For example, if you go to Guidance Software and check out NCASE, you'll see a wide variety of tools. These will be using write blockers, gathering information without leaving any fingerprint behind. Common utilities you'll use during the collection phase, besides the write blocking toolkits, are TCP Dump and DD, NBT Stat and NetStat, NetCat, MemCopy, T Sharp, and Foremost. Also in the collection phase, you must be aware of the importance of maintaining the chain of custody. You'll be using imaging technologies to create copies of disk drives and volumes and memory dumps. You'll do hard disk drive bit level copies and sector by sector. This will include deleted files, slack spaces, and unallocated clusters, as well as encrypted files. You'll take digital pictures and possibly do interviews. You want to provide a history of the handling of the evidence to maintain integrity, provide accountability, prohibit tampering, and provide assurance through the entire life cycle. For example, you'll have chain of custody documentation. This should be input into a software program, for example, on the Forensic Investigators Management System, but you should also have physical copies of this. It may be a sticker on the outside of the box or the sealed envelope. Collection also involves media management. You should have a software inventory system for configuration items and a category for components removed for the purposes of investigation and forensics. All collected media must be classified and labeled. You want to have secure storage facilities with dual operator principles, locked rooms, locked cabinets, safes, and off-site storage facilities. Next is examination. This is where the data begins and eventually becomes information to be analyzed. But examination involves finding the relevant data, sorting it out, filtering it out. You want to use tested techniques to validate the data or filter out different users. If you're doing an investigation of a particular user on a shared system, you'll simply filter their SID and not other users. You'll use pattern matching techniques and tracing. You look for hidden data, and you'll have tools for extracting just the data you need to be analyzed in the next phase. And that's analysis. Here's where you're going to take data and turn it into information and knowledge. You're building a solid forensic case, operating on the relevant data, the facts and artifacts from the collection and examination phases. You may determine at this phase that more work should have been done in earlier steps. If more information is needed, then iterate back to the collection and examination phases. This is where you answer the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the investigation. Infer motive, opportunity, and means of the potential suspect. It's a combination of an art and a science that can actually take years to master. And don't forget to rely on the expert judgment of others, members of your team, and skill sets that exist at the organization. The final phase is reporting. You must communicate your results effectively. You'll be tracking people hours and expenses in the case software, of course. You'll provide electronic and physical documentation of all findings, and having physical backup will always be helpful. You'll meet with the proper authorities and possibly prepare to offer expert testimony as part of your reports. You'll provide any necessary clarification. A main goal of reporting should be to identify overall impact on business and recommend any changes or improvements or countermeasures. And all this information is important for a possible court date or other proceedings and meetings with law enforcement. In this course, on security operations, you learned about security principles, configuration change and patch management, logging and information gathering, vulnerability assessment and management, and incident response and forensic investigation. In the next course, 
We'll look at business continuity planning and impact analysis, backup and restore processes and redundancy, and disaster recovery planning and testing. The first thing we're going to talk about in this course is the business impact analysis. And what the BIA really does is it takes into consideration practically everything that you've learned so far in this training if you've taken each one of these courses in sequence. It takes into consideration different controls, the risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, cryptographic solutions, security governance, the list goes on and on. It is the risk assessment aspect of the more global business continuity plan or BCP. With BIA, you identify critical functions to the business. You prioritize them based on need for survival or criticality. And this is going to be something that's going to be mathematical, quantitative more than qualitative. You're going to gather meaningful metrics and meaningful indicators. You'll identify the risks associated with the critical functions you have in place, as well as the probability of the risk occurring or the likelihood and the impact that the risk will have or magnitude. The BIA will also help you identify how to eliminate or reduce the risk and contribute to risk management. There are some key terms to be aware of on the exam for BIA. The first is the recovery time objective, or RTO. This is the target amount of time within which a process must be restored after disruption. So think about a, a key critical process like your corporate email or your corporate SharePoint implementation. How many minutes or hours can the email be down? The RPO is a recovery point objective. This is the maximum targeted period in which an asset or data may be lost from an IT service due to a major event. So think of the maximum period of time you must get your system back up due to a ransomware attack. Hardware is subject to MTTR mean time to repair. This is the average time needed to repair a failed system or a modular component. Mean time between failures, MTBF, is the number of failures per million hours for a product. You might get this information from the vendor or the manufacturer of your solid state drive, for example. Also related to recovery time objective is the maximum tolerable downtime, or MTD. This is the absolute maximum amount of time that a resource, service, or function can be unavailable before you start to experience a significant loss. These are just some of the meaningful metrics that go into your business impact analysis. Let's talk more about the recovery time objective, the RTO. This is the amount of time available to recover the resource, service, and function, let's say our SharePoint services. Now notice, this must be equal to or less than the maximum tolerable downtime, the MTD value. Any RTO solutions must be accomplished within this time frame, or it's considered a loss. Solutions could be adding physical security, adding redundancy or high availability, purchasing insurance, investing in backup generators, investing in faster supply chains, or safeguarding your media at an off-site location. The recovery point objective is a point in time, not an amount of time. It's the point in time relative to a disaster where the recovery process begins. In IT systems, it is often the point in time when the last successful backup was performed or snapshot before the disruptive event occurred. Questions we'll ask are how much work can be lost if a disruption occurs? What impact will it have? And how do we make sure we don't lose more than X amount of information? MTBF is a measurement of how reliable a hardware system or component is. For most devices, the measure is in thousands or tens of thousands of hours between failures. For example, a solid state drive may have a mean time between failures of 10 years. The mean time to repair is basically how long does it take to repair or to get a spare part. It measures the time to fix or replace, and the average value is predicted based on experience and documentation. The formula is often expressed as the total downtime divided by the number of breakdowns. Realize that challenges to your supply chain can vastly affect the mean time to repair, 
especially when the repair necessitates the replacement of a part or a component. Remember, business impact analysis encompasses a large amount of analytical tools and risk management, and it's the primary and most important part of the business continuity plan, which we'll talk more about in the next lesson. Business Continuity Planning, or BCP, involves the preparation of all activities and procedures that are deployed to avert the loss of critical business functions and services for a predetermined acceptable amount of time. For government agencies and other non-commercial entities, the term Continuity of Operations, COOP, is often used instead. However, on the exam, you want to know this as BCP, Business Continuity Planning. In the previous lesson, we learned that the most important and vital aspect, the primary aspect of the BCP, is business impact analysis. The other two components of BCP are backup and restore policies and our disaster recovery plan, or DRP. We'll look at these two components in their own lessons coming up. Some organizations, with their continuity of operations, will include the IRT piece, or the Incident Response Team. So part of business continuity planning may be having their own on-site or on-premises swarm IRT or dedicated Incident Response Team. However, smaller to medium-sized organizations most likely do not have a dedicated IRT and will not include that in continuity of operations but as part of their incident response IT service management. When we talk about business continuity, we want to look at the types of catastrophes and disasters that can cause major disruptions to our continuity. They can be environmental disasters, earthquakes, wildfires, floods, snow or avalanche, tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, landslides, and meteors or asteroids. Then we have man-made intentional disasters, arson, terrorism, active shooting, political and narco-terrorism, break-ins and theft, intentional damage, destruction of files, and data exposure or information disclosure. And then man-made unintentional could be a simple mistake, forgetting to follow the AUP, a power outage, illness and epidemics, accidental information disclosure or accidental damage to a system, file destruction due to an error, or insecure coding techniques. All of these things are considered in our qualitative and quantitative risk analysis and risk assessment. The most likely scenarios will be addressed in the business continuity plan. For example, if you live in a part of the world where it never snows, you aren't going to worry about an avalanche. This is an excellent resource from the United States Ready.gov, which is delivered by the DHS, Department of Homeland Security. And this is business continuity planning from their point of view with four different areas. I highly recommend that you come back and spend some time going through this and memorizing this as much as possible for your exam. Notice the first area is what we talked about in the previous lesson, BIA, Business Impact Analysis. Obviously, you're going to rely upon existing risk assessment, risk management, and vulnerability assessments. But as part of the official process of BIA, You'll further develop some questionnaires, possibly using the Delphi method. You'll conduct workshops to focus on business functions and get input from process managers and stakeholders on how to complete your official BIA. You'll receive these forms, so you'll review these forms and conduct follow-up interviews and follow-up surveys and workshops to validate information and fill in the gaps. From the BIA and expertise of expert judgment, you'll have your recovery strategies. Here you'll identify and document resource requirements based on the BIAs. You'll conduct gap analysis, and you'll figure out the residual risk and gaps between recovery requirements and your current capabilities. You'll explore different recovery strategy and recovery site options. For example, cold site, warm site, hot site, or mirror site. You'll choose your recovery strategies with sign-on from management approval from the C-suite or C-team, and buy-in from all stakeholders. You'll then document your implementation strategies. 
That will lead to your plan deployment, where you actually develop the plan frameworks. You organize your recovery teams and your response teams. You develop the relocation plans. You'll document business continuity processes and the IT disaster recovery processes. You'll document manual workarounds. You'll assemble plans using software tools, infrastructure as code tools, floor plans, topological maps, and deliver your final business continuity plan. Once you do, you'll get validation and approval from management and other stakeholders. And of course, you're going to have testing and exercises of your plan. Develop the tests, the exercises, understand your maintenance requirements, conduct training for business continuity teams and incident response teams, conduct orientation exercises for new employees, document your test results, and then update your BCP to incorporate the lessons learned from your various tests, drills, scenarios, and exercises. This will be one of the longer lessons in this course as we explore redundancy, availability, and resiliency. Passive redundancy uses additional capacity to reduce the impact of component failures. You can do active passive failover where both devices are powered up, but only one is actively processing or forwarding packets, for example. The other one is in a standby mode. You can also have hot spares as a form of passive redundancy. Snapshots, which can be stored in object storage at a cloud provider, can also be a form of passive redundancy. Active redundancy eliminates performance problems by having simultaneous capacity and use. For example, active active failover, where two routers or firewalls are processing packets simultaneously. Or for site resiliency, a hot site, a mirrored site, or a parallel site. A key system that's used to achieve resiliency and redundancy is RAID, Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Let's start with RAID 0. With RAID 0, the data is split up into blocks. The blocks are written across all of the array drives. For example, two arrays. RAID 0 uses at least two disks at a time, and it offers fast read and write speeds. However, it's not redundant. There's no fault tolerance. RAID 0 just simply is a performance enhancer. Improving client server services and storage area networking services. RAID level 1 is referred to as mirroring. This is also a configuration of at least two drives that contain the exact same data. If one drive fails, the other will still function. RAID 1 offers high read performance, as data can be read off of any of the drives in the array. And since data needs to be written to all the drives in the array, the write speed is slower than a RAID 0 array. A very popular solution is RAID Level 5. RAID Level 5 requires at least three drives. Data is striped across multiple drives like RAID 0, but it also has parity data distributed across the drives. This parity data allows for recoverability in the event of a drive failure. The data is restored by using the parity information that's stored across the other drives. The read times are very fast, but the write speed is slower due to the calculation of the parity information. The most popular RAID 5 configurations will use four drives, which lowers the lost storage space to 25%. However, RAID 5 can work with up to 16 drives, and you may see that in a large data center or a cloud service provider data center. RAID Level 6 is similar to RAID 5, but the parity data is written to two drives, so it requires at least four drives. The solution can survive two drives failing simultaneously. The read speeds are just as fast as RAID 5, but the write speeds are slower than RAID 5 due to the additional parity data that must be calculated. RAID Level 10 is a combination of mirroring and striping. It consists of a minimum of four drives and combines the advantages of RAID 0 and RAID 1 into a single system. It offers security by mirroring all data on secondary drives while using striping across each set of drives to speed up data transfers. In other words, the speed of RAID 0 or striping with the redundancy of RAID 1 mirroring. You can lose any one single drive and feasibly 
even a second drive without losing any data. Compared to a large RAID 5 or RAID 6 array, RAID 10 is an expensive way to have redundancy for fast databases, file servers, and application servers. In this table, we can compare RAID 0, 1, 5, 6, and 10. You can see the minimum number of drives for RAID 6 and RAID 10 is 4. RAID 0 offers no fault tolerance. Read performance is high with RAID 0 and RAID 10. And write performance is high with RAID 0. You can also see the capacity utilization with RAID 0 having the highest capacity and RAID 5 being the next with 67 to 94 percent. Make sure you familiarize yourself with this table for the exam. Let's talk about backups. Realize that backup and restore policies are your main ransomware countermeasure. And a full backup backs up everything, regardless of the archive bit being set or not on the file or the directory. It clears the archive bit once the backup completes, however. It does take the longest to back up, and it depends upon how much must be backed up. It is the quickest to restore, only the most recent full backup is needed. Next, we have incremental backups. The incremental backups clear the archive bit once the backup is complete. It backs up any new file or any file that's been changed since the last full backup or the last incremental backup. Subsequent backups only store changes that were made since the previous full or incremental backup. The process of restoring lost data from an incremental backup is longer, but the backup process is much quicker. Incremental backups should not be performed manually if possible. In other words, use automated software solutions. With a differential backup, you do not clear the archive bit when the backup completes. It backs up any file that has the archive bit set. Any new file or any file that's changed since the last full backup, it's slow to backup but quick to restore. The last full backup and the most recent differential backup are needed for restoration. And again, like a incremental backup, it's not recommended to perform a differential backup manually. Snapshots are easier and faster backups and restores, and they're often combined with full backups. It's an immediate point in time virtual copy of the source. It should be replicated to another media or to cloud storage, for example, Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage to be considered as a backup. The time to backup does not increase with the amount of data. Snapshots improve your RTO and RPO metrics, and the restores are faster, and less data is lost with an outage. And realize that snapshots are performed on block storage, for example, hard disk drives and solid state drives, but snapshots are also made of entire disk images and machine images. Here's an interesting comparison of storage media. For example, the traditional hard disk was invented in 1956. You get from gigabytes to terabyte capacity, you get lifespans of up to 10 years. At the bottom, our solid state drives have a lifespan of 10 years or more. CD, CD-ROM, and DVDs can last from 25 to 50 years. Your backup and restore policy and media replication and disaster recovery must take into consideration these comparisons of storage media. At cloud service providers, there's two types of storage, block storage and object storage. At AWS, you have hard disk drives and you have solid state drives. From the previous table, solid state drives are preferred, plus they're much faster. Notice that your instances represent instantiations of Windows, Linux, or Mac OS operating systems and your instances can be using elastic block storage, which can mount and unmount from the instance. In other words, if you stop or terminate the instance, you don't lose the block storage. But there's also what's called ephemeral storage. For example, instance A is using ephemeral 0, 1, 2, and 3. That's directly attached storage. If you stop or terminate the instance, you lose the data on the ephemeral storage. That's excellent for temporary logs, temporary files, and calculation files. On the left-hand side, AWS also offers Amazon Elastic File System, which can store petabytes of data for Linux instances. Also, your Elastic Block Store will generate snapshots, 
which are stored in Amazon S3 object buckets. And you can easily recreate an elastic block store, whether it be hard disk or solid state, from a snapshot. S3 also has object storage. In fact, all cloud providers offer these solutions. With object storage, you're going to get four nines of availability, 99.99. .99. By default, the objects stored in buckets will be spread across three availability zones in a region. AWS also offers 11 nines of durability, which is 99 point followed by nine nines. Microsoft Azure offers 15 nines of durability. With different storage plans, you can either have a single zone storage, which will be cheaper, or infrequent access, which will be cheaper. You can even have it done for you with intelligent tiering. And then of course, you have your deep storage, which would be Glacier or Deep Archive. Whether it be block storage or object storage, on site or in the cloud, you will have some type of data lifecycle and data management, which will tie into your redundancy and resiliency and disaster recovery. We'll talk about disaster recovery planning in the next lesson. Disaster recovery planning, or DRP, is the third main component of business continuity planning. DRP ensures that you can help the organization recover to an acceptable level, a pre-accepted level, from any type or form of catastrophic event. A cataclysmic event can be a single drive ransomware attack to an entire facility or campus being put out of action. The disaster recovery plan should contain detailed steps for recovering from any kind of data loss or physical disaster. The DRP has step-by-step -step instructions on how to recover each aspect of critical systems, application, services, and data. Services include personnel services as well. Although backup and restore is a separate component of the BCP, the DRP should have a summary of the plans and the order of restoration. You should have contact information for all key stakeholders, all partners, and vendors. You want contact information for law enforcement, for legal, insurance companies, and media outlets. The plan should also have the order of succession and command structure of your organization and who will assume roles and responsibilities if a particular person is no longer available. It should have the physical location of hot spares and backups, software and CD keys, licensing information, security access keys and fail-safe passwords, and all other valuables. In addition, your site resiliency locations and full descriptions, cold sites, warm sites, hot sites, or cloud service providers. When developing the DRP, you should go through a life cycle. Obviously, the initial phase is a result of incident response. In other words, you have escalated the incident or the negative occurrence to the category of disaster or catastrophe. Sometimes this will be obvious. However, other times this will be a cascading process. In other words, it doesn't begin as a catastrophe, but the result is catastrophic. And the second phase is your response. This is a key aspect of the DRP. Then, techniques for mitigation and recovery. Recovery to a point that ties back to business impact analysis and business continuity. Remediation is going back to a point before the disaster happened. Then we have reporting, and from reporting we get our lessons learned. This is an excellent resource you should use as part of your studies. This is a disaster recovery site strategy. In this table, we have three strategies. A commercial hot site, an internal hot site, and a warm site. Notice the different recovery times. For example, an internal hot site is 1 to 12 hours with the best recovery time. Disadvantages being most expensive and ongoing communication costs are high with the internal site. Also look at comments. Next we have mobile site, which is moderately priced, and the recovery time is typically 24 to 48 hours and typically involves some type of trailer or recreational vehicle. For the exam, the cold site has the longest recovery time. All the equipment must be ordered, delivered, installed, and made operational. This is the worst solution 
for supporting your ongoing operations. There's also a reciprocal agreement, which may be difficult and is really only feasible if the other partner is tens of miles away. And then recently, we see more cloud recovery being used. For example, Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud Platform as a hybrid cloud solution for disaster recovery. Before the exam, sit down and take the time to read through these two slides and digest them fully. This is a very short lesson as we talk about one of the objectives of this domain area, and that is personal safety and security concerns. One of the things to realize is that in large organizations, the individuals, the people, may or may not be the most valuable asset. Now, most large organizations will have a separate department or a third-party vendor that handles all employee and contractor arrangements, such as travel arrangements. So that may be part of your personal safety. How does the HR and legal department handle a situation where, let's say, one of your employees loses their life while they're traveling, doing business activities? An individual could lose their life in an auto accident, for example, or an airplane accident. A company may have a fleet of autos or trucks for corporate use. They may be assigned to employees on a permanent or as-needed basis. Disaster recovery when it comes to personal safety and security must be addressed in security training and awareness programs. In addition, HR may have to offer emergency management. They may have to do this in combination with legal, maybe a third-party counseling or grief counseling, maybe personal duress assistance. And so disaster recovery can also apply to individuals who have, let's say, drug abuse problems or other addictions, and they can be managed through programs that are offered by the organization. And these are things that are often overlooked when we think about business continuity and disaster recovery. In the final lesson of this course, we're going to look at various tests for your disaster recovery plans. Realize, however, that these tests can also be applied to business continuity, they can be applied to incident response testing, physical controls testing, and other initiatives in your organization. The first is a read-through test, and this is very common for any type of scenario. It's a read-through or a plan review, where the business continuity plan owner and the continuity team basically sits down and discusses the business continuity plan and the components, business impact, backup and restore, and the disaster recovery plan. You're going to look for missing elements and inconsistencies by doing a gap analysis and by relying upon subject matter expertise. It's often a kind of checklist where you go through individual best practices or previous experiences. It can also be used to train new members of a team and provide security awareness and training. This is the most basic and fundamental of the recovery plan tests. Next, we have tabletop testing. This goes a little bit further than checklists and discussions. The participants gather in a room, a conference room, some other facility to basically discuss the execution of documented plan activities, hopefully in a stress-free environment. This may be done on a scenario-by-scenario -scenario basis, but it often involves more than just a checklist. You'll have blueprints, topological diagrams, computer-based modeling to effectively demonstrate whether the team members know their duties and the processes and procedures to go through whenever there's an emergency. You'll also do gap analysis to find new areas for training and new areas to offer solutions to meet your needs of business continuity. You're going to document errors. You look for missing information. You look for inconsistencies across the different plans. But this is more effective because you're going beyond just a checklist or a discussion, you're actually using other tools and techniques. A walkthrough test is a planned rehearsal of a possible incident, for example, an active shooter or a fire, to evaluate the organization's capability to manage that incident. A walkthrough test also provides an opportunity to improve either the department or the building or the business unit's future responses and then enhance the relevant 
competencies of those involved. The walkthrough is often done on a limited basis or by scheduling each department or building separately for those different types of drills and exercises. For many organizations, small to medium-sized businesses, this is the most elaborate disaster recovery test that is conducted. Anything beyond this can often be time, resource, and financially cost prohibitive. Simulation testing is going to a next level to determine if the business continuity management procedures and resources work in a realistic situation, a simulation exercise is desirable. You'll often see this with government agencies and military. It may be the most elaborate test that most large entities ever conduct. You're going to simulate established business continuity resources, such as the warm or hot recovery site, the restoration from backup equipment, your services from recovery vendors, transportation, a near comprehensive drill or exercise. Simulation testing can also require sending teams to alternate sites to restart the technology as well as bring up other business functions. Parallel testing is similar, but it involves bringing the recovery site to a state of operational readiness. However, you're maintaining operations still at the primary site. Staff will be relocated, backup tapes are transferred to the warm site, for example. Operational readiness is established in accordance with the disaster recovery plan while operations at an acceptable level are maintained at the primary site. A parallel test is often done at non-peak hours or even after business hours. And this may be the most comprehensive test that entities ever conduct. Full interruption testing is where the operations are completely shut down at the primary site to fully emulate the disaster. The enterprise transfers to the recovery site in full accordance with the disaster recovery plan and business continuity planning or continuity of operations. It's a very thorough test, which is also very expensive and it may be cost prohibitive for most organizations. Realize one of the downsides is it has the capacity to cause a major disruption of operation if the test fails and you're unable to restore some systems. The result of our tests is lessons learned. There'll be an after action report or an AAR and lessons learned is a section of the AAR. This is the knowledge gained from the process of conducting the program, the project, or the task or initiative. Formal sessions is usually held at the project or test closeout or near the completion of the initiative. For example, the simulation test or the walkthrough. Lessons learned, however, can be recognized and documented at any point during the life cycle in order to share and use knowledge derived from an experience, endorse the recurrence of positive outcomes, and prevent the recurrence of negative outcomes. Often, one of the conclusions of lessons learned is that you need to go from a walkthrough test to more elaborate simulation or parallel test. In this course, on business continuity planning, you learned about business impact analysis, BIA, one of the early phases of business continuity planning. You explored all the aspects of BCP, looked at redundancy concepts, backups and restoration, and disaster recovery planning and testing. In the next course, you'll learn about security assessment and testing, collecting security process data, and security auditing. If we put security assessment in the context of risk management, remember our goal is to determine what our residual risk is. We begin with the inherent risk, and what we have left over after we've implemented controls is residual risk. And of course, security testing determines if the residual risk is acceptable based on our risk handling or risk treatment. And the most common method is gap analysis. A gap is the difference between the implemented existing controls and the predetermined control objectives. Gap analysis is the outcome of corporate security strategy and governance. Gap analysis is also the foundation for the fundamental information security initiative action plans and programs. And current countermeasures and mitigation should be established according to the organization's risk appetite 
for each asset class, in other words, risk handling or risk treatment. Gap analysis should be conducted in a reusable and repeatable manner to assess and report on the efficacy of executed controls, administrative, technical, and physical. And the focus will be on established metrics, such as key performance indicators, KPIs, and KGIs, as well as risk indicators, KRIs. And gap analysis is useful for security assessment and auditing. A very important and emerging methodology for security assessment and testing is threat modeling. Threat modeling can also be referred to in some circumstances as prototyping. For example, creating an abstraction of a system to identify risk and probable threats. For example, deploying in a private cloud or a sandbox or detonation chamber. You can begin with all entry points to a system, a service, or application. We typically don't use threat modeling on physical controls. However, they're quite common for technical controls of systems, applications, and services. With the widespread adoption of threat intelligence technologies driven by machine learning and artificial intelligence, most enterprises are trying to adopt a threat-focused approach to risk management. Threat modeling can provide visibility, increase security awareness and prioritization, and a better understanding of your security posture and the effectiveness of your existing controls and the need for newer controls. For example, in addition to being a requirement for Department of Defense acquisition, cyber threat modeling is very important to federal programs, including DHS, Homeland Security, and NASA. Let's talk next about several popular threat and vulnerability models. First, we'll begin with OCTAV, Operationally Critical Threat Asset and Vulnerability Evaluation. OCTAV is a practice-based methodology. It's one of the first created specifically for cybersecurity threat modeling. OCTAV is focused on assessing organizational or non-technical risks that may result from breach data assets, which are identified as data sets that have attributes or characteristics based on the type of data stored. For example, object data, or relational data, or transactional data, or logs. The intent of OCTAV is to remove mistakes regarding the scope of a threat model and reduce excessive documentation for assets that are either poorly defined or outside the purview of a project or a program. It provides a vigorous, asset-centric view, although non-technical, as well as organizational risk awareness. But the documentation can get overwhelming, as Octave lacks scalability. However, it's a highly customizable method and most useful when creating a risk-aware, non-technical corporate culture. Next, we have Trike, which is acceptable risk-focused. It's a unique, open-source modeling process focused on sustaining the security auditing process from a cyber risk management perspective. It's a risk-based approach with a distinctive implementation and risk modeling process. Trike is based on the requirements model that helps ensure the assigned level of risk for each asset is satisfactory to the various stakeholders. Satisfactory meaning acceptable risk. Security engineers will create a data flow diagram, a DFD, containing data stores, processes, data flows, and interactors. You can find these templates at sites such as lucidchart.com, for example. Data flow diagrams and trust boundaries illustrate data flow in an implementation model and the actions users can perform within a system state. PASTA is attacker-focused threat modeling. It's the process for attack simulation and threat analysis, a relatively new application threat modeling approach. It offers a seven-step platform-independent process for risk analysis. The goal of PASTA is to align business objectives with technical requirements while considering business impact analysis and compliance requirements. It combines an attacker-centric perspective on potential threats 
with asset-centric risk and impact analysis. POSTA works best for organizations that need to align threat modeling with strategic objectives as it integrates business impact analysis as an integral part of the process and magnifies cybersecurity responsibilities beyond the IT department. Stride from Microsoft is developer focused. Stride stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information message disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. This Microsoft threat modeling methodology aligns with their trustworthy computing directive back from January 2002. The focus of Stride is to help ensure that Microsoft's Windows software developers think about security during the design phase. The goal is to get an application to meet the security properties of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, along with authentication, authorization, and non-repudiation. Once the security SME builds the DFD-based threat model, system engineers or other experts can check the application against the Stride Threat Model classification scheme. In this table, we can see our six categories of threats, and there's definitions, for example, repudiation, claiming not to do a particular action, or elevation of privilege, the ability to perform an unauthorized action. You can see the security property that aligns with it. For example, spoofing is a breach of authentication, tampering, a breach of integrity, denial of service, a breach of availability, and elevation of privilege, a breach of authorization. And of course, in this table, we have several examples. For example, under repudiation, I have not sent that phishing email to high-level users as part of a spear phishing or whaling attack. Next, we have VAST, which is enterprise-focused. VAST stands for Visual, Agile, and Simple Threat Modeling. And it was developed after observing perceived limitations and implementation challenges intrinsic to the other threat modeling methodologies that have been mentioned so far. The founding principle is that in order to be effective, threat modeling must scale with the infrastructure and the entire DevOps portfolio. It must integrate effortlessly into an agile environment, agile development, and agile project management. It should provide actionable, accurate, and reliable results for developers, programmers, security teams, project managers, and senior executives. A fundamental difference is its practical approach in recognizing that security issues among development teams are often divergent from those of an infrastructure team. There are two main VAST models. First is the application threat model. Application threat models for development teams are generated with process flow diagrams, PFDs. PFDs map the structures and communications of an application, much like the way developers and architects consider applications during the SDLC lifecycle. Then there's the operational threat models. Operational threat models are meant for the infrastructure teams. Though more like traditional DFDs than application threat models, the data flow information is presented from an attacker perspective, not the perspective of a data packet moving on the network. By relying on process flow diagrams instead of data flow diagrams, vast models do not require extensive systems expertise. You may want to take some time and pause this training and compare these threat modeling methods. Notice we're covering Octave, Trike, Pasta, Microsoft Stride, and VAST. Our characteristics are implement application security design time, identify relevant mitigating controls, directly contributing to risk management, prioritizing threat mitigation efforts, encouraging collaboration among all stakeholders, outputs for stakeholders across the organization, consistent repeatability, automation of threat modeling processes, integrating into an agile DevOps environment, and the ability to scale across thousands of threat models. According to the folks at ThreatModeler.com, VAST checks off all the boxes, and second place would be Trike. 
In the previous lesson, we talked about the importance of using gap analysis and threat modeling methodologies. Now we're going to look at other security testing techniques and architectures, starting with SCA, Security Control Assessment. Security Control Assessment is a formal evaluation of a system against a predefined set of controls. A prime example would be using Center for Internet Security CIS Top 20, which we'll talk about later, or OWASP, OWASP Top 10 for Web Security, or IoT Security, or Embedded Device Security. SCA is performed with or independently of a full Security Test and Evaluation, STNE, which is carried out is part of an official security authorization or certification or accreditation. In other words, SCA is often conducted as part of an official process to be certified. SCA and ST&E will appraise the operational plan or plan implementation of controls. The results are a risk assessment report that represents a gap analysis, documenting the system, application, and or data risks. Tests conducted should include auditing, security reviews, vulnerability scanning, penetration testing, and more. There are some penetration testing frameworks to be aware of. As a CISSP candidate, there is SSAF, a framework provided by the Open Information Systems Security Group, OISSG, a not-for-profit organization based in London, UK. There's OSSTMM, an open source security testing created by ISCOM, the Institute for Security and Open Methodologies. There's the aforementioned OWASP, a popular methodology used widely by security professionals. OWASP is a nonprofit organization focused on advancing software security, specifically internet based. PTES is the penetration testing execution standard. This methodology was developed to cover the key parts of a pen test. And then, of course, NIST. The National Institute of Standards and Technology provides a manual that is best suited to improve the overall cybersecurity of an organization through testing such as pen testing and vulnerability testing. Some organizations will also include the NIST cybersecurity framework to make sure they have all their bases covered when it comes to security assessment and testing. NIST breaks this down into five areas, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. And you can see, for example, under the detect, which would be a great area for security assessment and testing, you can see we're detecting anomalies and events, doing security continuous monitoring, the intrusion detection process, an incident detection process, and of course, solid communications. There's also SOC 2. This is developed by the American Institute of CPAs, the AICPA, Certified Public Accountants. SOC 2 defines criteria for managing customer data based on five trust service principles, security, availability, processing integrity, confidentiality, and privacy. Unlike PCI DSS, which has very rigid requirements, a lot of organizations will use SOC 2 because the reports are unique for each organization and they're aligned with precise business practices, each with its own controls to comply with one or more of the principles. There are two types of SOC reports. Type 1 describes the vendor's systems and whether their design is appropriate to meet the applicable trust principles. Type 2 details the operational effectiveness of those systems. Next, we have the CIS, the Center for Internet Security. This version 7 framework lists 20 actionable cybersecurity requirements designed for improving the security standards of all organizations. Most companies use the security requirements as best practices or guidance. Since the CIS has a credible reputation, for developing baseline security programs and even downloadable baseline images. CIS version 7 stands out from the rest as it empowers organizations to create budget-friendly cybersecurity programs and better prioritize their cybersecurity efforts. It's an extremely popular initiative and organization 
that partners with the three big cloud service providers, Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, and Microsoft Azure. There's also the Cloud Security Alliance, or CSA. This is the world's leading organization dedicated to defining and raising awareness of best practices to help ensure a secure cloud computing environment. The CSA Cloud Controls Matrix, CCM, is a cybersecurity control framework for cloud computing. It's composed of 197 control objectives, and it's structured in 17 domains, covering all key aspects of cloud technology. And the CSA certifies auditors for the CSA STAR certification. CIS version 7 has implementation groups. Group 1 is for businesses and organizations with little or limited cybersecurity expertise or resources. Group 2 is for all organizations with moderate technical experience and resources in implementing the CIS controls. And Group 3 is for organizations with an immense or broad cybersecurity expertise and a large amount of resources, people, time, and finances. There's also NIST 800-53. This publication enables federal agencies to realize effective cybersecurity practices. It focuses on information security requirements designed to assist federal agencies in securing information and information systems. It offers government agencies the requirements to comply with FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act. NIST 800-53 contains more than 900 security requirements, making it among the most complicated frameworks for organizations to implement. Some recommendations include controls for enhancing physical security, penetration testing, guidelines for implementing security assessments, and authorization policies or procedures. COBIT stands for Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies. This helps organizations align their business's best features to its IT security, its security governance, and security management. ISACA developed and maintains this framework, which is useful for companies trying to simultaneously improve production quality while observing heightened security practices. For example, manufacturing firms or part of your supply chain. This helps organizations in meeting all stakeholders' cybersecurity expectations, the end-to-end -end procedure controls for the organization, and the need to develop a single, the integrated security framework. Next, we have IASME, Information Assurance for Small and Medium Enterprises, Consortium. This is a standard certification that includes free cybersecurity insurance for businesses operating within the United Kingdom. The IASME Governance Accreditation is similar to an ISO 27001 certification. Implementing and maintaining the standard comes with reduced costs, administrative overhead, and the complexities that you would find in ISO 27001. IASME Governance refers to cybersecurity standards designed to enable small and medium-sized enterprises to realize adequate information assurance. It outlines a criterion in which a business can be certified as having implemented the relevant cybersecurity measures. IASME enables companies to demonstrate to their customers their readiness to protect business or personal data. Regardless of the model or architecture that you use for security assessment and testing, your goal is continual improvement. In this diagram, we see a model overlay. At the center is PDCA, the four-phase plan, do, check, and act model. And then we have the life cycle of raw data. First, we begin with raw data. At that phase, we're identifying the strategy for improvement. That data is going to lead to our vision, our business need, our strategy, and our tactical and operational goals. That information gathering of raw data will help us define what we're going to measure. And of course, we gather the data, the who, the how, the when, the criteria. We maintain integrity. We begin to decide what we're going to measure. That raw data then becomes information, where we process the data. That processed information, going through various tools and systems, 
will eventually become knowledge, where analysis comes in. In other words, analysis of the information and data concerning trends, targets, and necessary improvements leads to knowledge. And the ultimate goal is implementing improvement and wisdom. It's important to realize that you can have a solid methodology or architecture, but without some type of tools collecting the data that you need to perform a successful security assessment or audit or test will be very difficult. So security analysis needs to involve powerful and often automated security tools and tools that not just analyze logs, but all different types of output. Now, every single device or application on your network is gonna create log files. So administrators probably start with log analyzers that collect data from a device's log files and translate it into a data format that is consistent and easy to read. Remember, that raw data becomes information, which after thorough analysis becomes knowledge and ultimately wisdom, if we have continual improvement as our goal. And the output is often in a centralized graphical format. I would recommend, before you take your CISSP exam, to go up and do some research on some of these tools and methodologies and architectures that we're talking about. So for example, SolarWinds has a security event manager tool, which automatically generates HIPAA, PCI DSS, Sarbanes-Oxley, ISO, FISMA, GLBA, and other reports. There's also Datadog, Datadog log analysis and troubleshooting. There's Manage Engine event log analyzer, and Splunk, and Passler PRTG network monitor. There's also automated and cloud-based solutions. For example, Amazon AWS has a tool called Inspector that customers can use for free. It's an automated security assessment service that helps improve the security and compliance of applications deployed on the AWS cloud, comparing it to dozens of different well-established baselines. It automatically assesses applications for exposure, vulnerabilities, and deviations from established best practices. There's also Microsoft Azure Sentinel. This is a scalable, cloud-native, security information event management SIEM and security orchestration automated response SOAR solution. This could be a powerful solution for your security assessment, auditing, and testing. It investigates threats with artificial intelligence and hunts for suspicious activities at scale, tapping into years of cybersecurity work at Microsoft. Remember, those are the folks that created Stride. And Fortinet has the CTAP, the Cyber Threat Assessment Program. This helps you validate your network's current security accuracy, helps you analyze the application traffic, assess user productivity, and monitor network performance. Do yourself a favor and go look at the capabilities, the use cases, and functionality of these types of solutions before you take the CISSP exam. Now, throughout this training, we've talked about reporting several times in different courses. This time, we want to focus briefly on security reporting best practices. When doing reporting, you want to align it to customer security guidance, policies, standards, and guidelines. Whether you're the customer or your organization is the customer, or you're a third party contractor or consultant, the reporting routine should correspond to the vulnerability scanning routine. For example, is there automated daily vulnerability scanning? Do you perform it weekly, monthly? Your reports should align with the scanning. You want to maintain a consistent reporting structure over the life cycle for improved results. For example, a unified schema of key value pairs to define configurable items. Make sure that you purge outdated and obsolete security scan results data before you generate reports. Remember, you want to present meaningful metrics. Make sure you engage the report consumers frequently and assess possible improvements by getting their feedback, not just based on your own judgment. So periodically, you may ask them to fill out a survey or answer a feedback questionnaire. 
Make sure you utilize engaging dashboards as we've talked about throughout this training. For example, going beyond just the simple pie chart and using your Python programming, your R programming skills. Generate reports with different audiences and technical knowledge in mind. You may generate more than one report for the same output or for the same test depending upon the audience. For example, the C-suite or the C-team versus your security team or a steering committee. In addition, make sure you provide glossaries and definitions. Don't assume understanding of the audience. Don't assume they understand the definition of all the terminology. If you can, make reporting as interactive and dynamic as possible. And like I said, avoid those simple pie charts and histograms and go for more modern visibility representations. In this course on security assessment and testing, you learned about assessment, test, and audit strategies, threat modeling methodologies, security control testing, security assessment frameworks, and analysis and reporting. In the next course, you'll explore development methodologies and maturity models, integrated product teams, IPT, and SOAR and SCM. Now, as somebody who is a CISSP and who's taken the exam a couple of times over the past 20 years, I can assure you that you do not have to be a programmer or a developer to pass the CISSP exam. However, you must have some general knowledge, especially about your role as a security practitioner in the DevOps. In other words, how do you contribute to turn DevOps into DevSecOps? So first off, we want to understand those different approaches to designing application security. One approach is basically secure by default. This design consideration assumes that the application is natively secure. Let's say the Docker container that you developed without any modifications or additional controls. For example, a server application has certain possible unsecure functions, but they're disabled by default at deployment by using infrastructure as code, or for example, using Amazon Web Services Elastic Container Services to deploy secure containers by default. Next, we have Secure by Design, the custom or outsourced program, in other words, build or buy, is developed with security integrated into part of or the entire software development lifecycle. As we'll see in a moment, there are several different lifecycle approaches we can take. So attackers cannot simply overcome the security controls, even if they have white or gray box familiarity with the application design. Remember, security by design should not rely on security by obscurity. A simple example of security by obscurity is, let's say, burying a box with silver coins in it in your backyard next to a tree. That's not real security. It's not the same thing as putting it in a safe or in a safe deposit box. Just because you place it in an obscure location does not make it secure. Then we have secure by deployment. The application was not developed with security integrated in the lifecycle, but it is deployed in an environment where security was considered in the network and system design. Developers can take advantage of infrastructure as code to roll out well-tested application stacks. An example would be an application deployed with air-gapped Docker containers separated from any untrusted networks. For example, deploying it in a private cloud or a detonation chamber. This also doesn't include security by obscurity. Another example would be to deploy your application in a secure software-defined network or SDN. Next, Let's get some familiarity with different types of development models or software and application life cycles. The most common and traditional would be the waterfall software development. This model is very linear and is typically used over a long period of time. It doesn't allow for iterative processes nor consumer or customer feedback at different phases. In addition, 
one phase is the output or input to the other phase. So for example, the output of the planning phase is the direct input to the design phase. The output of the design phase is the direct input to the implement phase and so on. And also, testing is done only later on in the life cycle and again with very little customer or consumer input. The waterfall model is not agile, nor is it conducive to modern development technology and DevSecOps. A more traditional SELC from NIST can be applied to system or software development. Notice the first phase, the initiation phase. That's where we have a lot of information gathering, determining the, the purpose, the goal of the software, the system. That entire process should be secured with secure communication and least privilege. The next phase is acquisition or development. We call that build or buy. Your development life cycle should make it easy for you if you change your mind to go from build to buy or from buy to build without too much loss of resources. Once you make the decision and you acquire or you develop, you then implement with ongoing assessment. After implementation and assessment is your ongoing operations and maintenance. And then let's say after five or six years of using the container, it's time for the disposal phase or the sunset phase. In your organization, your software DLC can be quite elaborate and overwhelming, as we can see here in this graphic. This has seven phases. Formation is project initiation. You can see all the activities that take place in phase two, where your requirements and planning are done. Your goal is to make sure that your project managers are communicating in a secure fashion, that you have security of data at rest and data in transit, protecting confidentiality, integrity, availability, and non-repudiation. You may be involved in the training process, the change in configuration control, preventing data leakage, and contributing to security assessment and testing wherever possible. A very popular methodology, especially over the last 15 years, is agile software development. This is great for smaller projects. In these projects, the concept of agile development is a viable alternative. It's an evolutionary approach, where we're measured in weeks as opposed to months or years in a waterfall method. It also involves a lot of collaboration between cross-functional teams, something that was traditionally rare in the early days of software development and waterfall methods. This is great for rapid deployment with two to four week cycles with feedback at every iteration. It's very flexible, adaptable, not predictable with testing done throughout the development process. Your estimates for budget, schedule, etc., get more realistic as the work progresses because the important issues are discovered earlier. With Agile, you'll find code weaknesses, errors, gaps much quicker and earlier. There's also more customer or consumer feedback all along the way. Another very popular model is continuous integration or development, often referred to as CI continuous integration. It's a development technique that forces developers to integrate code into a shared repository, for example, GitHub, several times a day. Each check-in is then verified by an automated build, allowing teams to detect problems early. There may be multiple integrations per day, and the goal is to detect and locate bugs and security flaws quickly. Many teams find that this CI-CD approach leads to significantly reduced integration problems and allows a team to have a cohesive software, whether it be container-based or traditional, more rapidly, developers on AWS commonly use CI-CD. Another very popular model is continuous integration, often referred to as CI continuous integration. It's a development technique that forces developers to integrate code into a shared repository, for example, GitHub, several times a day. Each check-in is then verified by an automated build allowing teams to detect problems early. There may be multiple integrations per day, and the goal is to detect and locate bugs and security flaws quickly. Many teams find that this CI-CD approach leads to significantly reduced integration problems 
and it allows a team to have a cohesive software, whether it be container-based or traditional, more rapidly. Developers on AWS commonly use CI-CD. Finally, it's important to realize that as far as CISSP is concerned, our traditional DevOps, which is a methodology where the expertise of the programmer and the developer is a combination of development and operations to build software quickly, linking these two things together. It's a set of practices that accentuate the collaboration and communication of both software developers and IT professionals that automate the software delivery process. So DevSecOps involves considering application and infrastructure security from the very beginning in the early initiation phases, and then automating some security gates to keep the DevOps workflow from slowing down or becoming unsecure. Choosing the right tools to integrate security continuously is critical. So, for example, at Amazon Web Services, you may do your development through Elastic Beanstalk or using Docker containers. And then your operations could be done through CloudFront or the API Gateway. And then security could be a combination of your web application firewall deployed on a CloudFront distribution with AWS Shield for anti denial of service and threat management through guard duty. Now in this lesson, we're gonna talk about maturity models, but realize we can extend these maturity models beyond just software development security into system security, service security, infrastructure security as well. So we wanna think about these in the context of software development. However, these maturity models are much broader than just simply application security. Now the CMM, the Capability Maturity Model, it's a methodology used to advance and enhance an organization's software development process from a secure standpoint. But as I said, it can go well beyond that. The model consists of a five-level evolutionary path of progressively prepared and systematically more mature processes. It's similar to the ISO 9001 standards that specify an effective quality system for manufacturing and service industries. So obviously transcending software development security. As we can see here, the model has five levels. Level one is initial, level two is repeatable, level three is defined, level four is managed, and level five is optimized. Those are the official definitions. Now I've added to these in parentheses, the open fair factor analysis of information risk descriptors which I find to be much more accurate. Let's go through these one at a time. First, we have the initial or chaotic level one, where the processes are disorganized, even chaotic. Let's say you're a startup company that's developing an app for the iPhone. Success most often depends on individual heroics and is not considered to be repeatable. In other words, things are just done based on instinct or intuition or something that they tried before and we're gonna try it again. Processes, specifically secure application development, is not sufficiently defined or documented. They can't be replicated very easily. The decision-making is a free-for-all and it's based on intuition and limited existing experience. The decision-making authorities are poorly defined. There's no key risk indicators, no key performance indicators, no critical success factors or real meaningful metrics. The results, whether it be software development, infrastructure security, some other system initiative, is inconsistent and often unaligned with any executive leadership. An organization at CMM level one may actually have little or no executive leadership, or they're just not involved at all. Level two is repeatable or implicit. Here, Fundamental project management is established, for example, PMP or Agile, and successes could be repeated as the obligatory processes have been established. They've been somewhat defined, and there's some documentation involved. However, the process is not codified or well-defined and is still vulnerable to inconsistency. 
Decision-making is based on rote adherence to poorly aligned standards and practices, and data provided to the decision-makers is often superficial, not codified. It cannot hold up to scrutiny. Roles and responsibilities are unclear, and it's common for people to make decisions outside of their level of authority at level two. In addition, risk, if defined at all, is often purely quantitative, without much support of expert judgment or historical precedent. And you may have established KRIs and some metrics, but they're questionable as risk terminology, taxonomy, and even policy is superficial or non-existent. Capability maturity model level three is defined or early explicit. Here, the enterprise has developed its own standard software process through greater attention to documentation, standardization, and integration. Standardized terminology exists, there's a taxonomy, there's a schema, and the assessments are more up to date and better supported. Visibility is much improved as more robust and defensible analysis exists. You have some well established standards, best practices, security teams, maybe even a steering committee. You may have components like a service desk, and practices like ITIL 4 or COBIT 5 are put into use. You have risk registers, KPIs, and KRIs that are well defined, meaningful metrics, and calibrated and more precise semi-quant or a quantitative risk analysis is evident. This is a level that many organizations will attain to and that many organizations will remain at. Level four is the managed or mature explicit level where the processes are controlled and can quickly be adjusted and adapted for development projects, security initiatives, or other endeavors without measurable loss of quality. The quality is visible and risk registers and assessments are up to date. You have change, configuration, and patch management, IT practices. The data is actively used and risk treatment and handling is adapted accurately based on more quantitative analysis, like the Whitman model or factor analysis of information risk. Indicators and metrics are well-defined and tested. Methods for assurance and certification are established if pertinent. And this is the highest level that most DevSecOps initiatives and organizations can hope to meet. Level five is the optimized level. Everything is purely explicit. The process management has attained everything at level four, including deliberate process optimization and continual improvement. Level five is rarely achieved, but it's still possible with proper leadership and a good amount of resources. For example, ITIL for mastery and maximum software development proficiency would be demonstrated by this organization. Let's talk about the Software Assurance Maturity Model, or SAM. This is an open framework from OWASP to assist organizations in developing and deploying a secure software delivery strategy that is focused on the detailed risks facing the enterprise. Think of SAM as a more application development focused methodology than CMM, which can be global and all encompassing. The resources offered by SAM will assist in appraising the organization's current software security initiatives. Constructing a well adjusted software security assurance program using established iterative processes, establishing tangible continual improvement methodologies to a software security assurance program, and defining and gauging security related tasks throughout the enterprise. SAM principles. An organization's activities gradually change over time. An effective software security initiative should be implemented in small, repeatable iterations that result in tangible assurance wins, while incrementally pushing towards longer-term goals. There is no one-size-fits-all solution that works across all organizations. A software security framework must be malleable and allow organizations to customize their solutions based on their risk treatment and the way they build or buy and use software applications. 
And a third principle is that guidance related to security activities must be strict and comprehensive. All the steps used to build and assess an assurance program should be concise, well-defined, and with meaningful, measurable metrics, providing roadmap templates for other types of like organizations. Here's a SAM overview. Notice the focus on software development. Our business functions are governance, construction, or development, verification, and operation or maintenance. Under governance, we have security practices like strategy and meaningful metrics, education and guidance, specifically security guidance, and policy and compliance. Under construction, we have security requirements, threat assessment, a secure architecture. Verification involves design review of software and applications, security testing, which we'll talk more about in upcoming lessons, implementation review, and then under operation and maintenance, we have environmental hardening for the application of the software, issue management, and operational enablement for a secure software environment. In this lesson, we're going to learn about integrated product teams, or IPT. An IPT is defined as a multidisciplinary team of people who are collectively responsible for delivering a well-defined product or service solution. For example, the Department of Defense, DOD, has adopted IPTs as their preferred approach for systems and software acquisition. IPTs are maintained by different subject matter experts, SMEs, and can be leveraged throughout the entire development lifecycle, whether it be Agile, Spiral, or CICD. These groups of key individuals represent varying ranges of expertise and skill sets with the common goal of delivering the best product or service or making the optimal decisions. This cross-functional expert judgment also supports product acquisition activities and the development of system and software solutions. The goals of IPT according to IEEE Standard 1220-2005, is that the interdisciplinary tasks required throughout a system's life cycle to transform customer needs, requirements, and constraints into a system solution are well-defined. In addition, the requirements for the system's engineering process and its application throughout the product life cycle must be specified. And a third goal of IPT is on the engineering activities necessary to guide product development while ensuring that the product is properly designed to make it affordable to produce, own, operate, maintain, and eventually to dispose of without undue risk to health or to the environment. When IPT is applied to engineering management, at the top we have governance, oversight, and review. The middle tier has the integrated cross-functional teams of subject matter experts dealing specifically with algorithms, architectures, the human factors, and interoperability and assessments. At the program level, where execution occurs, the product teams deal with programming, testing, developing interfaces, products, infrastructure through the network, deployment, and personnel safety. In this lesson, we'll discuss the importance of identifying programming security controls. Realize that this diagram that we see here is a prototype or a sample of something that could be derived from your risk register or your risk ledger in the area of application security or programming security. So for example, notice we have three computer system layers. The application layer, which also includes the programming language compiler, Below that, we have the operating system, Windows, Linux build, or Mac OS. And then below that, we have our hardware. So for example, some mitigation techniques are to deploy tools at the application layer, like StackGuard, SafeGuard, Control Flow Integrity, and other tools like Session Shield. This could be a web application firewall, or web vulnerability analysis with OWASP Zap or Burp Suite. 
looking for SQL injection, cross-site scripting type 0, 1, or 2, broken authentication, sensitive data exposure. At the operating system, we see timing attacks with TOC, TOU. At the hardware layer, buffer overflow attacks. A sampling of controls on the operating system could come not just through patch management, but also by controlling what can happen in memory addresses, data only, or executables, by implementing address space location randomization, ASLR, or DEP, data execution prevention. At the hardware level, we can deploy hardware fine-grained control flow integrity, and DEP. It's important to remember that from a programming security standpoint, all of our security controls to be implemented must be documented in the risk register and implemented throughout the entire software development lifecycle, preferably at each iteration on all the systems, on all the computer layers that are being used by the developers and the programmers in the development phase, in the testing phase, and in the live production phase. Let's talk about a specific aspect of security that's critical today, and that is securing your code repository. Remember, your code, whether it be open source code or proprietary, is only as secure as the methods and systems used to generate it. Some of the advantages that come with using a secure code repository are obvious. Things like version control, peer review, for example, as part of an integrated product team, and built-in auditing. It is critical that the repository, for example, GitHub, or a cloud provider like Amazon Web Services, is an adequately secure central point of code storage and management. Attackers can change a code base without your knowledge or permission due to loss of credentials or compromise of access credentials or breach of the core service. If appropriate due diligence is applied to security measures, the benefits of using a code repository should far outweigh the risks. Best practices are to choose a repository you trust completely. For example, you may decide to forego using GitHub and use a code repository Google Cloud Platform. You have to consider the exposure and customer base of your repository. It's critical that you protect access credentials. Protect all access keys and service account keys. Do not embed credentials into your API requests, your API calls, or your code. Again, separating secret credentials from your source code. And repository access should be revoked quickly when not needed or if compromised. Make sure to include open code in your risk model. Some of your code may be more appropriate in a private repository as opposed to something like GitHub. Also, make sure that you have automated tools to review all of your code changes. Make sure that all code merged into a master version goes through a review process to prevent unintended or malicious code to be included. If you're coding in the open, an attacker may try to change or influence your code. If you're using a publicly accessible repository, make sure you take care of your identity. If possible, introduce multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication and be aware of spear phishing attacks to your associated email or webmail. And of course, back up your code. On the exam for this domain, you need to be aware of Software Configuration Management, SCM. Software Configuration Management is a software engineering process to systematically manage, organize, and control the changes in the documents, codes, and other artifacts during the software development lifecycle. The primary goal of SCM is to enhance productivity and minimize errors and mistakes. SCM is part of the cross-disciplinary field of configuration management. For example, remember integrated product teams, or IPT, and should lead to correct determination of your revision history. Some valid reasons to use SCM there are several people working on applications that are continually updating, for example, CICD or spiral development. There's multiple versions, branches, microservices, and programmers involved in a software project, and the team is geographically dispersed, yet is working concurrently. 
You might use SCM because changes in customer requirements, policy, budget, and schedules need to be accommodated. The software must be able to run on different platforms and operating systems or move between cloud providers. For example, using SCM with your container development. Or there's a critical need to develop coordination among cross-functional stakeholders. Or you need to control the costs involved in making changes to a program, application, or mobile app. For example, you have to manage changes in requirements, changes to your team or your organization, changes in governmental policy and rules, or modifications to your product schedule. All of these things can affect your code, your project plan and program management, other documents that are related, other interoperable functions, your testing, and of course, your data. SCM has a life cycle. It begins in the first phase where you have your identification of objects in the software configuration. Then, your version control and version control baselines. Next comes your change control. Then in phase four, configuration status accounting and auditing. And finally, status reviews and reporting. Those are the five phases of the SCM process. In this final lesson of this course, we're going to explore well-established methods of static application security testing, beginning with SAST or SAST. SAST tools are also known as code analyzers, and they conduct a direct white box analysis of the application source code. The analysis runs on a static view of the code, in that the code is not running at the time of the assessment. SAS security tools are mainstream, and they're widely adopted throughout the software industry. They have a broad programming language support, and they use concepts that are relatively easy to comprehend, and they're often built into development platforms. SAS code analyzers have no visibility of the execution flow, however, and they can be slow, somewhat inaccurate, they're considered outdated, and they often need additional customization or fine granular tuning. A next generation of AST tools is dynamic AST. These are most often things like web scanners, because obviously web traffic is the most prolific, tools like OWASP Zap and Burp Suite, otherwise known as web vulnerability scanners. When compared to SAST, they perform black box analysis in that they don't have access to the code or the specifics of the implementation of the application. DASTs only inspect the system's responses to a series of tests or input, possibly fuzz testing, to highlight vulnerabilities. They function independently of the underlying application platform, and they offer solid support for manual pen testing of applications. A top-level DAST will detect only about 20% of the issues, with no information provided on the location of the issue in the actual code base itself. And it takes an experienced security background in programming and application development to interpret the results of a dynamic application security test. So here's a quick comparison. With SAST, we're offered a static and internal analysis of the application or the program or the function or the code, and a SAST code scanner will find more security control holes than DAST at the cost of having a high percentage of false positives. And SAST serves well in the development and quality assurance stages. With DAST, you're going to be offered dynamic, runtime, and external analysis of the application. A DAST web scanner is more useful during the quality assurance and production stages since the application's running. And it doesn't require direct access to the source code whereas static AST does. We have interactive application security testing as well, a more modern approach that combines the advantages of SAST and DAST. It's the benefits of a static view, because we can see the source code, but the benefits of a web scanner approach, since we see the execution flow of the application during runtime. Interactive can detect 100% of OWASP benchmark in real time, 
with no false positives. That's a huge advantage over DAST and SAST. It can be flexibly used in quality assurance and production environments, analyzing dependencies, as well as used with legacy components. There's no need to scan or attack the application with IAST. It provides continuous detection and it's DevOps friendly. IAST integrates and communicates with task management systems to create unified workflows as well. This probably won't be on the exam. You might want to do a web safari for RASP, known as Runtime Application Self-Protection. This is one of the most modern technologies that's used today to do application testing. It protects the applications from the inside, as opposed to a WAF that does it from the outside. So check out RASP, Runtime Application Self-Protection. In this course, on software development life cycles and ecosystems, you learned about development and maturity models, integrated product teams, IPT, identifying security controls, SCM and application security, and application security testing. Coming up in the next course, we'll explore assessing software and software security source code weaknesses, and secure coding practices. In this lesson, we're going to compare off-the-shelf software to open source software. COTS, or COTS, is a common commercial off-the-shelf as-is solution. COTS products are intended to be easily installed and to interoperate tightly with existing system components. Almost all software bought by the public computer user fits into the COTS category. For example, operating systems in the Windows, Linux, or Mac OS family, Office product suites, word processing, and email programs. This also includes software as a service solutions as well. One of the major advantages of mass produced COTS software is that it is relatively low cost. However, you're often the beta tester for the programmer. Next, we have MOTS, Modified Off-the-Shelf, or Modifiable Off-the-Shelf, or, depending upon the context, MOTS could stand for Military Off-the-Shelf Product as well. MOTS is typically a product whose source code can be modified or customized by the purchaser, the vendor, or another party to meet the needs of the customer or the consumer. For instance, in the military, it refers to an off-the-shelf product that is developed or customized by a vendor or contractor to respond to precise military requirements. Since MOTS software specifications are written by external entities, some government agencies are often untrusting of these products as they fear that future changes to the product will not be in their control. Modified off-the-shelf could be considered by some organizations as a high-risk software solution. Next we have GOTS. A government off-the-shelf product is typically produced by the technical staff of the government agency for which it's created. It can also be developed by an external contracted body, but with financing and specifications from the government agency. Since government agencies can often directly manage all characteristics of a GOTS solution, these are commonly preferred for government use cases you should consider GOTS as lower risk than MOTS. Next we have NOTS or NOTS. This can stand for NATO off the shelf or niche off the shelf product, depending upon the context. Generally, a niche off the shelf refers to vendor developed software that is for a particular well-defined market segment, as opposed to a broad market for COTS products. If it is developed for NATO, Consultation, Command, and Control, NC3A, then it is to meet explicit NATO requirements. Now that we've seen the four type of off-the-shelf software offerings, let's talk about some open source vulnerabilities. Open source software is a package whose code is accessible for public examination, alteration, and improvement. In other words, it's non-proprietary, like off-the-shelf options. 
many enterprises and products, 90% by some estimates, use at least one open source component, often without being aware of it. Normally, this open source code or function is built using public community collaboration and is preserved and updated on a voluntary basis. Open source software can be used according to a diversity of licenses, depending upon what the developers have implemented. Some open source vulnerabilities are that the vulnerabilities are publicly known. There's no claims or obligations of the developers of open source software or their variants or branches or builds to be secure. Open source software often includes or demands the use of vulnerable third-party libraries as well. There's intellectual property challenges to using open source. There are over 200 types of licenses that can be used with open source software that can make changing configuration management and patch management much more difficult. It can also add complexity to your DevSecOps. There's also a lack of warranty for open source code security, support, or the content itself. Open source software has lax integrations oversight and lax control. Dev teams often have non-existent review processes for the open source components. There's also often operational inadequacies requiring additional work for proper DevSecOps. Open source code can often be delivered based on poor development practices and poor coding procedures. Risks increase as developers commonly copy and paste chunks of code from open source software into their off-the-shelf or commercial software. And to add to that, developers often transfer components through email or use poor repository security practices. Well, it goes without saying that the most vulnerable software and sometimes the most proprietary applications you're going to use will be mobile applications. Now, this is a topic, mobility security, that probably should have been covered earlier in course 11 when we talked about IoT and embedded systems and containers. However, I went ahead and decided to fit it in here because of the mobile application management and how that relates to application security. So let's begin looking at you know, mobile deployment models. First, with the most vulnerable, bring your own device, where employees are permitted to use their personal mobile devices and they can access enterprise data and systems. Now, typically, under BYOD, there are four different types of options that maybe you'll offer as mobility managers. First is unlimited access completely for those personal devices. Then we could say, well, access only to non-sensitive systems and data. And obviously, we're going to need some help with the AUP and with some enterprise software to enforce that. We could say you can have access with IT control over your personal device, the apps, and the stored data. Or you can access while preventing local storage of data using compartmentalization and other partitioning tools. Another common model is CYOD, choose your own device. This is much like BYOD in that it lets employees work from anywhere using a mobile device. Often though, the CYOD device must be approved by the organization, unlike BYOD, where they're just bringing in their own device. Typically, users will select from a list of approved devices, which are usually smartphones, but they can be pads or other special devices, but the mobility managers, the organizations, will handle the OEMs, the manufacturers, the vendors, and the call plans. A CYOD network offers more stability, security, and simplified IT for most businesses. In a CYOD model, you may have a business phone and a personal phone, and you may allow the employees to bring in the personal phone and just use it for personal reasons, or they may have to leave the personal phone out in their vehicle, for example, or they have to leave it locked up in a cabinet or some other enclosure during business hours. A third model is COPE. This is corporately owned, 
personally enabled where the company gives the employees the mobile device and the users can handle it as if it were their own device. This prevents the need for two smartphones like I just mentioned. However, in a COPE model, the company decides on what the device will be, maybe with some input from the employees, but they'll ultimately decide the call plan and the devices. In this model, there should be programs used by the enterprise management to containerize or to separate personal data from corporate data. Now, there's a fourth model that goes without saying, and that is completely corporate owned and corporate controlled. And you're seeing some organizations move in that direction. Some of the challenges, though, in the corporately owned, corporately controlled, is that sometimes you have to make exceptions for particular employees who need certain types of apps, maybe for health reasons, or for contact tracing, or for other personal reasons. This all falls under the category of EMM, Enterprise Mobility Management. Organizations must securely configure and implement each layer of the technology stack. Under EMM, this involves mobile hardware, firmware, the operating system, Android or iOS, or other operating system the management agent or agents, and the apps that are used for business and which apps are used for personal reasons. The solution should reduce risk, so employees are able to access the necessary data from nearly any location over any network using a wide variety of mobile devices. Like always, it's a fine balance between productivity and security. Enterprise mobility management is actually the combination of two disciplines or two management services, mobile device management, MDM, and mobile application management. In small to medium organizations, typically one department will do both, device and application management. However, as the organization gets bigger or geographically dispersed or multinational, often you'll need to divide this up into MDM and MAM. There are three basic core competencies that all organizations need from an EMM solution. Visibility. Understanding what's running on all mobile devices. This is key to discovering potential risks and vulnerabilities and adhering to compliance policies. Secure access. Providing the ability for mobile users to securely authenticate and authorize, giving them access to apps and data, not just on that device, but when that device is being used as a dual factor or multi factor authenticator to get access to other resources, for example, software as a service solutions or cloud providers, or possibly used with their personal banking, online brokerage, or cyber currency exchanges, and data protection, offering dynamic anti malware and data loss prevention capabilities to help limit the risk of attacks and data breaches. Let's talk MDM, Mobile Device Management. MDM manages the technology that enables and controls mobile devices used to access business or corporate resources. For example, enrolling devices for management, onboarding, provisioning settings like digital certificates for your EAP TLS environment, and profiles, monitoring, measuring, and reporting device compliance, and if there's not a separate MAM, they'll be involved with removing corporate data from devices for data leak prevention. Some activities would be network access control, pre-admission control, remote locking of the device, and remote wiping of the device. Other features that can sometimes be attributed to MDM platforms are remote VPN capabilities as well. With MDM, you need to know your policy for enabling features like geolocation. This can be a vulnerability for certain sectors, for example, government agencies and military. There is a risk of social surveillance by GPS with geotagging. And geofencing can be used to put restrictions on where a mobile device can be actively used based on GPS. And remember that geofencing can also be based on RFID tagging. But remember, geolocation, geotagging, and geofencing are almost always under the umbrella of MDM. Mobile application management involves publishing mobile apps to users. It involves continual monitoring, configuration, 
and updating of apps. Mobile managers will report on app inventory and usage. They'll be involved in securing and removing corporate data within mobile apps. It also involves what's called mobile content management. In other words, what type of content can the specific application operate on? Some data concerns are data storage and remnants, devices with non-removable storage, removable storage, and data cards, for example, and the transfer or backup of data either to block storage on a local workstation or to uncontrolled cloud storage, for example, at a cloud provider or Dropbox or Google Drive, and the privacy of intellectual property and corporate data. Let's talk jailbreaking and rooting. Jailbreaking and rooting are very different, even though they both involve privilege escalation. Jailbreaking an iPhone basically allows the installation of third-party apps not approved by Apple's strict controls. You cannot modify the OS or system files like an administrator, and you're still bound by the iOS framework. A jailbroken iPhone can be reverted back to a standard jail device by restoring the device in recovery mode. Apple has responded to this with patching exploits and upgrading hardware to iOS on a regular basis. Rooting grants full access to a device on a level much higher than jailbreaking, giving access to the Android system and beyond. Every line of code in the Linux-based device becomes editable, with options only restricted by coding skills. Since Android is open source, you can go into recovery mode and download a modified or even entirely new version of the OS if you want. You can alter any and all hardware, software, or aesthetic settings on the device through rooting. Sideloading basically refers to the moving of media files to a mobile device using USB, Bluetooth, or Wi-Fi. It can also involve writing to a memory card to insert into a mobile device. With Android apps, sideloading usually installs an app package in APK format onto a device with packages typically downloaded from sites other than Google Play. Sideloading of apps is only likely if the user has allowed unknown sources in their security settings. Some challenges to enterprise mobility management are managing X509 v3 certificates, tethering, and tokenization, so for example, using it as an MFA factor, or tethering, using it as a Wi-Fi access point, mobile payments, and cyber currency wallets, also NFC-enabled apps, fragmentation between the manufacturer and vendor and the carrier, and unauthorized remote locking and remote wiping. Containerization is technically a technique that limits the environments in which certain code or apps can run. It provides protection, isolation, and integrity functionality to get better levels of overall data isolation. Users can continue to chat, text, and tweet without affecting business functions since sensitive apps and data remain protected or in a sandbox container with separate controls and higher security levels. Apple iOS uses secure enclaves to prevent the main processor from gaining direct access to sensitive data. The CEP OS includes its own kernel, drivers, services, and applications. It has its own set of peripherals accessible by memory map dedicated I.O. lines, and it uses inline AES to encrypt external RAM. Application wrapping involves adding an additional management layer. It allows the MAM administrator to set specific policy elements that can be applied to an application or group of applications, whether or not the user authentication is needed for a certain app, for example, or whether or not app data can be stored on the device at all, or whether or not specific APIs, for example, file sharing, will be permitted. Modern EMM tools like Mobile Iron, AirWatch, and Zen Mobile offer BYOD and MAM security capabilities. They provide flexible bundles for different use cases. They provide unified endpoint management, end-to-end -end security, and identity management, IDM, enterprise integration, productivity applications, for example, creating mobile business apps without writing code, and 
Introducing UBA, User Behavioral Analytics. In this lesson, we're going to explore source code weaknesses. Code vulnerabilities exist because solid, secure development is actually quite difficult, time consuming, and costly. Whether it's proprietary or open source code, and by the way, most proprietary code has some open source code in it due to copy and paste, software will unavoidably have vulnerabilities. Experts often agree that open source code libraries are far more secure than commercial software. However, off the shelf software can give you a false sense of security. Open source code isn't inherently more secure, it's just more securable. Most organizations do not have a clearly defined policy to confirm that developers wanting to use a section of software code go through an authorization process or a peer review. Since open source components exist in almost all code bases, keeping up with open source components in your software is an overwhelming task, including tracking the forks, versions, and state of updates to the code. Developers need to move beyond SAST and DAST solutions by implementing continuous code analysis. New solutions should have all of the advantages of the available integrated AST solutions with machine learning and advanced AI tools. Some common programming weaknesses to be aware of on the CISSP exam would be poor error handling, poor exception handling, improper input validation, not relying on stored procedures, in other words, pre-compiled groups of code, statements, and commands that can be called later, unsecure usage of code repositories, leaving inoperative dead code, and redundancy in the code, no normalization or deduplication. In this brief video, we're going to talk specifically about securing APIs or application programming interfaces. First off, do not embed credentials or access keys into any API calls or requests. That includes to code repositories and SDKs that are running on cloud providers like Google Cloud Platform. Use forward secrecy on API keys. In other words, keys that are derived from a master key. Protect your remote communication channels with Secure Shell 2 or Transport Layer Security. Leverage Identity Access Management and single sign-on federated solutions for best results. And if you can, add multi-factor authentication solutions. You may not be a developer, and you don't have to be CISSP. You should look at the OWASP API Top 10. Here's the URL. And here we see the OWASP API Top 10. Broken object level authorization, number one. Broken user authentication, number two. The number three vulnerability for APIs, excessive data exposure. Number four, lack of resources and rate limiting. Number five, broken function level authorization. Number six, mass assignment. Number seven, security misconfiguration. Number eight, injection attacks. Number nine, improper assets management. And number 10 on the list of the API top 10, insufficient logging and monitoring. Let's continue on looking at secure coding techniques. We already mentioned normalization. This involves ensuring that there's no redundancy in data and that similar items are stored together, also referred to as deduplication. Proper input validation is a secure coding technique, verifying the input before entering it into the system. It also includes proper error and exception handling. Errors should be captured with secure logging. For example, a SIEM system. Stored procedures should be used. Pre-compiled groups of code. Also called code reuse, where one deliberately leverages existing, tested, and validated code that can be used again. If possible, use infrastructure as code. For example, Terraform or 
Amazon Web Services Cloud Formation, Obfuscation, and Camouflage. This involves writing code that humans, specifically attackers, have a hard time understanding. Also using digital signatures to sign your code, proving authorship, providing integrity, and enforcing non-repudiation. Also make sure that you ensure the confidentiality of the code in transit with IPsec or transport layer security and at rest and if possible in use, perhaps using homomorphic encryption. Another secure coding technique is having solid version control, tracking all of your changes to code and all the changes made by all of your team members in your spiral or CI CD deployment documenting securely at GitHub or a cloud service provider, for example. Having good change management. Direct, control, and support changes in code efficiently. Solid change management can be planned or unplanned. And secure provisioning and deprovisioning of code and software. Providing or removing software access. Understand the advantages of server-side versus client-side execution and validation. Client-side is more efficient, but server-side is more secure. Solid memory management. Allocate memory and buffers when needed and release it for reuse when no longer needed. This also includes using ASLR and DEP solutions to make sure that certain memory addresses cannot have executable code. Perform due diligence when using third-party libraries and software development kits. These may violate user privacy and damage the quality of the application. These should be fully tested and accredited. All right, in the final lesson of this course, we're going to cover a couple of concepts that are exam worthy, starting with software defined security, SDS. Software defined security is a model in which the information security is highly controlled, often using virtualization. The functionality of network security devices, such as next generation firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention, identity and access controls, and network segmentation are actually removed from hardware devices and moved to a software layer. SDS exploits the software-defined networking initiative to enhance network security. The concept of software-defined security is envisioned to define IT infrastructure security services as a transition from hardware-based to a software-defined solution. There are three components to SDN and SDS. The host. The host role is to transmit or receive data through the network. For the SDS, all security techniques are transferred to the controller. The controller is fully software based. All security checks are done inside the controller and it has total visibility of the traffic flows. The controller collects and processes information about the network and it's the switch that checks with the controller to determine whether to accept or reject a request. A reactive caching mechanism is adopted in software defined networking which does make SDN switches vulnerable to a denial of service attack. The advantages to SDS is that it offers resourceful and dynamic countermeasures to security attacks. It separates security away from traditional hardware vulnerabilities. SDS has the ability to dynamically configure existing network nodes, and this allows for rapid attack mitigation, especially from zero-day attacks. A synchronized view of logical security policies exists within the SDN controller model. It's not tied to any server or specialized security device. With SDS, visibility of information is provided from one source. An integration with emerging technology to correlate events in a simpler way and respond more efficiently and intelligently to threats is made possible by using SDS. It enables centralized management of security, which is implemented, controlled, and managed by security software through the SDN controller, and it facilitates IoT and BYOD connectivity and better security. 
Another term for the exam is software diversity. Software diversity is an application development methodology where two or more functionally duplicate versions of the app are developed from the same specification. The process uses different developers or programming teams. The goal of software diversity is better error detection, improved consistency, and fewer programming errors throughout the life cycle. End user applications are often written in modern programming languages like Java and others. The operating systems, firmware and middleware, support libraries, and virtual machines are still written in low level languages that place flexibility and performance over security. Programming errors in low level code are often exploitable and can sometimes give attackers unrestricted access to compromised host systems. Automated software diversity techniques use randomization to significantly increase the difficulty of exploiting the huge amounts of low level code in existence. Diversity based defenses are motivated by the assumption that a single attack will fail against multiple targets with unique attack surfaces. Software Assurance The key objective of the Software Assurance Program is to shift the security paradigm from patch management to software assurance. It encourages developers to raise overall software quality and security from the start, or the initiation phase. It emphasizes the usage of tested standard libraries and modules. And Software Assurance employs industry accepted approaches that recognize that software security is fundamentally a software engineering issue that must be addressed systematically throughout the software development lifecycle. In this final course, Software Development Security, you learned about off the shelf and open source software, Enterprise Mobility Management, EMM, Secure Coding and API Weaknesses, Secure Coding Techniques, and SDS and Software Diversity.